डॉक्टर राजीव निगम सर वेलकम गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग ये मेरा बड़ा प्री टॉपिक है तो मुझे लगा आज कुछ सीखने को मिलेगा हमको भी लगा कि सर का तो ये हाई है तो ये बिल्कुल बताना चाहिए तो हमने शेयर किया जानकारी सर अगर विशाल जी भाई तो मैं हेड्स ऑफ टू यू आपने जितनी मेहनत की है और जितना सिस्टमेटिक ढंग से आपने सबको इन्फॉर्म किया है मैंने आज तक कहीं नहीं देखा था सर आप लोगों का कोऑपरेशन मिला तो हमारा भी उत्साह हुआ धन हुआ <laughs> नहीं साहब बहुत अच्छा मतलब मैंने तो बहुत अटेंड किए लेकिन ये बहुत इतना बड़ा प्रोग्राम और इतना सिस्टमेटिक जा रहा है तो ये बहुत अच्छी चीज है तो इसीलिए बल्कि वो दस बीस पे आपका टाइम था मैंने कहा मैं पहले ही जाए कंप्यूटर वाला चेक कर लू वरना क्या होता है वो लास्ट मिनट पे कभी कैमरा नहीं काम करता कभी माइक नहीं काम करता है बस अभी मैंने ब्रेकफास्ट खत्म किया और आके कंप्यूटर ऑन किया चलिए और कैसा आपको कैसा लग रहा है एज एर्गेनाइजर हमें तो अच्छा लग रहा है बहुत बढ़िया प्रोग्राम जा रहा है हमारा तो दिन भर व्यस्तता का जाता है सर जी नहीं बहुत बड़ा आपने दिन में बड़ा हाँ दिन में यहाँ पे करते हैं रात को फिर सबको इन्फॉर्म करते हैं जी 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 हाँ बस लगता है आपकी टीम काफी बड़ी है शायद इतना बड़ा प्रोग्राम ऑर्गेनाइज करना इज नॉट ए जोक लिंक ऑलरेडी इन योर मेल एंड एक एक मिनट मिनट होल्ड कीजिए जस्ट हेलो बोलिए जी नहीं भाई देखिए ये दस है मैं अब आपको मालूम है इनको आपके जो यहाँ रहते हैं साहब हाँ तो देखिए भाई नौ तक करना बल्कि आठ के लिए भी मुझे बाकी आठ लोगों से पूछना पड़ेगा तो आठ से कम तो हो नहीं सकता किसी भी कीमत पे नहीं हो सकता है चलिए नहीं देखिए दो महीने का सोलह हजार एडवांस और आठ एक महीने का किराया तो टोटल होता है ट्वेंटी फोर थाउजेंड यस जिसमें एक महीना आपका किराया माना जाएगा दो महीने का डिपॉजिट माना जाएगा ठीक है ओके और अभी मैं मीटिंग में रहूंगा तो मुझे बारह बजे तक अभी फोन मत कीजिएगा अभी मैं मीटिंग के बीच में आपको फोन कर रहा हूँ हाँ ठीक है ओके जी सर आप कुछ कह रहे थे बीच में फोन आ गया है यस सर मैं लिंक शेयर कर दूं उनको रेखा मैडम को अच्छा अच्छा लिंक तो यही है ना कॉमन लिंक है फॉर ऑल द लेक्चर्स हाँ पर उनको वो फाइंड आउट नहीं कर पा रहे हैं अच्छा अच्छा उन्हें ईमेल से भेज दीजिए तो उनको लॉग इन करना आसान हो जाएगा हाँ अभी एक पांच मिनट का टाइम है ना शुरू होने में जी हाँ अभी तो वो टेस्ट कर रहे हैं अच्छा तो ठीक है साहब मैं आपसे जरा अनुमति चाहूंगा मैं एक कप चाय बना के लाता हूँ ओके सर सो नाइस ऑफ टू सी यू एंड माय हेड्स ऑफ टू यू सर आइए कभी गोवा आइए तो आपसे मुलाकात करके बहुत अच्छा लगेगा ओके
यस मैडम चली गई हेलो हाँ ओके यस मैडम हेलो नो जस्ट आई एम शेयर बट योर इन विच नेम मैडम वनली वनली टू अच्छा ओ ओ वनली टू एंड थ्री यो हाँ योर नेम नॉट इन ज्वाइनिंग लिस्ट हेलो uh, uh, आपने ज्वाइन कर लिया स्क्रीन दिख रही है आपको हमारी हाँ तो अभी आप नहीं जुड़ नहीं पा रही मतलब वो आपको अपना दिख रहा है हाँ फिर से लिंक करिए फिर से लिंक में क्लिक करिए हाँ हमारी पिक्चर हम हमारी पिक्चर दिखेगी स्क्रीन में हम बैठे हुए हैं और रविशंकर सर जुड़े, जुड़े हुए हैं वीडियो और ऑडियो क्या क्या करना है क्या ज्वाइन क्या करना है उसमें ज्वाइन करने के लिए ज्वाइन करने का आता है ज्वाइन करने का हाँ उसी को आप क्लिक करिए हाँ हाँ ओ हाँ हाँ अब वो अपने आप हाँ नहीं वो ऑटो है आ जाएगा हाँ आया क्या 
नहीं नहीं आएगा नहीं हमारा नहीं आना है वो ऑटो होगा अपने आप होगा हमारा वो जैसे आप जुड़े क्या रविशंकर सर तो जुड़े हैं देखिए आपका आएगा नहीं अभी स्लाइड हमने हटा दिया है वो आज टू ज्वाइन में आपने क्लिक कर लिया हमने भेजा ना नहीं क्या हम आपको दिख रहे हैं और और रविशंकर सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग हाँ ये हमारे स्क्रीन में है रविशंकर सर क्या वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग सर ये सर गुड मॉर्निंग हाँ वो मतलब ज्वाइन नहीं है अभी क्या बात है फिर अच्छा वो क्या बता रहा है आस्क आस्क तो ज्वाइन आ रहा है हाँ नहीं आज को ज्वाइन में आपने क्लिक किया तो नहीं क्या मैसेज बता रहा उसके बाद क्लिक करने के बाद तो हमारी तरफ से तो ऑटो है आपने कुछ तो नहीं लगा रखा है उसमें कोई पासवर्ड या कुछ ऐसा लगाया तो नहीं आपने अपनी तरह अपने कंप्यूटर में आ, हाँ, आ, आप अपनी तरफ से कंप्यूटर में कुछ ऐसा पहले से लगा रखा है क्या कि जब खुद का हमारी तरफ से तो ऑटो है सब लोग ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं
இருக்கும் போராளிகள் दूसरी लिंक से दूसरे मेल से ज्वाइन करेंगी तो जल्दी हो जाएगा उसमें हो सकता कोई मेल में मेल से नहीं हो रहा हो दूसरे मेल से या दूसरी आई डी से ज्वाइन कराइए सर मैडम मैडम क्या आपका आ, दूसरा आ, कोई आ, मेल है हेलो हाँ नहीं नहीं हमारा कोड नहीं हमारे पास तो कोड नहीं है हमारे हम ऑटो कोड है हमारा मतलब अपने आप लोग जोड़ रहे हैं उसको हमने ऑटो मोड में कर दिया है अपने आप लोग जोड़ रहे हैं आ, आपका कैमरा ऑफ है लिंक की जरूर उसको उस उसको आप ओके कर दीजिए मतलब कि यदि ओके का है तो ओके कर दीजिए अपने आप जुड़ जाएगा उसमें जो मांग रहा है तो हाँ उसको अपने आप वो कहिए ओके मिश्रा जी एक तरीका हो सकता है मैडम को आप व्हाट्सएप कॉल कीजिए और स्क्रीन पे उन्हें इंस्ट्रक्शन देते रहिए कि क्या करना है इफ शी इज ऑन द कंप्यूटर देन इट विल बी इजी टू डू इट पूछ लीजिए अगर व्हाट्सएप पे कॉल करके व्हाट्सएप पे वीडियो कॉल लगा के उन्हें इंस्ट्रक्शन दीजिए और या फिर उन्हें कहिए कि प्रेजेंटेशन आपको भेज दें और आपके यहाँ से कोई इसको प्रेजेंटेशन जो है वो ऑपरेट कर सकता और वो वहां से बोल सकती हैं प्रेजेंटेशन उन्हें भेज दिया है हमारे पास अच्छा तब तो खाली उन्हें माइक ऑन करना है बस हाँ माइक का काम करना है माइक और माइक और वीडियो ऑन करना अगर वीडियो भी नहीं होता तो माइक ऑन करके कर सकती है नहीं वो जुड़ नहीं पा रही ना हमारे कंप्यूटर से वो जुड़ नहीं पा रही तो क्या फो, वो कैसे फोन से ऑपरेट कर रही है या मोबाइल से वो जुड़ रही है या तो वो मोबाइल बदल दें दूसरे मोबाइल से जुड़ जाएं या सर दूसरी आईडी से जुड़ जाएं जुड़ जाएंगी हाँ लैपटॉप से अगर ज्वाइन करें तो आसान रहेगा बजाय मोबाइल से नहीं मोबाइल से नहीं कर रही वो लैपटॉप से लैपटॉप पे तो आपका लिंक सिर्फ क्लिक करें उसके बाद वो ज्वाइन पूछता है दैट्स ऑल उनसे उसमें पता नहीं क्या कुछ लगा हुआ वो दिख नहीं रहा है अच्छा हाँ मैडम आपके अच्छा तो हम हमको लगता है वो आ, मेल आईडी में है कोई दूसरी मेल आईडी है आपकी नहीं दूसरी मेल आईडी आपके पास है क्या या मतलब उनकी हो राव साहब की हो मिस्टर की उसमें हम भेजें मोबाइल से जोड़ के देखें एक बार अगर लैपटॉप से नहीं जुड़ रहा है तो मोबाइल से भी जोड़ के देख सकते हैं एक मिनट उसको आप ले करके भेजिए थोड़ा सा लिख करके व्हाट्सएप में भेज दीजिए हेलो
मैडम ना कॉल पनी पार था ये वो वक्त की प्रॉब्लम है। नरेंद्र नरेंद्र साहब। अलाइन नरेंद्र साहब। पूरा क्या डॉक्टर साहब नमस्कार रविशंकर साहब नमस्कार कैसे बंद कर रखा आपने और कैसे हैं बढ़िया सब बढ़िया है सर बाय ग्रेस ऑफ गॉड गुड गुड एवरीथिंग इज गोइंग ऑन एंड ऑफन आई रिमेंबर यू Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we see you. <laughs> when it comes to seals and ceilings, 
जी 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 ऑल ग्रेट कंट्रीब्यूशंस जी वेरी नाइस वेरी नाइस थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू अच्छा हो गए मौका मिला सब मिलने का बात करने का जी अच्छा है ओके बढ़िया है ना हेल्थ हेल्थ आई वुड लाइक टू विजिट वंस श्योर श्योर प्लीज आई वांट टू विजिट सर हां हां जी जी क्या अभी स्टार्ट नहीं हुआ थोड़ा देर लग रहा है ना I think Madam has to join. There is some okay. technical issues, I think. Ah. Uh, he has to join. Okay, okay, okay. चलो मिलते हैं फिर. Okay, sir. Thank you. <laughs> very nice, very nice. <laughs>
Good morning to all of you. Hello. All the viewers. I am. Uh, Madam, one uh, minute, sir. Madam, please. Hello. Laptop me, आवाज आ रही है आपको? Hello. I don't know what to do. Hello? Oh, you are a voice on the laptop. I was a Hello? Laptop, I was saying, 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 I was Left up the what should I do? Uh, uh, left up the volume of Holy Jim. Left up the plus plus Jaha hai, Uska Karenge to the volume. Hello. Hello. A volume fully up, volume with car. Check, okay, I won't much a malum name. Avad is Kajo, Avad Kajahapa Hoga. Ah, my Mike, Mike, I'm here. As I am, I'm going to call you. I don't see you. I don't see you. I don't see you. I Madam का voice तो आ रहा है इधर सुन रहा है mobile mobile आप off कीजिए अभी आप mobile actually off करके try कीजिए hello हाँ आ रहा है आ रहा है आपका voice मुझे नहीं आ रहा है मैं mobile off किया तो कुछ नहीं सुनती हूँ मैडम आवाज आ रहा है कंप्लीट आ रहा है आप लोग स्टार्ट करिए आप आप अपना प्रेजेंटर प्रेजेंटेशन स्टार्ट करिए हम लोग सुन रहे हैं आपको आपका आवाज बिल्कुल अच्छा है आई कैन हियर इट्स इट्स नॉट म्यूटेड नो सर मिश्रा सर आप बोल दीजिए कि आप स्टार्ट करिए मोबाइल से बोल दीजिए कि आप स्टार्ट करिए हेलो हमें आपका कुछ भी वॉइस माइक लैपटॉप पे नहीं आ रहा है हां ठीक है मैडम ऐसा है आप आपकी आवाज हमको आ रही है आप हाँ. बोलते जाइए हम लोग सुनते जाएंगे हाँ ओके हाँ, ओके okay, हाँ. okay. I can start talking हाँ one minute one minute first uh, doctor Shankar introduce you to our audience okay हाँ, okay thank हाँ. you yeah, yeah. हाँ. then you will thank you but I can hear you Shankar you have to tell me on phone many times okay हाँ. okay yeah yeah phone phone चालू रखें आप फोन में सुनिए yeah, ah, hey, I'm just, uh, I'm highly thankful to Professor Skand Kumar Mishraji for giving me an opportunity ah, to chair this session ah, and also mobile. the conveyor of the national webinar. Today's eminent ah. speaker, Srimati Rekha Rao on Bolavira Sign Board of Gujarat. And I also thank, thank co-chairperson being a visitor this morning. Ms. Rekha Rao is a master's degree holder in Indology from the University of Mysore, Karnataka, and a student of the eminent professor, Dr. M. Sheshadri. In the year 2000, she undertook independent research work in Indology under the guidance of Dr. S. R. Rao, former Deputy Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India. Since 2010, she is primarily focused as an independent researcher. Her deep interest in temple sculptures, architecture, and archaeology has made her visit and study various temples and heritage sites in India and abroad, focusing on topics such as Aparas, cultures, and Buddhist temple architecture. Now has extensively studied of the Indus Valley civilization from Vedic perspective. Her work on deciphering Indus seals and their symbols correlating with Rigveda 
and Ayurveda are in three books titled Symbolography in Indus Seals, the Dictionary of Indus Symbols and the depiction of Vedic priests in Indus Seals was well received for her novel approach towards Indus Seals. She has authored 16 books and also written several journal articles in renowned international publications and online sites such as Academia, dot edu india facts her books are available both in print and ebook format on amazon.com some of rekha rao's lectures were well received by all national gallery of modern art bangalore for ministry of culture government of india doordarshan talks for chandana on shivaratri day dr c v ram university heritage society on yoga day mythic society bangalore Indic talk with Rekha Rao, Center for Indic Studies, Indus University, Ayurveda and Yoga in Indian Temple Sculptures for Arabindo Society, Heritage Society, Virasa Talk, and so many talks she has given at different point of time. Born and brought up in Mysore, Southern Karnataka, she has deep interest in Faisala dynasty monuments from this part of India. Her research analysis of 42 Apsaras from uh, Belur Temple is presented in her book titled Apsara in Faisala Art, A New Dimension. This book considers sociological, cultural and philosophical perspectives and draws from treatises such as Manasolasa, Nati Shastra and the Bhagavad Gita. Her passion and interest in temple architecture have led her to research the signs behind the golden ego and observed in the figure of deities, Tirupati Venkateshwara, Chidambaram Nataraja, Saranath Buddha, and uh, Kamateshwara figure of Shravana Balagala. Uh, beautiful sculptures of uh, Rani Vikivau, a world heritage monument in Gujarat. Besides academic interest, Rekharav is also a well-known trained classical musician, accompanied Bharatanatyam dancer, she has trained many students in Karnataka, Maharashtra, and Java, Indonesia for over more than two and a half decades. Some of her noted books are The Truth About Aryas, Symbolography in Indus Seals, uh, Ancient Vedic Beverages, The Dictionary of Indus Symbols, The Depiction of Vedic Priests in Indus Seals, Ayurveda in Indian Temples, The Glory of Faisala Queens, erotic sculptures in Indian temples, apsaras in Faisal art, uh, mandala, and a large number of articles in different uh, national and international journal. With this brief introduction, I welcome uh, Professor Dr. Rekha Rao to go with her presentation. Uh, I heartily greet her on this uh, first session to, to be taken place now. Thank you very much, sir. So I welcome Professor Rekha Rao to take over Thank you very much. Hello, madam. Ah, now, now uh, oh, please un, uh, unmute yourself and start the lecture. Unmute yourself. Ah, yeah. Yeah. First slide in this. Are you audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Can I I'll start now? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Namaste, yes. Yes. Please, please. I thank the organizers of the national webinar series, Reva, Madhya Pradesh. Ah, ah, Namaskar. And uh, yeah. Namaste ji. And uh, Professor Skanda Mishra ji for inviting ah. me to share my knowledge with the learned audience about the Dhalavira sign. Oh, I, sit down, I, sit down. Ah. I thank Dr. Ravi Shankar, yeah. former Epigraphy, Archaeological Survey of India, Mysore. Uh, for introducing me and sharing the session. Uh, I thank Dr. Mohan Lad, Associate Professor, for co-chairing the session. Today's talk is focused on the earliest signboard, a display board, from one of the Indus Valley sites called Dholavira. The board is popularly known as the signboard of Dholavira. The wooden board has 10 symbols engraved, and these symbols are the same as the ones inscribed on the Indus or the Harappan scenes. 
it is interesting to understand what it communicates because the Harappan symbols are yet to be deciphered. My interpretation and analysis of the symbol on the signboard is based on the Vedic perspective. The place Dholavira is situated in the Kutch district of uh, Gujarat in Western India. It's a large, well-preserved archaeological site of the ancient Indus Valley civilization. Dholavira site is gateway of the Dholavira city. I present slide one now. Please move on to slide one. Yeah, this is slide one. It's for the location of Dholavira and the gateway where the signboard was found. Slide one shows the location of the various ancient Harappan on the Indus site in the northwestern part of Bharat. Dholavira in the Kutch district of Gujarat is marked in red color. The meticulous Dholavira city plan was divided into three parts, which were addressed as the citadel, the middle town, and the lower town. Each part had massive stone walls around. Entrances to each part were made through gateways. The signboard was located near the northern gateway of the citadel. In the picture, we can see the structure of the northern gateway. Each sign on the board measured almost 15 inches high and the board was 9.8 feet long. It, was, it is speculated to be a spine board, uh, sign board because the width of the board was matching with the width of the northern entrance gate of Dholavira Citadel. Ten symbols were seen on it that were inscribed and set with pieces of mineral gypsum. Gypsum is a widely distributed dehydrated mineral of calcium sulfate. It is hard white in color and crystalline in form. It has been used in Dholavira board to illuminate symbols and writings on the board. The wooden board with fell on earth, got decayed with time, but the gypsum symbols inscribed remained on earth intact within the framework. When the signboard was excavated by ASI in 1991, gypsum crystals were embedded in the earth and covered with mud and stones. The size of symbols inscribed on the signboard is comparable to the size of large bricks that were used on the nearby walls. Each of the times, 10 signs is about 15 inches high and the symbols, being big, could be viewed from a distance. The special feature here is that once the circular symbol has appeared four times on the board, which hints at its importance. Its large size, public nature, make it a key piece of evidence representing a different type of communication. Another four sign inscription with large letters on sandstone was also found at this site. I could not get a picture of this, but it true signboards were invoked during in this period. In today's talk, we explore what the 10 symbols of Dholavira signboard may communicate. Some of the symbols represent the objects that are used during Yagna, during Yagna rituals, and some of the constructed structure of uh, fire altars. Pictures of such objects are provided as support pictures for clarification. The significance of 262 in the symbols and 165 seals have been analyzed in my book, Symbolography in Indus Seals, from a Vedic perspective. The analysis of symbols on the board for what they communicate is worked according to the symbol analysis of the dictionary part of the book. I present slide two now. This is for the agenda. Initially, I explore the probable intention behind erecting a sign board. Secondly, I go through how the objects used in a yagna are compared to the symbols. Finally, it is deciphering 10 symbols of the Dholavira sign board, its significance and analysis. Now, coming to the first point, the probable intention behind erecting a sign board. It is interesting to, uh, I present slide three for this, for the signboard and its line drawings. It's interesting to see that signboards were invoked during the Indus civilization, even though the script of the language did not exist. An insight into the social life of that period, which is detailed in literary sources of Vedas, reveals that people performed yagnas to appease deities. The recurrent request was for rains, prosperity, a happy and a stabilized life. 
in the civilization was an era of yagdas performance of yagna by the people was the social order of the day for the maintenance and well being of society the governing society had also insisted that every yajmana of the house execute yagna meticulously a non performer of yagdas was considered a beast yagdas thus became the major activity of people for which recitation of vedic chants by vedic priests was mandatory the proof of the mandatory rules of performing yagdas is in yajur veda chapter 28.24 it states how the performer of yagda enjoys longevity and also enjoys the essence of vedic knowledge so should thou perform yagna yagnas require elaborate preparations and many ingredients making the wooden utensils from specific wood earthen vessels or handmade pots and fetching special type of soil for altar construction was tough for civilians and hence these were arranged to be disposed of for purchase in corporate departments through agents since performing yagna was the order of the day people could understand the simples and approach the related place to purchase the accessories required the place where these were purchased was indicated through symbols in very bold font so that people could notice them and approach them the study of the nature of symbols has been correlated by me to be related to the objects of yagna rituals yagnas were mainly of two types the first was the shrauta the big scale fire rituals performed in yagnashala it called for the participation of many priests big scale yagnas were the soma yagnas rajasuya yagna atiratha yagna agni adhaya that is the fire installing rituals etc krihiya the domestic rituals were performed by the yajmana of the house performing yagna was mandatory for all citizens and the non performers of yagna were degraded as beasts according to rig and yajur veda the performance of yagna involved the purchase of many ingredients the sponsor had to provide many things some of the necessary objects are listed here number 1 Some of these sticks and firewood of specific trees were to be collected. The sacrificial posts called yupa posts were to be chiseled from the specific trees like ashwatha, aldumbara, vikantaka, and palasha from the forest. Varieties of containers of different types of wood were to be made afresh before yagnas, because the used ones were always discarded in fire. According to Yajur Veda, chapter thirty point nineteen. the purchase of uh, wood required for approval of a supervisor of forest uh, who was responsible for the maintenance of forest he was called vanaya or vanapan vanaya vanapan meaning the forest officer was to be appointed to safeguard the forest wealth because the use of different types of wood for fuel wooden containers and sacrificial posts were collected from forest it gives a hint for how the forest and trees were maintained in ancient times second point is the construction of big scale fire altars in yagnashala called for the acquisition of land permission had to be acquired from the governing bodies of the village third point is similarly many rituals like the full moon and new moon rituals that were observed every month and also the chaturmasya the four monthly rituals but also complicated involving many priests procedures and accessories four point is animals like goats sheep antelopes etc etc required for immolation were also safeguarded by the officer called anukshatra in addition to this milk curds butter and ghee that were essential had to be purchased for the yagna because not all people rear cows in their homes within the forts cattle were reared in sheds called gomati and probably milk and rich products like ghee and butter and cheese were available with them for the performance of a yagna ritual sixth is six point is the soma sticks which were imported from mountainous regions in bulk were very expensive and equated to the cost of gold or an animal the required number of soma sticks had to be purchased the accessories required to crush soma and later filter it required many objects and tools these were available for purchase with the agents 
All yagnas were kept in an account by an accountant of the village affairs, Grama Ganaka, and all purchases had to be accounted for. The priest could conduct the yagnas. Uh, the priest to conduct the yagnas had to be arranged much in advance. Some aspects of how the civilians could fix the priest procure the required objects from the supervising organizers are listed in chapter 30 of Ajurveda, which included the socio-religious activities also. According to Ajurveda, the total number of yagna types were over 400. Several departments from where the materials needed for performing the yagna could be procured were gone by the king for the benefit of citizens. Every village had a chief and an accountant known as Gramanya Ganaka. He maintained an account of the transactions involved. Uh, the list of ingredients, the scale of yagna, and the span to which it went were to be noted by the village accountant. The materials required to perform yagna as prescribed by the priest were acquired from the agents called Anuchara of the cooperative houses. Now, understanding who are the Anucharas or Shanicharas? Anuchara is the term used for agents who work for orders and whom the sacrificer, after his diksha, engages to collect the materials for the sacrifice. Such agents were called Anucharas. Shanichara in Sanskrit means one who moves slowly. It included the crippled, the disabled ones, or the slow moving persons who were called Shanichara. They were engaged to procure or transport materials required for the proceeds of Agna from the above mentioned departments. Ajurveda chapter 30 also mentions how different types of people like tall, short, fat, black or white colored persons should be employed for suitable jobs. The symbols inscribed on the seal and on the signboard are similar. The inter seals can be read as the standardized format for the types of yagna that were performed as many seals depict the pictures of deities, altars and ritual objects. These are inscribed on the Indusil in symbolic and picture form. Such Indusils are about the Vedic civilization. The signboard with similar symbols has information about the Yenta activities that were the social order of that period. They are the archaeological proofs indicating about the ingredients and the details involved in Yenta ritual. The signboard is the display of a place where a chief accountant or the Anuchara could be contacted for the arrangement and waiting for the performance of the above mentioned rituals. It is for this reason symbols were in bold font of 15 inches in size displayed on a wooden board to attract the attention of common people who could see them from a distance. It probably read an intention communicating contact us for the rituals. It was done through inscribing symbols which was the mode of communication and was understood by the people during that period. Many symbol representations, even on the seals or miniature representation of the objects that are still in use during Edna rituals. The explanation of symbols on the board is supplemented with a picture of seals where they have appeared. I present slide four now. Uh, slide four, please. It is a line drawing of the symbols inscribed on the board and numbered for easy understanding. The number of symbols on the signboard is 10. I begin naming the symbols reading from left to right with the first symbol number one and then proceed to the significance of it. Symbol number one is identified as the circular Gadapatya fire altar. The second symbol with a rectangular top is identified as Pranita Patra. The third symbol is a filter called the Sharpavitra. Our fourth is a repeat of Garapatya symbol. The fifth symbol is Ahamaniya, that is the square fire altar. The sixth symbol is Chatushpata. Uh, the seventh symbol is a single stroke indicating Ekaha Vichu. Eighth and ninth are twin repeats of Garapatya and the tenth symbol is tongs called Parishasa. The symbols say a lot about all the rituals that were invoked during the Vedic and post-Vedic periods. Now I analyze the significance of each symbol number-wise 
the first symbol is indicative of the Gadha Pratyapai Raga. This circular symbol with six spokes is repeated four times on the board and also on many indices as symbol and hence its importance and significance in Indus civilization can be understood. An in-depth study of the literary sources and about the fire altars of Yagda rituals revealed that the symbol is identified as one of the three sacred altars called Gathapatya. I present slide 5 now. Slide 5 is for the ground plan of fire altars in a Yagnashala. It is important to know what is Gathapatya. Gharapatya is a circular fire altar and the fire in it was called householder's fire. By performing a yagna, all oblations that were offered to the gods was cooked on Gharapatya fire and offered on the square-shaped Ahavniya altar. In Vedic period, Akni was not just an element but revered in personification form as a deity and a celestial priest who carried the offerings to gods in the heaven. The belief was that the aspect intentions were granted by the gods. Thus, fire and fire altars, which were central to yagnas, were mandatory constructions while performing yagnas. Production of fire and installation of fire on the altar was to be done only through elaborate rituals along with the recitation of Vedic hymns by priests. It was mandatory because protecting the fire in altars with key and fuel, performing a homer and offering oblations in fire contributed to the health and wealth of this society. In this uh, slide, I present two pictures of Garapatya altar. The first picture is about the plan diagram of the Vedic of Yagnashala, around which three sacred fire altars in different designs and directions are structured. Vedi is an elevated or excavated plot of ground. It is quadrangular and in hourglass shape. The circular altar Garapate is marked blue in the picture for identification. Garapate is uh, four feet in area, is always placed to the west of Vedi. Ahavaniya is the square shaped altar placed to the east of Vedi, and Dakshinarni, the bow shaped altar, is constructed to the south of Vedi. The second picture is the structure of constructed altars around the Vedi and uh, where Huma is being performed in the current period. I proceed slide 6 now. Uh, slide 6 uh, depicts the precise location of altars in a Harappan sea. Slide 6 has three pictures which indicate the three altars of Yagnashala around the Vedi. The second picture is an in the sea which depicts the details of Agni Adheya ritual where the priest is igniting the fire altars. The hourglass shaped symbol is the Vedi. Vedi is zoom, uh, as seen in the first picture. In the second picture of Indus Seal, the top part of Vedi, supposed to be the southern direction, is a man. He is depicted as igniting the bow shaped altar called Dakshinarni, in which offerings are made for the dead forefathers or Pitrus. At the bottom of uh, uh, our glass shaped Vedi are two more altars ignited by the priest that depict Ahavaniya and Garhapatya to the east and west of Vedi. The third picture is a depiction of Yagnashala with altars. This uh, belongs to a place called Sonda near Sirsi, Uttar Kannada district of Karnataka belonging to 16th century CE. This beautiful panel has the inscription in Old Canada script, mentions the plan diagram of the altars, the name of Agnihotri priest who ignited the sacred fire altars while conducting the big scale yagna. The symbolic similarities between the two pictures prove the point that the symbolic representation on the indices is about altars. In Vedic period, Creating fire and installing Agni in fire altar was not a casual activity. Element Agni was perceived as a deity in personified form. Installation and worship of Agni in the altar had to be through an elaborate ritual. And the fire was maintained by priests called Agni Hotris, who fueled it twice a day all through the year. I present slide 7 now. 
it is uh, about the significance of how the Karapatya is depicted on the signboard and in the indices and why they are with six spokes within. The six spokes within the Karapatya symbol indicates the six seasons and the circle around the spokes indicates that Karapatya needs to be maintained all through the six seasons of the year. Garhapatya a fire was perpetually maintained by fueling it with logs of wood and was always used for warming or cooking oblatory material called havis. According to Shatapata Brahmana, the construction of Garhapatya represents the terrestrial world which is conceived as the womb. Hence, it is circular. Since both earth and womb are circular, after preparing the area for construction of altar in the Egdashala, like a cleaning area from weeds, stones, and insects, the circular space in this was strewn with saline soil, which is the fertile uh, soil with soluble salts. On this layer of saline soil, a layer of sand was scattered so that the amnion of uh, saline soil was not burnt out by sun's heat. This area was then enclosed within a circular boundary of stones. I present slide 8 now. It is for the Garapatya altar with Vasupurusha. The six divisions in Garapatya symbol also has another significance of Vasupurusha. In picture 1, within the circular frame of Garapatya, six stones are laid, which are depicted even in the seals and the, as the six spokes of Garapatya symbol. The six stones symbolically represent the Vastu Purusha, the god of construction of a structure lying on his back. Vastu Purusha is associated to the signs of direction in the constructions of a structure or a house. The six stones that look like spokes are a symbolic illustration of the architectural culture of ancient India. The central line constituting two spokes signifies the head, back and feet of Vastu Purusha in a line. Four more diagonal spokes or the stones indicate the four appendages of limbs, two shoulders on top, and two at the bottom as thigh part of Vastu Purusha. While laying the bricks, <coughs> the priests followed the movement of the sun. The circular boundary structure is raised around this. This is about the significance of Karapatya Fire Altar, which was the most important part of a Yagnashala and depicted often in the seals and four times on the signboard in a symbolic form. I present slide 9 now. Uh, slide 9 refers to symbol number 2 of the board. It is Pranita Patra, also recognized as Chamasa, the wooden container with a handle. Pranita Patra is a rectangular or square shaped and four cornered wooden vessel in which holy water was fetched and kept near Garapatya fire. This is indicated on the signboard symbolically next to Garapatya. The holy water was used to mix the dough for Purodasha. Purodasha is a cake made of grains. Usually the grain cake is offered in Agni's sacrificial rituals. Pranita Patra is 8 inches in length and 4 inches in height with the handle. It's made of a uh, special variety of wood, Nyagrodha or Rahita wood. The last picture shows how the Pranita Patra looks like. The rectangular Patra which is seen on the board is with two depressions. It is called Sakshira Pranita Patra. One which carries milk or payasa and the other carries sacred water. It is used in Chaturmasya rituals, that is a uh, full moon and new moon rituals, where an oblation of payasa cooked in milk is offered to Marut gods. The second symbol of uh, Pranita Patra on the board hints about the undertaking of various objects required for Chaturmasya rituals. The quadrangular uh, shaped wooden vessels, also called Chamasa, were to be made in different types of wood. In a, it was designed in many varieties and designed according to the Yagna perform. The handles were made of different designs that were used according to the status or ranking of priests. 
these were not reusable and were to be made afresh for every agna and hence procuring of it was displayed on a board. I present slide 10 now. This refers to the third symbol of the board that is Dasha Pavitra. Dasha Pavitra is the fridge woolen filter with a handle held over a big container called Drona Kalasha in Soma Yagna. This is for purifying or filtering Soma juice after crushing. The central part of uh, Dasha Pavitra called Nevala Nabhi is made of the white wool of a living gram. Dasha is cloth. The central part of filter is cut and rewoven with the wool of a living gram. The freshly crushed juice of Soma was filtered in this array as a purifying act. This symbol could also be another type of filter with strands of munja grass called walasrua. The central part was woven with the hair of a cow's tail. It was specially made to filter masara in the preparation of sura. The first two pictures show how the symbol is depicted in the board and how it looks in the in the sea. The third symbol, the Shapavitra, on the board indicates the availability of special object required for Somayagna. The fourth symbol on the board is Gharapatya symbol repeated. Gharapatya is already discussed. It is here depicted with a square shaped Ahavanya Arta as the fourth and fifth symbols. I proceed to slide 11 now. Uh, it is for the fifth symbol of the board, a square shaped symbol. This symbol is seen in many indices also. It is identified as the Ahavaniya, the sacred fire altar, as it is drawn next to Garapatya on the board. Slide 11 has two pictures. Uh, the square shaped altar Ahavaniya is shown as the first symbol of the intercept, the Harapansi, where many symbols are inscribed. In the first picture, I have zoomed the symbol. The second picture is the construction of Ahavaniya altar in which Homa is being performed in the current period. The construction of Ahavaniya fire altar is in five layers. This can be seen in the second picture of brick construction. Square shaped Ahavaniya is the sacred fire altar constructed to the east of Vedi and one of the three principal, principal sacrificial fires. Offering habis or oblation to deities in Yagna is always poured into Ahavaniya altar. The construction of this altar through a complicated procedure was mandatory in all Yagnas. Many priests were called while installing fire on this altar. Hence, it is advertised on the board about it through symbols. Because without these altars, Yagna could not be performed. The square shaped Ahavaniya symbol on the board is by the side of Karapatya symbol. It communicates to contact agents if one has to know about the constructional aspects of altars for the Yagna and the availability of various ingredients required while constructing them. It also hints about the arrangement of many priests required while using the altars. I present slide 12 now. It is for the sixth symbol of the board looking like crossroads. It is called Chatushpata. The sixth symbol of uh, Dolavira board lacks clarity but has been traced by the impressions created on the line drawings by scholars. The analysis is based on the reconstructed line drawing which is to be two intersecting lines identified as Chatushpata. This symbol is also depicted in many Harappan seals that can be seen here. Chatushpata is a place where the four roads meet and represent the area of human settlement near rivers. Dasha Purnamasa rituals uh, that are related to the full moon and new moon rituals. Uh, all four categories of Vedic priests participated in it as it called for elaborate preparations. The crossroad symbol on the board hints and the availability of accessories to perform Darsha Purnamasa rituals. 
the crossroad was believed to be uh, one of the dwelling places of Rudra and an oblation is offered to Rudra in Mahapitriyagna and in the triumph of Homa. Samastahoma was another ritual where the condensed offering of meat was offered at the crossroads of, uh, by the at the crossroads by the rishis. The symbol on the board indicates the availability of ingredients, accessories, and the priests associated with the various rituals connected to Chatishpata. I present slide 13 now. The seventh symbol of the board. A long stroke indicates idma. Industries are with uh, different types of strokes in varying numbers as symbols. If one set of symbol is bold and short strokes, some are long ones. Each convey a different information. The single uh, long stroke on the signboard is identified to be the representation of either idma or the one day soma ritual ekaha. Itpa means wood used for kindling fire, offered along with Samidini verses and recited at the time of kindling sacred fires. It is made of palasha or khadira wood and varies in size according to the rituals. The uh, symbol of the single stroke represents a single oblation of firewood, a wooden log offered to deity Prajapati, who is the creator of all beings. The second interpretation for the single long stroke is that it may also be indicative of the one day Soma Yagna called Ekaha. The six priests called Shadhotris are required to perform Ekaha Soma ritual. The symbol on the board communicates the availability of special type of wood as Idma or the ingredients and the priests required for the one day Soma ritual called Ekaha. I present slide 14 now. Uh, Sippers 8 and 9 of the board represented as two circular Garapatya symbols in the twin form. This indicates the ritual Punaradheya. Punaradheya is the reinstallation re of fires in the newly constructed Garapatya. When the fire in the active Garapatya gets put off under certain contingencies such as illness, um, calamities, uh, accident, death of the hegemana, loss of wealth and loss of prosperity or even non-maintenance, etc. The inactive Garapatya was abandoned or discontinued. Reinstallation of fire on the newly constructed Garapatya is performed in the same elaborate paradigm of Agnadheya which is the initial rite of installing sacrificial fires in altars. It is also a prayaschitta, meaning seeking pardon when the original Garapatya or Ahamnya fires are extinguished by, the, by accident or discontinued for some reason. The abandoned altar is called Trajahitta. The picture of Harappan seal also depicts two Garapatya altars to communicate how Punaradeya was performed when Garapatya was not maintained because the commencement before the commencement of uh, Soma Yagna. The colored picture of performing a Yagna in the current period also depicts two circular Garapatya altars. This also confirms the reinstallation of the new Garapatya altar before the commencement of a Yagna. Since the representation of two Garapatya symbol in wheel shape can be seen on the signboard in the seal picture and the picture of Yagna in the current period, it confirms that the symbol is indicative of Punaradheya. The new Garapatya is built by the side of the abandoned Garapatya altar and the newer one shows ritual activity. At present slide 15 now, the last and tenth symbol is Parishasa or Shafa. The tenth symbol on the board is uh, a tongue, a pair of tongs called Parishasa made of Udumbara wood for lifting the heated pot from the fire. It is used in the fire ritual called Pravargya. The symbol of tongs is indicated in many seals also. Performing Pravargya fire ritual was mandatory and to be performed as a minor ritual before the commencement of uh, big scale Somayatna. 
the representation of Parishas at Tongs as the law symbol on the board indicated the availability of this tool. Or it may also be indicative of the availability of accessories of the Pravargya fire ritual. Now coming to conclusion, I want to slide 16 now. This approach proposes a new interpretation for the previously unsolved puzzle of Dholavida signboard. The symbols used in the signboard are also seen in many Harappa novel in the seals. Each symbol has distinct data about a yagna. The repetition of circular symbol of Garapatya altar appears to be the central theme because Agni or fire was of great importance in ancient times. The representation of two identical circular symbols together is also decoded. The square altar of Ahavaniya indicated is also discussed in this talk. Interestingly, the pole shaped semicircular altar called Dakshinagni, where oblations are made to the dead Pitros, is not indicated on the signboard. This may be a clue that accessories of Shraddha or death related rituals were not part of this agent. The symbols appear to have more relevance to social religious aspects rather than having linguistic resemblance to Brahmi or Sanskrit script. The structure of symbols is a miniature replica of the objects used in rituals. Since indices have information about Vedic civilization, the sign board with the same symbols also has information related to the social order of Yagna activities of the Indus period. The signboard is the archaeological proof of the display of the ingredients and other details involved in the performance of a yagnic ritual. Hence, the conclusion is the signboard is the display of a place where the accountant of the village affairs, Grama Gandaka, and the Anuchara could be contacted for procuring the accessories and the ingredients required for yagna because the purchase of objects had to be accounted for. The symbolic depiction of altars on the board indicates that the place also made arrangements for the priests who conducted the performance of many types of rituals. The signboard of Dolavira gives knowledge about some socio-religious aspects of the past in the civilization in a symbolographic presentation. With this, I end my talk. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Professor Skanda Mishra, for inviting me to this uh, webinar. I apologize for uh, the link could not be connected, and hence there was a delay. Kindly excuse me. Thank you all. Yes, uh, Dr. Ram Shankar, sir. Yeah. Please. Uh, I profusely thank Professor Madam Rekha Rao uh, for extensively covering the, all the aspects connected with the decoding of the symbols, 10 symbols, and she has extensively gone through the literature, the Shrauta literature, and connecting it with each symbol and the various the symbols that occur in this Dholavira, she has tried to connect it with various symbols occurring in various seals. So she has made a very extensive study, and I profusely thank her for her painstaking effort. And uh, as I used to repeatedly see, many are not uh, indulging in the recent years the study of the Indus, though efforts are on. And this is really an excellent approach she has uh, tried to identify each symbol occurring in the Dholavira signboard. And uh, I'm very happy, though very late medieval record, you know, she could connect the thing, you know, with the Sonda inscription, where we have a graphic uh, representation of all the Ahavaniya, uh, Dakshinapati, and this uh, uh, altars. So, uh, this is a great effort, and uh, already, you know, I keep telling, we cannot uh, see in isolation 
epigraphical studies and the index. So we have to try to relate it, bring it together, and uh, bring many more, uh, uh, though, of course, little later period, early, early period epigraphs, connect it with various uh, symbols. She has tried to demonstrate it. As uh, it is said, you know, the one is the decipher, deciphering, giving some phonetic values to the symbol, and another is giving the uh, interpretation she has quite successfully uh, succeeded in uh, identifying uh, different things. You know, absolutely, it's a very excellent presentation. And uh, I have a message again, I keep telling uh, these uh, young scholars should take a leaf from her and pursue whatever she has done. And uh, already she has authored so many books, even uh, specifically with regard to the Indus also symbolography. So again, I thank her uh, for giving excellent presentation and uh, Skanda Mishraji uh, give me an opportunity to associate myself and listen to the excellent presentation and other uh, faculty members of the college for an opportunity given to me. Uh, thank you very much, sir. In a brief, I have tried to sum up uh, whatever she has done it. Excellent. And uh, further, I wish she should pursue uh, to bring, shed more light on various symbols that occur in different seals and seals. Thank you. Any question or from audience? Yes, yes. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Nigam, please unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Madam, I'm Rajiv Nigam from Goa, NIO. And uh, Congratulations for the excellent lecture. First time I heard this type of lecture. Uh, and please uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me for my ignorance because I'm not an archeologist. Collectively, this all science at Dhalavira Gate, what they indicate about the nature of the city or what is available inside the city, what actually the entire, in, in totality, what the purpose it indicate. Uh, as uh, I mentioned before, these symbols display some information because, uh, as I said, performing Yagnas was not all that easy act. So many things had to be acquired, which was difficult for civilians to acquire them uh, because uh, wood of specific variety had to come from forest only and it had to be accounted for. So they displayed a board within the citadel. Uh, so that people could be contacted, the agents who supply these uh, required materials. So this is, is, uh, okay, please, please complete it. Please. Yeah, so the, it was displayed in a bold font so that people could notice them and come to the citadel for the required, uh, for acquiring the required things, the required tools, all the ingredients required. So it, it should simply say like a business board, what is available? Yeah, more than business, it was the social order. It had to be uh, observed by every citizen. They had to perform Yagna. So, but procuring them, there should be a place where civilians can contact trees. Arranging for 16 types of trees was not an easy task. Some agents were there who could do the arrangement. So, so the agents, uh, the, the place of the agents and the ingredients is uh, displayed on the board. Okay, madam. Thank you. Because I did some scientific work at Dhalavira. That's why I was very much interested in this talk. Uh, because we, of course, Dhalavira is known, world famous for water conservation system. Mm. And our uh, work has indicated that we had the world's oldest evidence for tsunami protection measures, uh, which is available at Dholavira. Mm. The, you, you very well talked about citadel, and citadel's wall is 18 meter thick wall. Even China wall is not that much thick. I will mm. cover those aspects day after tomorrow when I will give my talk. Yes. Thank you, madam.
Thanks a lot, and it's a really very interesting lecture. Thank you. Co yes. chair, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohanlal sir. Dr. Mohanlal sir, co chair of the session. Dr. Mohanlal sir. Oh, okay. So, uh, thanks, Dr. T. S. Avi Shankar, for chair the session, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Madam uh, Rekha Rao for giving a nice talk in uh, uh, our uh, webinar series. Thank you, all of you. बहुत अच्छा presentation रहा, Madam. और हम लोग बहुत इंतजार कर रहे थे और ऑडियंस भी अभी राजीव निगम साहब जो कि गोवा से हैं और अभी धोलावीरा लोथल पर वो चार सितंबर को टॉक देंगे तो हम लोग सुनेंगे उसको भी तो बहुत ही अच्छा रहा और हमारे वेबिनार सीरीज के लिए आपका ये लेक्चर एक महत्वपूर्ण कड़ी था जिससे कि हमको पहले भी लोगों ने जो है वो इंफॉर्म किया था कि वो सेशन हमको जरूर देखना है तो आपने समय दिया डॉक्टर टी एस रविशंकर ने शेयर के लिए समय दिया हम अपने ऑडियंस की ओर से अपने कॉलेज की ओर से एमपी हायर एजुकेशन की ओर से आपको बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देते नमस्कार थैंक यू नाउ नेक्स्ट सेशन इमिनेंट स्पीकर डॉक्टर राम कृष्णा फार्मेली डायरेक्टर जूलॉजिकल सर्वे ऑफ इंडिया चेयरपर्सन प्रोफेसर दिनेश चंद्र भट्ट इमेरिटस प्रोफेसर जूलॉजी डिपार्टमेंट गुरुकुल कांगड़ी यूनिवर्सिटी हरिद्वार उत्तराखंड एंड को चेयरपर्सन डॉक्टर शिवेश प्रताप सिंह प्रोफेसर जूलॉजी डिपार्टमेंट गवर्नमेंट पीजी कॉलेज सतना डॉक्टर शिवेश प्रताप सिंह जी जो हमारे फ्रेंड भी हैं हमारे सहपाठी भी हैं और साथ में ये जो नेशनल एकेडमी ऑफ साइंस इंडिया का एसोसिएशन है हमारे वेबिनार में उसके सेक्रेटरी हैं और अच्छे साइंटिस्ट हैं इस एरिया के लगातार जो है कॉन्फ्रेंस और और भी इस तरह के एकेडमिक चीज़ों में जुड़े रहते हैं हम स्वागत करते हैं आप सभी का और आ, I am request to uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Dinesh Bhatt Sahab to chair the session and Shivesh Pratap Singh to please co-chair the session and eminent speaker uh, Dr. Ram Krishna, uh, please to start your talk. Dr. Yes sir, yes sir. I have a request. Please unmute yourself sir, Bhatt sir. Yeah, my unmute has been done. ओके हाँ अब ठीक है इज इट वॉट ओके इज इट ऑडिबल इज इट ऑडिबल ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू कैन यू कैन यू मेक द प्रेजेंटेशन सर फ्रॉम योर एंड कैन यू मेक द प्रेजेंटेशन फ्रॉम योर the speaker of this session dr ramakrishna dr ramakrishna is an eminent scientist and uh, contributed a lot to the field of geology and ecology his contribution includes authorship of about 48 books editorship of about 98 books and more than 200 Uh, research publications in different journals of international and national repute he served geological survey of india as director for a number of years he was member of the wildlife board of india he acted as advisor to the ministry uh, for all geological matters of the country while in service he was member of national biodiversity authority sites iucn cbd and um, he has visited a number of natural history museums in different uh, uh, european countries and usa canada etc he also promoted wetland research in india 
Uh, this is a short uh, uh, biodata about uh, Dr. Ramakrishna. Uh, so in this session, I welcome him and request him to deliver his talk. And uh, I understand the title of his talk is Satpura Hypothesis and Distant Distribution. Now I invite Dr. Ramakrishna to deliver the talk in this session. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Sri Sharada Guru Gyoda Maha. Namaskar to all of you. Good morning to all of you. It's my pleasure to be with you all on this occasion of webinar from Madhya Pradesh. I'm speaking on a subject known as Satpura Hypothesis, in which the state of Madhya Pradesh has a major role to play in the distribution of plants and animals. So it's very simple how the Madhya Pradesh, especially the Satpura and Vindhyas and the rivers Narmada and Tapti has helped in the distribution of plants and animals throughout the entire scenario. This is my, the core or the essence of my presentation. So may I request to go for my first slide? Can you, sir? I sent my presentation to you. Dr. Mishra, the presentation will be from organizer sites. Yeah, yeah. I sent my okay. presentation to the okay, organizers okay. Uh, yesterday also, today also I sent it. Okay, okay. Otherwise, if you can tell me how to just uh, attach from my end, I can do it. Dr. Mishra, Dr. Eskanji. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. डॉक्टर रामकृष्णा सर आपने भेजा था हमारे पास हाँ भेजा था सर अभी भी भेजा हूँ मैं आपको मेल चेक करिए और व्हाट्सएप में भी भेजा हूँ मैं इसमें लेस माय ईमेल में भी भेजा हूँ ओके ओके भेजा तो वैसे कैन यू जस्ट टेल मी हाउ टू जस्ट लोड इट फ्रॉम माय एंड एंड आई कैन जस्ट सर जस्ट हाँ ओके Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Down, download हो रहा है तब तक आप सामान्य चीज बताएं सर. Okay, sir. General, general बताएं मैं download करा रहा हूँ. Okay. Okay, okay. Hmm. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
सर रामाकृष्ण सर मैं शुरू करूं ठीक सर मैं शुरू करूं चेयरमैन साहब हेलो हाँ सर आप लेक्चर शुरू करिए तब तक हम इसको डाउनलोड करा के और जल्दी ही शेयर कर ओके जी ओके जी ना धन्यवाद चेयरमैन सर हाँ ओके सर चेयरमैन सर एंड को चेयरमैन सर इट्स इंडीज अ प्लेजर एंड हाईली थैंकफुल टू ऑर्गेनाइजर्स मिश्रा जी एंड ऑल अदर्स फॉर गिविंग मी एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू स्पीक ऑन अ सब्जेक्ट नोन एज फॉर हाइपोथिस before we understand about the uh, satpura hypothesis i wish to take you the indian scenario india is one of the mega biodiversity countries in the world one among the 17 of the 17 mega biodiversity countries in the world india is one among them as all of us know most of the mega biodiversity countries are located in the tropical region except the alaska So most 17 up to 17, most of them are located in the tropical countries. Now, my subject topic or the subject matter is on the Satpura hypothesis and the distant generation. Kindly go uh, faster also because the time is very short for me. Next one, please. Ah, this is what I said about the mega diversity countries in the world. There are 17 mega diversity countries in the world. India is one among them, and most of the mega diversity countries are located along this equator. Next one, please. I will make a bullet type of a presentation because the time is uh, as already we have taken. This is an Indian scenario where the central plate, which has got the Satpura and Vindhya high, Vindhyas, at the same time they have got a very good and an excellent river system, namely the Narmada and Tapti, besides Son and other. chambal son and many others so this has played a major role in the distribution of animals next one please now this is what i said the, the, what i exactly i wanted to tell you this madhya pradesh with india and satpuras are located in between the indo gangetic plain and the deccan plateau this is exactly that is what how they have shared their distribution of plants and animals in the entire geological period next one you can go yeah this is the central highland the other of three maps one is the left one indicate the central highland which indicate the madhya pradesh the second one the, Madhya, the middle one indicates the satpura and satpura and the vindhyas and the rivers along with it and the third one on the right side you can see the western ghat You can see the river Satpura and uh, uh, Vindhya, Vindhyas, and at the top of it, we have got the Himalayas, which Himalayas includes the northeastern states as well as the eastern Himalaya. This is what we are speaking about: how the distribution of plants and animals has taken place over the geological period. Next one, please. Now, before we understand about, let me understand about the Indian scenario. The India is entirely divided into ten biogeographic zones, starting from the Trans Himalaya, Himalaya, the Deccan Plateau, the semi-arid, uh, arid or the desert, the Gangetic, the East and West Coast, the North East India, and the coastal. Thus, we have got what is known as the ten biogeographic zones that has been there. The Central Highlands is a part of the Deccan Peninsula. and located between the the gangetic plain that is the himalayas and the western ghat on your left side the pink color indicate the western ghat next one please now this is a part of the western ghat the western ghat starts from the dong district of gujarat runs up to the end of the country or the kanyakumari it is nearly about 1600 kilometers now there are certain plants and animals which are located in the western ghat but these when we analyze these plants and animals these are not exactly our own this has migrated from the northeast india from the indo malian region or from the indo chinese region so we have to account how these indo malian region indo malian plants indo malian elements especially what is known as the fishes have migrated from them uh, from these one into our own western ghat this is the essence of my talk namely the satpura hypothesis 
on your right side, you can see there are 36 hotspots in the world. Of the 36 hotspots in the world, this is the latest one. 35 was there in the earlier. Now the 36 one more was added from the Australia. So there are 36 hotspots. Of the 36 hotspots in the country, we have four hotspots. The one is one of the entire stretch of Himalaya is one of the Himalayan hotspots. The second one is the Western Ghat and the Sri Lanka hotspot. The third one is below the Barak Valley or the uh, what is known as the Brahmaputra Valley. And that is known as the Indo-Burmese hotspots. And the Nicobar is coming under the Malayan or the Sundal and hotspot. Thus, India is unique in their distribution, having the four hotspots. And all the hotspots are having a coverage along with the neighboring countries also. So this is the location or the distribution pattern of our country. Next one, please. And this uh, hotspot has been defined by uh, none other than John Mayer. Now, before we understand what is known as a Satpura hypothesis, we need to understand the distribution of plants and animals in space and time. So this distribution of animals in plants and plants and animals in space and time is a subject and this subject is what is known as the biogeography. So we need to understand what the biogeography of a country and then only we can able to understand how the plants and animals have gone into the distribution mode. So let us start with the biogeography. The definition of a biogeography is nothing but it's the discipline of a biology that studies the present. So biogeography studies what is present at present, um, present distribution and the past distribution also and the biological diversity underlying the environmental and historical factors. So this is the definition of the biodiversity. That means we have time and space is the essence of the biodiversity or biogeography is defined as the distribution of species of plants and animals in space and time. When we think or when we speak of a space, the space is not from one end to other end or from only Madhya Pradesh or Karnataka. It is the what is one of the entire scenario of the earth. That is the space. And the geological time, we don't take the time of our watch. We take the entire scenario of the world. So that is one of the geological time that we take. So the distribution of plants and animals in space and time is a subject. And this subject is known as the biogeography. And there are two branches in the biogeography. One dealing with the plant, that is known as the phytogeography. The other one dealing with the animals is known as the zoogeography. So we have two branches in the biogeography. Plant is known as the phytogeography. Animals is known as the uh, zoogeography. Next one, please. Next one, please. Now, this biogeography is not a only one subject, though it looks like one subject. That is the biology, geology, and geography. So this is not the one. It is a multidisciplinary approach. So we need to take into different uh, uh, facets of biology. It may include the climatology. It may include the pedology. Pedology means the soil structure. It may include the taxonomy of plants and animals. It may include the ecology of the animals. And it may include the evolution and the systematics. And besides the paleontology, geography, and the geology. All this is a multidisciplinary approach that we take when we speak about the biogeography. And once one of my uh, very honorable man, which I met him in the Harvard University, is the Elva Wilson. He said, there is, no, there is such a romantic subject. Biogeography is a romantic subject. He once uh, speaking to me, he said, it's a such a biogeography, biogeography is a such a romantic subject. We need to understand the basics of it. Next one, please. Now, when we think of a plant distribution, normally distribution of the plant, but whenever we see a plant, we say it's an endemic plant. We say it is a native plant. We say it may be coming from the other countries known as the exotic plants. Or the animals also are almost the same. When we see the distribution, the distribution is uh, namely, it may be an area restricted endemic or a native plant or an exotic plant. So this is how a plant or an animal is described. Next one. But when we think of a distribution of, next one please, when we think of a distribution of plants and animals, we use certain terminologies. We use certain terminologies. These terminologies are what we call it as the cosmopolitan distribution. The distribution everywhere is what we call it as a cosmopolitan distribution. And if it is restricted in one place or in the entire country, we call it the endemic distribution. If they are distributed in two different areas, we call it as a discontinuous distribution. So based upon the distribution of plants and animals, we call them, the species is endemic, 
differentiates is cosmopolitan and species is discontinuous in distribution. For example, if they are distributed in Himalayas and again in the Western Ghat, then it's a discontinuous distribution. This is how the distribution of the plants and animals, these are the terminologies that we often use. Next one, please. Now, what exactly a cosmopolitan distribution? If there are distribution, if a taxon, taxon means a family and below the family, genera, species and subspecies are distributed in a large area, the range extends across most of the world in appropriate habitats. That is the most important. The essence of it is appropriate habitats. It cannot live, plant and animals cannot live in an outside their habitat. So it has to be appropriate habitat. If they are living in that appropriate habitat, then we call it as a cosmopolitan species. A species may be cosmopolitan. So the examples you can see it. Next one, please. You can see some examples of the plants. Some, see, this is a dandelion. So this is a cosmopolitan species. This is a pova grass family. So pova protensis is an example for a cosmopolitan species. That means it is present many in many parts of the world. So these are some of the examples of the plants that are called as a cosmopolitan species. Next one, please. In the, among the animals, you can see there are four examples that I have given. Everyone knows a sparrow. Everyone knows a mina. Everyone knows a crow. So these are uh, distributed throughout the world, many parts of the world, appropriate habitats. So this is a cosmopolitan. The, again, on the one, on the top of, on the left top of it is the Rattus norvegicus. Rattus, rat. So Rattus norvegicus is distributed because of the transportation through the water as well as the air. So it has transported in most parts of the world. That is why we call them as a cosmopolitan species. Next one, as opposed to the cosmopolitan species, we have endemic. Endemic species are those species, are those animals and plants which are restricted distribution. They are present only in that area, nowhere else. So such a plant, such an animal is known as an endemic plant or an endemic animal. So a taxon whose distribution is confined to a given area. Sometimes it may be only a state, it may be a district, or it may be the entire country. So it is a what we call the endemic to the country, endemic to the state of West Bengal, endemic to the state of Madhya Pradesh, like that one, we usually uh, refer to them as endemic species. So a species may be any rank, any rank means family level, generic level, or the species level, and they are restricted in an area, and such is known as an endemic plant. So if you, you want to understand what is subpara hypothesis, one need to understand what exactly the endemic, what exactly cosmopolitan, and what exactly this junk distribution. Next one, please. So there are some examples that I can able to give you. For example, four examples I am giving you. The left top of it is known as a, 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 what is known as the lion tailed maca. This lion tailed maca is present only in the western part of Kerala and Karnataka, nowhere else. So it is endemic to the Western Ghat. On your right side, again, another one is known as a Nilgiri Thar. Nilgiri Thar is restricted only to the Nilgiri Hills, only certain parts of the Nilgiri Hills, nowhere else. So this is an endemic. Similarly, we have a Himalayan goat. Same uh, Nilgiri Thar, Hemitragus. So they are present. So they are present only in Himalaya, nowhere else. So that's a, uh, such a one is what is called as the endemic species. The third one I am giving you is present only in Manipur. Nowhere else. This is commonly known as Sangai. Sangai, the Manipur or a dancing deer. So they are present on the Pumdis and the wetlands of the Pumdis of the Manipur. Nowhere else. So such an animal is known as an endemic. The third, fourth one, the right side, looks like a small pig. Actually, it is not pig. It is known as a Sus salvinus. It is an animal belonging to a different group. It's not a pig group at all. It's a different group present only in Assam, nowhere else. So we have taken up uh, the relocation or the translocation this way because they thought this is a pig. They killed ex extremely, they killed almost all of them. Only a few were left. Now they are, we are uh, culturing them, we are growing them, we are breeding them and bringing back to what is known as the nature or the wild, uh, this one. So these are the examples to show endemic. Endemic means they belong to the own. Next one, please. Now, there are certain plants also. Look at the plants, rhododendron. It belongs to Ericaceae. So this rhododendron is restricted to certain area. Of course, the rhododendron has migrated or what we want to taken away by Europeans now. It is most of the Europeans are full of rhododendron. So this rhododendron is restricted to Himalayan belt, restricted to Western Ghat. So some of 
these endemic species like rhododendron, eumontia, or elusin uh, caracana, or caryota urens. That is where we, we are using uh, caryota urens as the Araceae member, or the Protonaria is a Fabaceae member, or a Ficus uh, moraceae member. Uh, so these are some of the examples where they are restricted to Indian subcontinent, nowhere else. For example, Arta corpus. Arta corpus heterophyllus, that is the jackfruit. Jackfruit belongs to India, nowhere else. Now it has, uh, we have, they have taken away in some other. So these are the animals that are located from India only. So these are known as the endemic, anime, endemic species or the endemic animals and plants. Next one, please. The next one, you look at the Hima, what is known as the Western God. The Western God is one of the biodiversity hotspots. It is known as one of my colleagues called as the hottest of the hotspot. One of my colleagues, Dr. P.T. Cherian, he called as the hottest of the hotspot. Look at the number of the species in the 1,600 kilometers of area. Now only the flowering plant, what I am speaking, is nearly about 7,402. This is about eight years back. Now it has become almost like 7,500 species of species of flowering plant are distributed only in Western Ghat, nowhere else. So these are the species, the highest number of species. That is how we call it as a biodiversity hotspot. That means 70% of the original species has to be left in that area. Only 30% must have, might have gone because of the anthropogenic activity. That is the definition of a biodiversity hotspot. Now out of this 7,400, look at this, 2,200 are cultivated and 1,273 belongs to that area only. That means endemic. So this is how we say that one, an area having a biological diversity. How this so much of plants and animals have entered into what we call it as the Western God. From where it has come? Has it arose alone, there only? Or has it come, migrated from the other one? Is what the biodiversity hotspot, what, what the Satpura hypothesis has to look into. Next one, please. Now, there are two types of endemics. Endemics which are present in that area or nowhere else, we call it as a paleoendemic. Paleo means old, paleoendemic. And some of them, what happened was, it was an endemic, then bifurcated because of various geographical factor and formed two new species that we call it the new endemic or the neoendemic. So there are two types of endemic. One with the species may be a paleoendemic or a neoendemic. Neo means new, new endemic species. So there are two types of endemic. I will not go into the detail much. It takes some more time about uh, this to, to tell you about how these endemics have formed. So next one, please. Now, the third one important that one has to understood is what the Satpura hypothesis, this continuous distribution. If they are distributed in two different places, far away from their original place, and that distribution is called as a discontinuous distribution, or what we call it as a disjunct distribution. For example, if a species is present in Northeast India, the same species, if it is present in the Western Ghat or in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, we say their distribution is disjunct or distribution is discontinuous. There is no continuity at all. There is no continuity at all. That means from the Western Ghat to the Northeastern India, there is no uh, in between, there are some gaps. Such a type of a distribution is what we call it as a discontinuous distribution or disjunct distribution. Next one, please. Now, these are some of the examples. For example, Ramnesi is a member. Ramnesi, Ramnes virgatus is another one. Bear is a, usually they called in Hindi, the bear that we fruit that we eat. Ramnes, the Ramnesi family. So you see this one. They are present in China. They are present in Japan. They are present in Himalaya. At the same time, they are present in Nilgiris and Palne Hills. Such a type of a distribution is what we call it as a disjunct distribution. These are some of the very more various rather examples of the plant that I can able to go on and on. So that type of a distribution is known as a disjunct distribution. Next one, please. Now, this one, most of you know, amphibians. This is the one type of an amphibian where they don't have limbs. These limbless amphibians, they are known as Sicilians or Gymnophiana or Apoda, that means limbless amphibians. These limbless amphibians are restricted to Western Ghat or from maybe Northeast India or from, uh, from the Madagascar or from Southern the tropical regions all present. So such again, an example for a distant distribution is this one, Sicilians or Gymnophiana or what we call as Apoda. Examples from the amphibians is an example for distant distribution. Next one, please. So even the crocodile, gharials, 
JDLs are present only in Ganges and Brahmaputra, nowhere else. So they have originally it was present throughout, now they are restricted now. Such a type of a distribution, we call it as a disjunct distribution now. So you can see the various types of crocodiles distributed throughout the world, and then we have a quorum species. So this is another example for a disjunct distribution. Next one, please. So normally I spoke about the biogeography. This biogeography is classified, is divided into three important aspects. One is known as the ecological biogeography. The second one is known as the historical biogeography. The third one is conservation biogeography. Yesterday you have heard an excellent talk on the uh, what is known as the sloth bear distribution. The sloth bear distribution and their conservation is an excellent example for the conservation biogeography. I will not go into the detail about the conservation of uh, conservation biogeography. I will take up only the little aspect of the first two, namely the ecological biogeography as well as the historical aspect of the bio biogeography. Next one, please. Now, what is this ecological biogeography? That means the biogeography is nothing but the distribution of plants and animals in space and time. What, how the ecology plays a major role in the distribution of plants and animals? So there are certain factors. What are these factors? There are three important factors that you can think. The first one is the climate. Climate plays a major role in the distribution of plants and animals. The second one is the primary productivity. The photosynthesis, primary productivity is nothing but the photosynthesis. Photosynthesis plays a major role in the, what is known as the distribution. If there are more number of trees, more number of plants, then we have got more number of animals. So interaction will be more. So the distribution is depends upon the photosynthesis. The third one is known as the habitat heterogeneity. So this is Wilson and McCock. Uh, MacArthur has given one of the examples of the habitat heterogeneity. I'll take up one by one. Now climatic heterogeneity is also or the climatic equability is one of the important factor for the distribution of plants and animals. One should understand, next one please, one should understand what is the climate, what is the weather. What you see outside is the weather. Maybe hot, maybe cold, maybe rainy, maybe sultry. This is the weather for today. When we speak, next one please, when we speak about a climate, the climate is a long term average. A very long term average, climate change. Climate change is not only what is happening in today and tomorrow. Climate change, when we speak about the climate change, the climate has changed over the years, maybe 40 years, 50 years, or 100 years, that we take and a long average of the climate that we take. And what are the factors that the climate includes? The climate includes, one of the important is the temperature. The climate includes the temperature. When the temperature changes, then again the distribution of plants and animals changes. And again, which in turn depends upon altitude and the latitude. Again, the distribution of the plants and animals depends. If you go to Northern uh, Hemisphere, the number of birds are very less. When you come to the tropical India uh, or Sri Lanka or uh, somewhere in Malaysia, the number of birds are more in number. So it depends upon the altitude at the same time, the latitude also. So distribution of a plant and animal depends upon the climate, that is the temperature. And it, again, the temperature in turn, in turn depends upon the latitude and altitude as well as the sunlight. The second one is the pre precipitation. What is precipitation? Rainfall. When the rainfall is more, we have got a good number of plants and animals, then the distribution of animals is more. So again, the climate plays a major role. So this is the second important factor. The third one is known as the light intensity, the sunlight. For the photosynthetic activity, the sunlight is most important. That is known as the climate. And lastly, there is the humidity. That is the amount of water vapor present in the air is the humidity. So the distribution of plants and animals depends upon the climate, which in turn depends upon the temperature, precipitation, light uh, source or light intensity, because it gives the quanta or the energy source. And that is how the distribution of plants and animals takes place. Next one, please. Now, I said also hetero, ha, habitat heterogeneity hypothesis. There is a habit when the more number of niches, when the niches are more, when the addresses are more, the, the postman has to go to different places. So the number of niches are more means the more the diversity. When the number of niches are less, for example, if you place, uh, look at the uh, temperate regions or at the right side top, and that only three colors, you can see the blue, yellow, and the green. So the number of niches are less. When the number of niches are less, the distribution of plants and animals are less. 
when the number of in, uh, uh, distribution in niches are more you can see the second one is known as number of niches are more than the number of what we call it as the habitats are more and because of the habitat the distribution of more so more number of plants and animals are distributed next one please this is what we call as the habitat heterogeneity so this is how the these climate the photosynthesis as well as habitat heterogeneity plays a major role so the second important aspect that i want to speak about the sapphora hypothesis is the historical biogeography one need to understand what exactly historical biogeography when next one please when once you want to see what historical biogeography let us start from the beginning of the earth itself the earth began or earth formed somewhere around 4.6 billion years ago please remember earth was in a molten state and when it was in a molten state it started solidifying and that was a period it is known as the 4.6 billion years ago but the life originated not 4.6 billion years ago but the life originated somewhere around 3.5 to 3.6 uh, what is called million years ago so this is how the origin of earth and the origin of life started next one please when once the origin of life took place there was a period there was a period where only water vapor was there only ch4 or the methane was there only ammonia nh4 or nh3 was there and only hydrogen was there that was a situation when these coagulated there were various theories of origin of life and i do not go into the detail about how the origin life originated but i can only at this stage can say these are the components these are the chemicals that were present at that particular period water vapor condensed to form what is known as the marine ecosystem the marine ecosystem was formed when water vapor condensed at that particular period 4.6 billion years ago and then all these chemicals formed what is known as the protein from the protein it formed a nucleic acid from the nucleic acid it formed the life and next one please next one please and the life originated and started and gives a various period now the present period is known as the cenozoic period the present period in the geological history is known as the cenozoic period but before that one we have a period known as mesozoic and the paleozoic so there are these are known as the eras in the geological period paleozoic mesozoic and the cenozoic the modern man has formed only about 1.6 million years ago or the modern many of the flowers flowering plants has formed recently 1.6 million or 1.8 million or 2 million years ago whereas the most prototype of plants and animals formed about 3.5 billion years ago so this is how the geological period next one please in the entire geological period many plants arose many animals arose at the same time what is known as many plants are died many animals are died for example if you go to the devonian period many of the fishes have died if you go to uh, what is jurassic period many of the author uh, many of the reptiles jurassic reptiles especially the dinosaurs you know most of us know that during the jurassic period dinosaurs are completely wiped out so there is what is known as the extinction and this extinction is known as the mass extinction there were many plants and animals died in total that is known as the mass extinction or at the same time there are, there is a speciation also so always speciation and extinction goes hand in hand but in the entire geological period if you closely look at it there are five extinctions there are five extinction and what we see today is the sixth extinction between one extinction to other extinction it is a hundreds and millions of years but this recently the extinction rate has increased that is why the number of extinct plants extinct animals have increased so one need to understand what is an evolution there are various theories of evolution i will not go into the detail about how the darwin the uh, charles darwin or like the mark theory of evolution or hugo de vries theory of evolution or the micro mutation has taken place in helping the evolution that is a very different subject itself so at this stage i want to say that one the evolution of the plants and animals took place over the years from 3.5 million years to the recent one next one please so the geological history one has to understand and then they start migrating the plants animals when once they arose they did not remain in the same place they start moving from place to place there the migration and this was migration is mainly because of the ecological amplitude the next one please i will not go into the detail about it it takes some more time so one of the important thing one has to learn is known as where the plants are concerned originated where the plants and concerned are originated 
they are the main centers of origin. So there is known as the Wevelov theory. Wevelov is an, a Russian uh, botanist based upon the genetic, based upon the chromosome number, based upon the distribution of plants, especially the crops plants. He has entire country has been, entire world has been divided into nine centers. And India is known as the Hindustan center of evolution. So if, for example, if you look at the Atta Corpus of which I, what I said, or many of the Fabaceae members, or many of the uh, members, uh, for example, spices, or even mangoes and sugar cane, all these originated. So these are the centers of origin. And he said there are nine, next one, please. There are nine centers of origin, and one of the center is India, and this Indian origin is one of the Hindustan center. So what I want to stress upon you is, there are certain species of plants and animals which has originated itself in India. We call it as autochthonous species. Species which are originated in India itself is a, what we call the autochthonous species or the species which are originated in India. Some of them have migrated. I told you in the beginning, there are some migrations are also. Next one, please. This is the Vavilov. Vavilov given the nine centers of origin and one of the center for the crop species is known as the Vavilov center. So there are animals also, for example, if you look at the tiger, yesterday he was speaking about the tiger. The tiger originated in the central China. It migrated in India. One subspecies migrated into India and the rest in different places. So there you can, I will tell you at a later stage also. For example, leopard. Leopard is originated in India. It is not from the China. Leopard originated in India and migrated to different places. For example, you can see leopard in Sri Lanka, but not tigers. Why? So that is what I just wanted to tell you about the migration or the hypothesis that our uh, our director, Dr. Sundarlal Lahora, has spoken about it. Next one, please. So the, the, you can, next one, these are the Vavilov centers. Next one, please. There are nine centers in the world, and one of them is in India. For example, the citrus plant originated in India. So this is the next one, please. Now, I need to tell you something about the how the life originated or how the earth originated and given into the present day scenario. So there was a time, 4.6 billion years ago, when the earth was in the molten state, started solidifying it. And the uppermost layer is what is known as the earth crust. The earth crust is made up of plates. And these plates started moving in different directions. This is what is known as the continental drift theory, how the different continents are formed. This is known as the continental drift theory, which was proposed by none other than the Veg Alfred Wegener in 1912. But no one believed him. No one believed after Alfred Wegener has given such a wonderful theory of continental drift theory. Only in 1960, yes, yes, what he said, Alfred Wegener said is exactly correct. He said that when continents have drifted, the plates have started moving from one place to another place. That is known as the continental drift theory and how the continents have formed. So this is the next one, please. Now, there are evidences. You see, is it true or not? Whether what uh, Alfred Wegener said is true or not, there are various evidences. One is evidence from land forums, one evidence from the fossil forums, and when uh, from the climate. I will not go into the detail about the uh, climate, fossil, or land form. Just uh, one or two slides I want to show you how it was. Next one, please. Now, look at this one. He gives zigzag puzzle to the young ones, children. Look at the, how the America, the North America, South, uh, South America, and Africa is fitting together. This is how it was there. The entire world was together in one single unit. And next, this thing, this is how well, they are given an example. You look at how exactly it fits in uh, into the North America, South America, and the African continent is fitting together. This is known as a zigzag model, which the Alfred Wegener has given a good idea how the plates started moving in different directions. Next one, please. Now you can see this one. This is how it was once of then. So I'll come to you at a list. This look at this. We find grasshopper trees. Grasshopper trees are plants. The grasshopper tree is distributed in South America. Grasshopper tree is distributed in Africa. Grasshopper tree is distributed in uh, uh, India. Grasshopper tree is distributed even in uh, Australia. How can you account for this one? At one time, an entire scenario of the world was together. So this is how an example to say the paleontological evidence to show that when there are what are known the earth is made up of plates, the plates started moving in different direction. Next one, please. Next one, please. 
next one please yeah the one the single earth the single earth next you can take the go to the next one also no problem we can next the single earth the earth was a unit and this earth was what they called the pangea or what we call it as a super continent so the earth was a single unit super continent then started like a division just like a cell division it started like a cell division the upper part and the lower part the upper part is what we call it as the laurasia and the lower part is known as the gondwana so for example the madhya pradesh has got uh, a gondwana park so what exactly gond is a tri tribal group also probably it might have come, come from the gondwana or the go tribal group also anyhow this is a gondwana so we say that one the earth which was a single a super continent or what we call it the pangea divided into upper and the lower part the upper part is what we call it the laurasia the lower part is known as the gondwana next one please the gondwana is made up of again several continents see how you can see about 200 million years ago it formed two then about 130 million years ago it formed several and now recently you can see different continents so this is what we call the continental drift theory uh, has been given and this is how the gondwana the lower part is the gondwana look at the gondwana it contains south america africa arabia india and antarctica australia all these were together at one particular time there are many examples we can able to tell you how these uh, animals and plants were once distributed among them now it has gone into the different species mainly based upon this movement or the earth crust movement or the gondwana movement so next one please so can, these are some of the example to show how many of the animals were common in geologically they were common into the different gondwana area so this is one of the good examples to show that when animals were distributed at one particular time in all the continents but now they are restricted in different continents so this is an example to say what is known as the continental drift theory next one please now there are various next one also there are various theories also land drift theory and the next one please the land drift theory how it has helped so you can see very clearly here where was india where was africa where was so india was just like an uh, what is known as it is an island india once upon a time island attached to antarctica attached to africa attached to south america then started migrating into the different direction so the sea at which that particular period is known as the tethys sea t e t h y s so india was attached they are floating in the tethys sea next one please attached to madagascar next one so then they broke away this entire thing broke away from the gondwana area then india started migrating about 50 million years ago india started migrating about a 4 cm per year and then started migrating to the north and northeast so and cut the paleo uh, paleartic region the asia um, continent so then there we have what is known as the himalayan mountain these two plates land to land or what is one of the continent to continent has drifted and uh, touched each other and resulting in the formation of what is one of the himalayan mountain the angus chain of mountain which is about 10 million years ago is the himalayan chain of mountain mountain one also now there is right side you have a satellite picture we have got a satellite picture to show that one that the first meeting point between the asia minor and the indian subcontinent is the northeast india it was the northeast india it started attaching to the northeast india started migrating towards the western side that is how the, the pakistan side or the afghanistan side is the later stage whereas it meet, met initially in the northeast india that is how the most important aspect is known as the himalayan what is known as many of the elements many of the species from the malaya and many of the species from the indo china has migrated through the northeast in india this is one of the good example to say how they have migrated to india so these are the different continents you can see about 45 million years ago india how india was then it was separate it has got separated from the Af africa it got separated from the madagascar it got uh, separated from the trichelis and now it was separate and then started moving and 10 million years ago it struck the asia minor and formed what is known as the angus chain of mountain what we call it as next one kindly quickly you can go through the slides please so this is how the continent to continent drift theory has taken place next one please
this is an indian scenario so this is how it started moving from the 50 million years ago to the present day scenario where it has met at the asia minor and formed the highest chain of mountains and the himalayan chain of mountains the highest at the same time the youngest chain of mountains the himalayan mountain the himalayan mountains is the youngest chain and there is a speciations are more in number it is a mostly tectonic area this himalayan chain is mostly a tectonic area and because of this tectonic the, the tectonic plate so it is the more number of species are formed is the species uh, formation is more in the himalaya than in western ghat and other place of course we are not identifying them we have to identify more in the what we call the himalayan region than in the western ghats next one please so what is today india india is a subcontinent geologically originated from the gondwana and neo proterozoic supercontinent composed of the present day africa south america australia antarctica arabian peninsula madagascar and the indian subcontinent this is the present scenario of the indian which has come out and now what we are thinking india is in a biogeographic region and this region is what is known as the oriental region or the indo malayan region so india is located in the indo malayan region or the oriental region next one please so what happened i said it has merged in the northeast india first then went to the western side so the plants and animals migrated so what is known as a gateways the gateway is northeastern india the himalayan gateway or the indo chinese and malayan elements of flora and fauna there was one professor mani ms mani the, the most important man who has done excellent work on the biogeography is none other than professor ms mani uh, he was the man who has given a lot of information about how the plant migrated, how the animal migrated from the northeast India to the other parts of the country. So that is the one main that is known as the primary gateway. And then there are very large number of secondary gateways like Chittagong in Sundarbans, Garo Hills in Himalaya, uh, Rajamayal Hills and Darjeeling and the Himalayan Aravalli Range. So these are some of the ranges where they are known as the secondary ranges, how they are formed. Now, at one particular period, enormous environmental changes also taken place. That means well, that was helped in, in during the Pleistocene, about 100,000 years back, there was a good number of fragmentation took place, dispersal took place, and the population leading to the speciation also took place. And that is how the present day scenario has taken place. Next one, please. So there were glaciers. If, next one, please. If you look at the glaciers, there were 1,800 glaciers in the world, 1,98,000 uh, glaciers uh, in the world. Of this, uh, the Himalaya has got 9,000 glaciers. The glaciers are very important. When once it merged with the Himalaya and the, uh, what is known the Palearctic region, then glaciers were formed. We have about 9,000 glaciers. Many of them have not been identified at all as on today. So many of the glaciers are present. So this glacier formation, when, next one please, when once the glacier formation, the plants and animals started migrating because it has become too cold, it has become too cold, it started migrating, migrating towards the southern region, migrating towards the higher region. So you can see there is a theory and this theory is what is the Himalayan glaciation theory. Because there was a lot number of glaciation, temperature gone down like anything and this temperature, reduction in the temperature at the Himalayan region has started the beginning of the migration of the plants and animals to the peninsula of India, including the Western God and the what is known as the Sri Lanka. So that is how a theory has been formed. This is one of the Himalayan glaciation theory. Because of the glaciation, they migrated. Now we have some uh, what we call it as the what is known as the, <coughs> the temperature has changed. Now there's reverse flow. Now the plants and animals are moving upper and upper. So there is uh, climate change. Because of the climate change, it is going upper and upper. So this is what has happened earlier. Now what is happening nowadays? Next one, please. So two examples I'm giving you. One is a Himalayan thar. The other one is a Nilgiri thar. Nilgiri thar, actually it was a thar. Originally it was thar. Some of them now is restricted only in the Himalayan area. Now some of the thar has restricted only in the higher reaches of the Western Ghat. How can you explain the thar or a goat, a origin single, one extremely in the Himalayan belt, one extremely in the higher altitudes of what we call it as the Western Ghat. So this is how they have migrated. At the glaciation period, 
started helping them to migrate from the Himalayan region into the Western Ghat. Now, where do you find this Western Ghat tar? Western Ghat tar is not distributed everywhere. It is restricted in the topmost layer, upper layer, the topmost, which what is known as the Anamalai Hills. Anamalai Hills is the range where these are located. So they need a temperature less area and a grazing area. So they are restricted. So this is how they have helped. There are many other examples placed in relics in South India where I can go on and on about this, uh, how the majorly the plants have distributed in Southern India. The players still in, still in relics have formed in the Southern India. Next one, please. So one of the important area when India merged with the uh, Asian continent, formed what is the Himalayan, there were a movement, there were what is known as the movement of the plants and animals to the different parts of the world. And this is a theory, and this is what we call it as biotic theory or biotic peri hypothesis. Biotic hypothesis, when once the India got separated from Madagascar, Seychelles, and then struck the Asia Minor, the plants and animals start migrating to the different parts of the world. So that is what we call the biotic theory or biotic peri hypothesis. Next one, please. And the, the one on the right side, you have seen a frog. The frog was in 2002, it was described by none other than one scientist. Uh, now he is a professor in the uh, Delhi University, Professor Biju, and he has uh, found the genetic and he made a complete genetic analysis, genome analysis of gene, uh, sequences, DNA sequences, and found that they have got a relation with about Seychelles 30 million years ago. So that is how we can give examples also. So this is one example. When the India struck into the Asia Minor, some of the plants and animals migrated to the other parts of the world. This is what we call the out of India hypothesis. So many plants and animals migrated to the different parts of the world. And this hypothesis, you can see, give one of my friend, what is known as KP Dinesh, who has given me this slide. He has done excellent work upon the distribution of uh, amphibians to the different parts of the world. This is one of the uh, amphibians migrated from the Western Ghats to the different parts of the world. This is a hypothesis, and this hypothesis is what we call the out of India hypothesis. This is another example of a plant, another example of a plant migrating from India to the different parts of the world. This is going outside India. This is known as out of India hypothesis. Next one, please. There is another hypothesis. This is again another hypothesis, or this is the same hypothesis, out of India hypothesis. For example, this is was, there is a fish. This fairy fish is known as the Horectis. Hora was an excellent, uh, uh, what is known as ichthyologist. The former uh, Sundarlal Hora was the director of zoological survey of India. Also, he has been this uh, fish has been named after him Horectis. Now the number has the name has been changed. Nomenclature changes. It has become Varizas, Varizias. So this day, from the Western Ghats, you can see that one, they have migrated to the many parts of what we call it as the Asia, Asian continent. So this is an, another example from India, it has gone to the different, you can see the number of species has gone up like anything. So the second next example is, some of them have come from the outside into India. This is known as the into hypothesis. So a yes, plants or animals might have come after joining with the Asia Minor, Indian subcontinent, so they have come to India, and that is what we call as the into hypothesis. So one has gone out, out of India hypothesis. Many of them have come into the India. That is known as the into hypothesis. So these are the two hypotheses wherein how the plants and animals have distributed in Indian, Indian content in addition to its own autochthonous species. Next one, please. So this is another example. Wherever you go, you come across chameleon. The chameleon was once upon a time, if it find out the geological uh, what paleontological history they were originated in south america south africa then it came to madagascar from madagascar to seychelles and now we also have this one there is the same genus same species there is no change chameleon zelonicus is you can see this one this has come from south africa through madagascar so this is into hypothesis another example for into hypothesis so this one next one please so what exactly my the topic of my today's discussion, I'll just, uh, because I think I have overtaken the time, I'll just uh, conclude it now at this stage is, many of the next one also you can go, next one also you can go ahead with the next slide also, this high, uh, hypothesis has been done by one of our former director, who was the greatest ichthyologist in the country, is none other than Sundarlal Vora, who was the former director of zoological survey of India, he was working upon the fishes, and he found 
as many as 44 genera. You see, look at this number. There is a nomenclature changes has taken place in recent years. I do not go into the nomenclature changes, but you can see as many as 44 genera during this time, 1949 to 1953. She has analyzed as many as 44 genera has migrated into Western Ghat. How this has come? It has come through the Satpuras and India. And at the next one also, you can go. And during that period, the Satpuras and Vindyas were not at this. Now it is not more than 2,000 feet, 300 to three, uh, 2,000 feet down. At that particular period, it was 600 to 3,000, uh, 3,000, 8,000 8, feet. At one the particular period, the Satpura was even up to 8,000 period also. And that was a very heavy rainfall was there. And there is a continuity up from the northeast India. There was a continuity from what we call it as the Himalayan. And all because of this one, Satpura and Vindhya and the river uh, system has helped in the migration of the species, especially he worked upon the torrential species. And with, so this is the Satpura hypothesis. So this is how the entire scenario has taken place. The Madhya Pradesh has played a major role in the distribution of plants and animals. I'll stop it because I can go on and on for hours together about the Satpura hypothesis. At this one can understand that Satpuras and Vindyas with the river system at one particular time for the continuity and because of the climate was suitable, the climate change was climate was suitable. There was a good number of tropical forests. There is a continuity of the tropical forest, which helped in the migration of species. And this migration of species from the northeast India, from the Himalayan belt, and this was also approved by the SK Banerjee. Also, next one, even Salimali. Also, Salimali also has given example. Now, the present day, uh, our uh, Karanth is also there. The Karanth has also given many examples based upon the Scolopendra also. So he has given, there is a hypothesis, which hypothesis is good to say that one, many species have migrated from India to outside. Many species have migrated from outside to India. And this biotic query is very important. And the Madhya Pradesh, Vindyas and Satpuras and the river system has played a major role. And this is what we call the Satpura hypothesis. So I have also undertaken a complete survey of this entire area, how the present a scenario is recently. I have given a book on the fishes of uh, Madhya Pradesh recently. So this is how I can be able to make more and more presentation at a later stretch. But at this is sufficient for me to say that one, this is what is Satpura hypothesis. So with this one, I sincerely thank the chairman, the co-chairman, the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak on an occasion and that too, to say a few words about my predecessor, Dr. Sundar Rao Bora, who has given us a wonderful hypothesis on how the fishes, the torrential fishes have migrated from Northeast India into the Western Ghat and from Western Ghat to the outside. So thank you so much for giving me an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramakrishna. Now the session is open for discussion. If there is any query, audience may be uh, are requested uh, to give their feedback or is there any question you can uh, ask Professor Krishna. If there is no query, no comment or any suggestion or any uh, kind of uh, question, then I would like to thank Dr. Ramakrishnan uh, for delivering such an interesting, excellent and very informative talk, highlighting different aspects about uh, biodiversity, Biogeographical areas, distribution of animals and plants, cosmopolitan level, endemic species, discontinuous uh, distribution, then ecological uh, barriers, and then he also highlighted about the origin of the species, evolution of the species, extension of the species, then continental drift theory he highlighted, and then glaciation also. So uh, he touched upon several aspects in a very brief period. So thank you, the talk was so informative and we enjoyed the talk and I hope everybody enjoyed. And uh, now 
uh, I, I thank the online committee also, especially Dr. Mishra, who gave me this opportunity to preside over this session. And now I hand over the mic to the uh, Professor Mishra Saab, uh, if he wants to stay and to, uh, to, to deliver two things uh, for the next session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Mr. Pratap Singh. Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mishra. <clears throat> I'm also thankful for an excellent lecture on ecological biogeography. And uh, I enjoyed the uh, lecture of uh, Dr. Ramakrishna. Actually, uh, his work is uh, uh, on mostly on taxonomy and uh, uh, taxonomy and conservation of molluscus. But uh, he gave a wonderful lecture on biogeography, uh, which concentrated our central India. I'm thankful. Uh, uh, from our part and with organizers, from organizers part. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ramakrishna, sir, for giving a nice talk on Satpura, especially Madhya Pradesh, uh, and uh, uh, give uh, many uh, important uh, highlights on this, uh, uh, this area for uh, uh, distribution of plant and animal. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks to chairperson, uh, Professor Dinesh Bhatt, sir, and co-chairperson, Dr. Sivesh Patati. Thank you, all of you, sir. Now, next session. Next session. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, speaker, eminent speaker, Professor Daiji Rani Baitis, Professor of Botany, Department, Punjab University, Chandigarh, chairperson, Dr. Mrs. Avinash Kaur Nangpal, Professor Botany Department, Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar, Punjab, Co-Chairperson, Dr. Nidhi Bharadwaj, Executive Engineer, Horticulture, in charge of Cactus Garden of Panchkula, Haryana. So, welcome all of you, and uh, I am request to Dr. Uh, Avinash Kaur Nangpal, Please chair the session and introduce our eminent speaker, Professor Daiji Rani Baitish. Thank you, Professor Sutan Mishraji. Uh, thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to chair this session, um, being the, delivered by Dr. Daisy Baitish. And um, uh, I'm thankful to the organizers, uh, the um, college, which is Government MS Dwalkar College, Reva. And this is the fifth series of uh, national seminars. And um, I also thank my co-chair, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nidhi Bhadwat. I'm sorry, there's a phone call in, but so I'm trying to stop that. Uh, and um, all the eminent personalities um, uh, present here. And uh, it had been, I think this is the fifth series and I happened to give talk in the third series. And I truly appreciate Dr. Skand Mishra. I'm busy, I'll call you later. So um, he gave me the opportunity to talk on the botanical garden, which we have at our GNDU. And um, uh, then um, I chaired another session in the next series. And this is the third opportunity Dr. Sakand is giving. And um, this is a very pleasant feeling uh, to introduce a very pleasant and a seasoned scientist, Dr. Professor Daisy Bhatish. She's an eminent plant and environmental scientist this and some of our research areas match mine so we are in contact with each other for quite some time. Dr. Daisy as we know that she's professor in uh, Department of Botany Punjab University Chandigarh and um, uh, she has her research areas in allelopathy in natural herbicides antioxidants heavy metal pollution phytoremediation invasive plant ecologies and the research areas, they revolve around these. She has a large number of awards and recognitions to her credit. She is fellow of National Environmental Science Academy, International Society for Environmental Botanists, and uh, Dr. 
which has been awarded with the Dr. V. Puri Memorial Award by Indian Science Congress Association recently in 2020. And um, she has been um, uh, the deputy coordinator of uh, IUFRO, and uh, she has received Rajiv Goyal's Young Scientist Award. Then uh, she has been visiting professor at AIT Bangkok in 2012 and 2018. And she has uh, been um, uh, invited for as a keynote speaker or an invited lecture for a number of international conferences organized by uh, International Union of Forest Research Organi Organizations. And the countries she visited under these uh, conferences are China, Korea, then uh, Malaysia, then in uh, Taiwan. And um, she also received travel grant from British Ecological Society to participate in conferences in Turkey and uh, Aberdeen. And um, uh, she has uh, um, guided a large number of students, uh, 45 PhD students. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a tremendous number and I much appreciate and um, uh, the amount of dedications uh, she put into her research is, uh, is uh, visible from her uh, research articles. And she has also supervised 10 MPhil students and trained seven students um, uh, of Science Academic Summer Research Fellowships. She has been a fellow of National Environmental Science Academy and uh, Dayanand National Academy of Environmental Scientists. She is editor of Journal of Current Sciences. It was in 2005 and 2007. And she is in the um, uh, editorial board of a number of um, international journals. She has reviewed um, a large number of papers coming from different Psi Index uh, journals. So the number of journals is 25. So uh, she has a teaching experience of 27 years and a research experience of 30 years. Actually, I'm just cutting short her CV because I want to give her more time or to speak. <laughs> She is a member of a large number of um, academic societies. Dr. Shivesu, please mute yourself. Thank you. International Society, Allelopathy Society, Internet, Indian Science Congress Association. She is member of National Environmental Science Academy, European Allelopathy Society, and many other uh, organizations. She has conducted and organized a large number of seminars, workshops, and uh, conferences. Um, uh, it, the number goes beyond 15. And um, uh, she has published approximately 180 full research papers and seven books. Her H index, which is a criterion for scientists, and it is 46. It's a very high H index and um, total citations are more than 7,000. It is more than 7,200 in fact. So um, uh, most of our papers, they are among the top 20 or to top 25 or top um, 50 by Science Direct elsewhere or um, by Blackwell Science or by uh, other um, Scopus Index journals. So I'm not going into details of her research highlights, but I'll talk about her academic uh, recognitions. She has been head department of botany in Punjab University, and she's member board of studies of number of universities. And she has been on the selection committee of a uh, number of universities, including our university. And she is member executive of uh, the Anand National Academy of Environmental Sciences. With this very brief for introduction, I must say Dr. Daisy is a seasoned botanist and she has good knowledge on um, plants, but she has been working on other aspects of plants. So I invite Dr. Daisy to please um, give a talk on um, integrated role of botanical gardens in specific study, conservation and public recreation. Thank you very much. Dr. Daisy, please.
No sound, no sound. Yes, yes, you are audible.
species. They belong to families Arukariaceae, Cupressaceae, Cycadaceae, Ephedraceae, as I'm showing Ephedra in this, Pineaceae, etc. So there are 25 species of gymnosperms that have been that that are growing in the garden and uh, kind of uh, conservation, uh, you know, is also done because uh, gymnosperms they are highly vulnerable group. So many uh, good species, uh, rare species of gymnosperms have been maintained in the garden. Then we have a palm palm atom with 12 species of palms, basically Roestonia, Oliracea, Caryota, Phoenix, and some of the species uh, uh, they are not uh, identifiable, but they are growing in the garden very nicely. Then uh, in addition to this, we also have a mist chamber, orchid house, experimental plots, a number of annual taxa uh, are also grown every year, which are mostly ornamental, summer ornamentals and winter ornamentals. As I told you in winters, chrysanthemum is the main attraction. Then we have uh, garden also ex have the exchange facility for seeds with the other propagules. Uh, from the other uh, such gardens of the country. Then garden is visited as uh, I told you that it's visited by a number of students uh, of schools, colleges, and universities with prior information, uh, prior uh, permission from the chairperson. And it is indeed an asset to the department and is uh, a very useful for the students and for the researchers. Then uh, many ornamentals have been maintained, right? Like I told you in the beginning, in the beginning picture, that was Tacoma species, Tacoma argentia. And in addition to that, we also have Tacoma stands of Bignoniaceae family, and it has beautiful yellow colored flowers which have been maintained in the garden. Then in addition to that, we have very, uh, very well growing Cassia fistula, the, uh, which is golden shovel. And in summers, it's pleasure to watch uh, the flowering of Cassia fistula. But in addition to that, it is also medicinal in purpose. Then we also have Plumeria obtusa with white flowers, which are very fragrant. And these uh, really, uh, they are pleasure. They are appreciated by one and all, and they are very fragrant flowers. And these flowers when fall on ground, they form a beautiful carpet on the, on the, on the, uh, in the garden. Then we also have lily plants uh, growing in gardens. We have white lily, we have yellow rain uh, lily, which is uh, a Zephyrinth species in the first picture you can see. And this uh, species is also becoming invasive in different parts of the world. Then, of course, we have uh, Ipomia, um, which uh, are vines, which climb, it's a climber and which uh, can be, which uh, beautify the, uh, the fern house. Then these are various um, chrysanthemum species, uh, which, are the, uh, which are the attraction in the winter season. And in addition to that, we have Rajni Gandha, Alamenda growing in the garden. Then we also have fruit trees. Fruit trees, uh, particularly mango and uh, the Nashpati, they attract uh, children from the nearby areas. But uh, more than that, they attract lots of animals. Monkeys, they create problem in the garden because they come for fruits. Then, of course, we have problem due to many peacocks. Peacocks, they are pleasure to watch, but uh, peacocks also destroy the young plants. Then in uh, the Neil guy and the deer, they all create problem in the garden, but uh, if we manage them properly, then uh, they they are also uh, they they are they are contribute towards the biodiversity enrichment. But of course, we have to manage. Then we have uh, Manikara zapota, which is uh, chiku and jamun. They also grow abundantly in the garden. Then we have many aromatic trees, particularly this uh, uh, bottle brush. Bottle brush has been planted in the garden in um, along the boundaries. It's very fragrant tree. Its leaves yield oil, and its flowers are very very beautiful. In addition to that, we have uh, this rare shrub or tree, which normally we do not see in Chandigarh much. This is lang lang, source of lang lang oil, and its name is Canenja odorata. Its flowers are very fragrant, yellow colored. I couldn't uh, click a picture of that, but you can see the fruits. Fruits are also beautiful to see. And it's also a very uh, useful plant. At its oil is used in perfumeries. 
this is one of the very uh, highly priced perfu uh, perfumes which are made from this uh, shrub. Then we have another aromatic plant, which uh, I think require conservation because I've seen that its seeds do not germinate. And if at all they germinate, they, uh, they are not able to I mean, uh, grow further. So this uh, is Mela Luca Luca Dendra, which is uh, uh, known as uh, paper bark because its uh, bark is papery and it's highly fragile tree because I've seen that during the winds, uh, there is always risk that this tree might fall. So it's source of uh, very important oil, aromatic oil, and uh, that oil finds uh, multiple uses in the perfumeries and also in making green tea. Then eucalyptus is uh, known to everyone, source of oil. Oil is, has industrial value. We are not having many species of eucalyptus, but of course, uh, eucalyptus citriodora and teriticornis, they have been planted in the garden. Then we have some um, very uh, unique kind of species that is uh, Oroxylum indicum, not unique, it is widespread in India, but unfortunately its populations are declining. This is known as ghost tree. Look at its fruits. Fruits when fall on ground, they look like the bones. Bones means uh, uh, they don't give a very, uh, very good feeling as if it's a ghost tree. So it's commonly known as ghost tree. And also I'm trying try to see its flower. It flowers only in the night and is pollinated by the bats. But unfortunately, its populations are declining and therefore we need to maintain such trees in our gardens. Then we also have Raiti arborea of family Epocyanaceae, which is known as Woolly Dying Rose Bay. This tree uh, I liked because uh, of its, uh, its uh, velvety leaves and also its fruits look like snakes. I'm not able to show you the picture as I went to the garden, but its fruits were not very well developed, but they look like snakes. So it's, I found find this tree very fascinating and very, uh, very unique kind of tree. Then we also have maintained Cinnamon Tamala, which is of family Lauraceae and Tezpata. And when students come from different schools, they always uh, like to see this tree because uh, they know Tejpata, which is added in um, in the in the rice uh, preparations, and they like to, they they always uh, appreciate this tree. And then uh, Coffea bengalensis also has been maintained in the garden. And when it flowers, the flowers are very beautiful, white colored flowers. And uh, the, uh, of course, the uh, useful part is the uh, fruit, which is black droop, and uh, that is used for coffee preparation. So this is also maintained in our garden. And then we have Kaijelia pineta or Africana with huge, uh, you know, uh, the fruits, because sometimes we feel that if the fruit fall on our head, this will lead to serious injury. So, but they look very beautiful uh, and they are very, it's a very uh, useful tree also. Sausage tree, it is commonly known as, and uh, it is also used in uh, stomachs, curing stomachs, and it is a source of many steroid chemicals which are found in the, in the tree and they are, they are uh, used for various commercial purposes. Then in the garden, we also have Acer oblongum, which is also, you know, uh, many students from schools and colleges and also from university come and see this tree, uh, Acer tree, which is known as maple, Himalayan maple uh, tree. And uh, people, they come and they appreciate its fruit and also uh, they love to see this tree. Then so many medicinal plants, they have been maintained in the garden, Terminolia chebula, Terminolia bellerica, Terminolia arjuna, but I am here showing only Terminolia chebula of the family Combretesi, and it is, we all know, known as har harad, and uh, it is uh, one of the uh, constituent of trifla, along with the amla uh, and uh, harad, uh, harad and uh, the Terminalia bellerica. The trifla preparation is made in Ay Ayurveda, which is very useful for our bodies, and uh, it is uh, medicinally very important tree. In addition to that, Moringa olifera. Moringa olifera has been uh, a very pleasure to watch, especially its flowering, white or pink colored flower. 
um, unfortunately, the trees uh, populations are declining because when I was very young, I used to see this tree growing abundantly in the in the in the nearby forest areas and also in the localities in the rural areas, particularly. But now their populations are declining and we have to think for the conservation of the tree. So whenever I used to visit garden, I always used to tell the um, you know, uh, gardeners here yeah, to please take care of this tree as we don't see much now um, in uh, especially in our area. So this uh, tree otherwise is very, very useful. It is multi purpose tree. Its uh, fruits are used uh, for edible purpose for making achars. Its flowers and its buds especially are edible. They are very good for health. They are blood purifiers. And uh, during uh, February, when it, uh, you know, buds appear, uh, if you take these buds as food at that time, they are very useful for the health. So this is a very multi-purpose tree and uh, its uh, fruits when dry, they are also used for purifying the water. So it has uh, uh, multi-purpose use and uh, we must uh, promote such which, uh, are, which are really uh, very useful for us. Then uh, we have uh, Dilemia indica, which is known as Hathi Pao or elephant's apple. Uh, actually, this tree is uh, used for uh, edible purposes in Northeast, particularly Assam. But uh, in our part, it is only used as ornamental purpose. And the fruits which are produced in large number, they all go waste. And uh, uh, I used to tell my students to promote this fruit because it's sour in taste and can be used for making pickles and all that uh, for uh, because it is not utilized so uh, its utilization can be started because they go waste uh, lots of fruits are produced then we have uh, stickros nux formica that uh, tree is growing in our garden I, and i think it's uh, nux formica which is a supplement and can be purchased in the form of pill or powder from the it's a medicinal plant a drug is prepared from this, which is uh, very useful. Otherwise, this is a toxic tree. And uh, students of the department and researchers, they use this tree for their own um, uh, use. Then, uh, I mean, for research or a teaching purpose. Then Phylanth assemblica, so I'm not, uh, uh, everybody knows that this is Amla tree, but very, very useful source of vitamin C and also Trifla, as I uh, talked to you earlier. Then uh, we have also Putrenjiva Roxburghai growing in our garden and it's a very useful tree and uh, it's a decoction of leaves and fruits is used for the treatment of cold, fever and rheumatism. And then we also know that the name Putra means uh, the progeny, I mean the children and it's, it's considered to be good for the, for the well-being of the children and uh, it means it's, it has a mythological relevance also. Then we have Melaleuca bracteata, which is a fragrant shrub. And this is a source of essential oil again. And the essential oil has uh, uh, a good antiseptic and uh, insecticidal properties. In addition to that, the, the this shrub uh, grows for ornamental purpose. Then this is Hiptage bengalensis. Hiptage bengalensis belongs to Mal. PGNC family. It is commonly known as Madhvilata and uh, tea is uh, hugely medicinal in nature. Many people come to our department and they ask for its leaves. They say that uh, it cures the cough and particularly during COVID-19 when I used to visit garden uh, at the time I was chairperson, many people used to come for coughing, for cure, curement of coughing. They wanted the leaves of this tree. So this is again a very useful tree and its flowers are very attractive, creamish in color, they are fragrant. Then we have uh, this tree, I recently, uh, in two, three days only, I saw otherwise, uh, earlier it was not in flowering, now it has started flowering and then we identified it, we are yet to validate it from the, uh, the Botanical Survey of India. This is uh, Ocnesi. Now, this belongs to family Ocnesi, and the name probably is Ocna cerulita. It is uh, also known as bird's eye bush or Mickey Mouse plant. Its flowers are very uh, red color, red colored, and they were looking like Mickey Mouse. 
and uh, in some parts of the world, Australia and New Zealand, it is invasive species. But uh, in our part, I think it is not invasive and it has ornamental value. Then uh, this tree is growing in our garden and when we saw its fruits, I think you can see in the picture the fruits, they're just like the hairband. Uh, they're very uh, thin, uh, fragile, and uh, look like hairband. And uh, the name is Holorhina antidysentrica of family Epocynaceae. So it's, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tree is used for the preparation of Ayurveda medicine, particularly for treatment of dysentery caused by amoebic infection. So this is a very useful medicinal plant which has been growing in our garden. Then uh, we have Holoptella integrifolia, which in our part is known as chilbil. It is also medicinally very important plant. Actually, this plant was growing at the corner of the garden and I never noticed it. But when people came for its leaves, they said Ki, uh, we have to make a medicine out of it. But then we noticed this tree as chilbil and uh, Holoptelia integrifolia was its botanical, uh, is its botanical name. The powder of the bark is sprinkled over fresh wounds to control build, uh, bleeding. So this is a very important medicinal plant growing in our garden. Then Lantana, we all know, is very serious invader of the forest areas. Lantana has caused much harm to our biodiversity, but there are certain species of Lantana which are very beautiful garden species. They are non-invasive. For example, we have in our garden purple colored lantana, lantana monte videnses. This is uh, especially uh, used for ornamental purpose. Then this plant attracted my attention a lot as uh, it was uh, rondelitia odorata. This plant of, uh, is of family Rubiaceae and is, uh, uh, its nativity is from Cuba and Panama. So that's why it is also known as Panama Rose because whenever I pass from that area, I always thought this is Lantana's cultivated species. But uh, one day I happened to read its board. So uh, this plant attracted my attention a lot, Rondel Rondelitia odorita, as uh, its flowers are bright in color, eye-catching and they are fragrant. So this has uh, ornamental value. Then we also have Jetropha integrima, which is a toxic plant otherwise. And I think it is uh, grown in many gardens for ornamental purpose only. Then this uh, always attracts the attention of people, Himilia patens, as a, as a you know, um, if we are to, to, to study the flower pollinator interaction, lots of, uh, you know, uh, the insects can be seen on the flowers um, uh, as pollinators. Uh, and we also see some birds, hummingbirds or songbirds, they, they, they come and visit this uh, plant. And that's why I found that uh, this plant is very, uh, it should be promoted as, you know, it attracts lots of pollinators. Then we also have uh, clematis uh, uh, growing in our garden and the species is not very common. Uh, of course, in the gardens, it's very common. It's flamula, uh, clematis flamula of family Redunculaceae. It has a strong sweet smell and the wine flowers throughout the warmer months of the year. So you can see white flowers throughout the warmer months. It's very popular among the garden gardeners. Uh, for growing along the fences. Then we also have attraction of our garden is Ficus krishne, which is growing here. Uh, it's of family Moresi and commonly known as Krishna fig or Krishna's buttercup tree. As its leaves, you can see in the, in the picture, its leaves are uh, pouch shaped. So they, they are just, they, it is said that they, are, they were used by Lord Krishna for uh, butter, for keeping the butter. So there are many mythological stories also attached with this tree. But in addition to mythological significance, the tree is also medicinally important. Used in Ayurveda, the ancient uh, Ayurveda for various diseases, diabetes, liver disorders, diarrhea, inflammatory conditions, hemorrhoids, respiratory urinary problems. 
So this uh, is a very uh, unique tree of our garden. Then uh, I have chosen this tree, Pithecilobium dulce, of family Fabaceae, just uh, because this tree, uh, the population of these trees are also declining. It's known uh, here as jungle jalebi, but uh, its English names are monkey pond tree and manila tamarind. This tree, the, the population of this tree is declining and uh, its fruits are very useful. They are edible, just like, you know, we eat uh, this um, tamarind. So like that, they are, they look in appearance also, but they are very quite rounded kind of tamarind and uh, they are used uh, uh, for with, uh, edible purposes. In addition to that, yellow dye is obtained from the bark of this tree. So we must focus on such trees for conservation purpose, whose populations are declining in our part. Then this is Vishofia javanica, maintained in the garden. Lots of Vishofia is growing in Chandigarh as a roadside tree. Very beautiful ornamental purpose. And especially its fruits, they, when they hang in bunches, they give a very beautiful appearance. And uh, red dye is obtained from the bark of this tree. This is Diaspirus malaperica, which has been maintained in our garden. It has uh, uh, otherwise uh, beautiful fruits, brown colored fruits, which attract the attention of monkeys a lot. And they are velvety and they, they look very beautiful, dark brownish or maroonish in color. This is Zamia species, Zamia furfurecia of it's a gymnosperm. So uh, its common name is cardboard palm, endemic to southeastern uh, state of East Mexico. And it is listed as a ninja tree. And it's commonly, uh, but it's grown commonly in the gardens. Also, it's a house plant. Many people like to keep it in the pots. It's also very beautiful. But however, if we maintain this uh, tree, uh, this uh, uh, shrub, uh, we can um, protect it from extinction. So I think uh, that's all about uh, our garden. So we have uh, lots of diversity in our garden. It's uh, used mainly for the studies and research purpose. And therefore we have not attached any commercial value with the garden. So um, if many students come, they study, they take research material from the garden and uh, also uh, when uh, you know plants are cared in the garden many plants so it automatically it leads to conservation we also exchange seeds with the other such gardens but there is no commercial value attached to the gardens totally for research and academic purpose and of course and uh, also the visitors are also not uh, uh, they are not allowed to visit of their own so they visit only after permission from the chairperson of the department uh, many schools come, they seek prior permission from the chairperson, only then they come. So it has been quite protected a garden. Unfortunately, as I told you, there is an adjoining forest area from where lots of animals come, despite that many mayors have been taken, still meal guy, deer, and uh, these peacocks and uh, the monkeys, they come in abundance and uh, they destroy the uh, not only the fruits and sometimes also the plants. So that is uh, the big problem that garden face, but otherwise it's a, it's, a, it's a repository of plants. It has huge diversity. And if we go and study the garden, we will not see any tree repeated, two or three individuals are there. Uh, every tree is different, maintaining lots of diversity in the garden. So that's all uh, about our uh, Tian, Tian Mera garden. And then uh, as I was also asked by the organizers to speak something on Chandigarh Botanical Garden, which has recently come, not uh, recently, but uh, it's not very old, 2007, it was uh, created. And since uh, then, the garden has added up many, 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 you know, sections. It is still in the, you can say, uh, progression. It is still, um, uh, in the in the stage of um, um, <clears throat> uh, in this in the uh, you know um, 
in it is still progressing means this is not that the garden is now complete many more sections are being added you know every year uh, or so so this is chandigarh botanical garden this is very near to our university and it is in one of the village sarangpur in the garden where a huge area was taken and a garden was created but this garden uh, serves the purpose of the walkers the the strollers you go in the morning you go in the evening it is heaven for them so uh, i'll now speak something about the garden this is uh, the location of the garden as we have taken from google earth and then this is a brief introduction the chandigarh botanical garden was inaugurated by his excellency general rodriguez at the time he was governor of punjab and then administrator of ut chandigarh uh, on 2nd january 2007 so it is one of the largest botanical garden in the country which is still progressing it is still in the <clears throat> creation stage and it is sprawling over an area of uh, about 176 acres there are 15 different sections in the garden and approximately 200 species uh, to promote research education ex situ conservation of flora Uh, means its main objectives when it was created they were to promote research education ex situ conservation of flora and to spread awareness about the flora of the area to promote ecosystem services for local people and societies now what are the facilities available here there is a energy park there is a information kiosk there is battery operated vehicles so if you are going there for uh, research purpose or for education purpose you can uh, request the authorities for these battery operated vehicles then ample parking space is there lawns are there resting benches are there in the garden shelters meditation huts that is also one of the uh, one of the asset to the garden cycle tracks have been maintained pedestrian path has been maintained public amenities are there basically the public visit this garden to uh, take to walk in the morning and in the evening so lots of pleasure cushions co they are attached to the garden and uh, however uh, garden is uh, you know, it is a very good uh, site for conducting research and also for education which the administration is now promoting now there is a temporary block on one side of the garden and also there is a top hut from where you can see many areas of the garden then we also have medicinal and bonsai section which is spread over 40 acres more than 100 species of medicinal and herbaceous plants they are growing over there and approximately 60 bonsai have been maintained uh, this is uh, as you can have a birds eye view of bonsais in the in this section these uh, these are this is the bonsai uh, part of the garden and lots of medicinal plants they have been maintained in the garden uh medicinal plants they are also given free of cost to the people you go there and give your request that you want particular medicinal plant which is growing over there they give it free of cost and uh, during the summer months they also uh, you know distribute these plants to local schools uh, to uh, different colleges or to even uh, common men who uh, who want to grow there in their homes so they give uh, this is a very good facility they have created that they give free of cost these uh, plants to the people then there is a very um, uh, you know a big cactus dome in which many cacti are growing and uh, uh, we happen to visit uh, this uh, uh, few days back and then uh, this was the video that we made uh, on this uh, cactus dome and madam nidhi can i think uh, um, very well tell us uh, different cacti uh, she must have visited so many cacti have been maintained it's beautiful area and uh, most of the cacti when we went they were in flowering so uh, as per their information 
it is one of the biggest cactus dome in the region and about 100 cacti species are growing there and it covers an area of 10 acres and has 10 rocky trees and polycarp cactus dome that is the uh, main attraction of this then you can see certain uh, species of uh, uh, the cactus in uh, cactus dome for example this particular uh, we liked a lot elodia procera this is uh, uh, we thought that it's uh, some plastic uh, uh, creation but it was a cactus then ferro cactus elephant tea dense that is also growing in the garden and many more cacti they have been maintained in the garden so it, it is still as i told you it is still in the in the in the state of uh, you can say um succession it is still growing so um, uh, the the section they are being upgraded every year so then we have uh, 36 fawn species in a fawn house and uh, these fawn species they have been taken from different parts of india including himalayas then most important thing which i noticed in the garden was uh, a centellum album chandan gaban that has been maintained in the garden which is now mixed up with Vachelia nilotica, that is uh, the acacia species, I guess. So they have uh, also been incorporated in this garden. Otherwise, maximum, most of the trees, they are of centellum album. That is, so they, this part they have created in the garden. And then uh, there is a huge area which is dedicated for aquatic plants. And uh, the most, uh, um, beautiful part of this was Victoria uh, lily being uh, maintained in the garden. In addition to that, we have Ipomia species, 15 aquatic species. They have been maintained in the uh, in this area, which covers about 0.3 acres. Then we have, as I told you, huge uh, medicinal plant nursery, which they have made lot many medicinal plants they are growing over there right from haldi to uh, some tree species which they distribute also to the local people so they are that means uh, raising the medicinal plants in their nurseries and then doing the novel service of uh, distributing these to the people to the schools who have environment clubs so they come and they uh, take uh, plants from this garden then they also have maintained a vertical garden, vertical gardening, about 10 species. Uh, uh, they have been maintained in the vertical gardens. And uh, the, if, if, when you go in the entry itself, uh, there is a huge vertical garden maintained. Then there is a pine atom covering an area of 25 acres, maintaining 15 pine species collected across the country. Then one section they have dedicated for nutritional plants. Uh, this uh, um, include many tree species which are fit for human consumption. Anar hai or bossare jo fruit uh, plants hai, which are nutritionally important. So they given new name, nutritional plants, which I think it's a center of attraction for the visitors. Then they also have a bamboo system about 22 species collected from different parts they have been planted in the garden and they have different types of woody uh, woody species uh, they, uh, in addition to the bamboo species so this is a bamboo system systematic plantation uh, of banana has also been done in the garden and bamboo system is dedicated to the bamboos then uh, uh, when I talk to them, they have started a new concept, not new concept, but uh, uh, this is unique for the gardens. That is, they are growing trees in close association with one another. They say that these trees or different species, they have been put to competition. And out of competition, their growth is good. So even I saw this patch where they have maintained randomly uh, growing species 
uh, which are mostly local and uh, the the forest or the so called area has uh, come up very fast within a year or two years so they say that this is a unique kind of jungle they are creating where species are growing of their own and uh, they all are local species then we also have uh, saplings of trees uh, shrub saplings they also distribute these to the people then they also have larger stromias uh, and other ornamental plants annual plants are also grown in the garden and uh, in addition to that as i told you that uh, the garden is created along the rivulet patiala ki rao so they have also maintained a lake it's artificial lake but uh, this is uh, for the visitors uh, to enjoy uh, boating has not yet started but maybe they plan to do so so this uh, this also uh, they say that they want to promote uh, succession also along the lakes so uh, th this is uh, uh, the lake in the garden and many more sections they are coming up and uh, they are still uh, in pro uh, in progress this garden is still in progress because it has huge area so there's a lot of scope for research also a lot of scope for uh, the studies and conservation purpose uh, i think uh, that's all for this garden and uh, thank you very much for patiently listening to me and uh, Many thanks, Dr. Daisy. It was such a luminous uh, talk, and um, we appreciate the um, amount of effort you have taken for um, um, taking pictures of all those plants of your garden as well as the um, Chandigarh Administration Garden. So the session is open for discussion. Anybody having any queries or want some um, uh, comment on or um, some feedback for this lecture, most welcome. So, uh, one message, very interesting uh, lecture, Dr. Daisy. Thank you. you, madam. Thank you very much. I'm not expert in this field, no, but no. I've tried to <laughs> include as much information as yeah, possible. I, I do remember yeah. my visit to your department and then to the botanical garden, and you took me around, and um, I think Dr. Siddhu was also coming yes. to and uh, it was very nice. And um, Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, if uh, there's no query, then um, I would like to thank you very much. It was such an uh, interesting talk and we enjoyed every bit of it, all the pictures and um, uh, the diversity of uh, plants you have in your botanical garden. Can, you know, can I know how many species of, totally how many species of plants are there in your garden? Uh, Madam, there are 150 species of trees okay. and in addition to that, we have uh, 25 ferns and uh, 25 uh, gymnosperms and uh, I mean, they are less in number, but trees are about 150 species of trees. Okay. So I think rich diversity for a university diversity. botanical garden. Yes, uh, we, we did a survey and uh, there we found uh, about 159 species, but uh, seven or eight, they were not identifiable to us. Okay. We couldn't identify those. So I think 150 is the right uh, it's okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very and much. Uh, before I say thanks to everybody, um, before I invite Dr. Nidhi for her final remarks, and I want to say everybody, please visit um, uh, website eDOPS, Electronic Database of Plants, which we have uh, created uh, in GNDU. And uh, on from the GNDU website, you can uh, see this database and uh, you can see all the plants which we have in the botanical garden as well as um, we are enriching the database for other plants as well. And another thing I want to say that we have created uh, mm -hmm. um, name plates for the different trees and shrubs in the for the university campus. And each name plate has been provided with the QR code. And if you go to QR code, it gives you the complete detailed information of the plant, whichever is available in the eDOPS. So this is a, a new thing which we have uh, done, but I would love that if you want, if you see this website and uh, give your feedback on this. Thank you very much. Dr. Nidhi, are you there?
वो शायद मैडम वो नहीं है वो शायद कहीं टूर पर है उनने कहा था मैं मोबाइल से जुड़ पाऊंगी पर लगता है बाहर so it's okay then thank you very much i thank uh, dr sakand and everybody around here for the patient hearing and for such a nice talk thank you thank you thank you madam i am also thankful to the organizers for inviting me even though i was not the right person but uh, i have tried to give an maximum information as much as possible i am also thankful to madam uh, avinash who has always been supportive and always say nice words for me thank you very much madam for having faith in me and uh, for supporting me thank you very much thank you dr sakan to you sir yes madam uh, <clears throat> धन्यवाद मैडम प्रोफेसर डेजी मैडम उन्हें हमारे रिक्वेस्ट पर बताया जैसा कि उनका ये विषय थोड़ा अलग है सोशलाइजेशन का लेकिन हमारे रिक्वेस्ट पर उन्हें दोनों ही गार्डन चंडीगढ़ गार्डन एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव गार्डन और अपने यूनिवर्सिटी के गार्डन को यहाँ पर बहुत अच्छे और विस्तार पूर्वक से जानकारी दी हमारे ऑडियंस को और उन्हें स्पेशली uh, जो है इन इन पर पूरा uh, जो स्लाइड तैयार की और उसके लिए समय दिया उसके लिए हम बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद है साथ ही इस सेशन को शेयर करने के लिए ही न केवल बल्कि रिसोर्स पर्सन उपलब्ध कराने के लिए मैडम प्रोफेसर अविनाश कौर मैडम ने हमारी काफी मदद की है और तीन चार रिसोर्स पर्सन उन्हें दिए और पर्सनली उन्हें उन लोगों से बात भी की तो कोऑपरेशन के लिए बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद है मैडम आप दोनों का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक 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 यू 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 सर वेरी वेरी मच नेक्स्ट टॉक टॉक है इमिनेंट स्पीकर मिस्टर शिव शंकर बाबू मैनेजिंग पार्टनर टेक्नो बैंकर एंड तमिल हेरिटेज ट्रस्ट चेन्नई चेयर पर्सन प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर जी तिरमूर्ति एंशियंट हिस्ट्री एंड आर्किटेक्चर डिपार्टमेंट मद्रास यूनिवर्सिटी चेन्नई एंड को चेयर पर्सन मिस्टर इंद्रजीत भट्टाचार्य फाउंडर एंड ओनर इकॉज ऑफ इंडिया जयपुर राजस्थान वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू सर एंड आई एम रिक्वेस्ट टू प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर जी तिरमूर्ति सर Please chair the session, and Mr. Enrique Bhattacharya. Please co-chair the session, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. G. Tirumurthy requested uh, to uh, Dr. Tirumurthy sir. Please introduce a brief intro uh, of uh, Mr. Sir Sankar Babu. A brief uh, intro, sir. Professor Tirumurthy sir. Hello. Yes, I am calling him. Professor Tir Murthy, sir. हेलो हेलो मिस्टर इंद्रजीत भट्टाचार्य यू हैव बायोडाटा ऑफ शिव शंकर बाबू हेलो Uh, please unmute yourself yes sir i have the bio data now uh, please give a brief bio data because uh, uh, his uh, more talk time provide okay sure sure sir ha uh, only two or three min uh, uh, two uh, only two or three minutes welcome uh, mr shiv sankar babu uh, namaste ji hey, welcome all of you namaste Uh, Shiv Shankar Babu is a techno functional banker with 39 plus years in financial services industry, with a passion for mentoring, travel, and spreading heritage awareness. 
After 15 years in overseas bank, he worked in ITES in companies like Hexaware, Wipro, Cape Gemini for 20 years, for past four years doing domain consulting through his own company, Techno Bankers, handles mentoring sessions for final years, B students for campus placement in leading institutions like SRM University, National Engineering College, Kolapatti, St. Xavier Catholic College, Supporting final year placement guidance for IIT Madras sessions on industry expectations, CV preparation, and mock interviews. He is renewing his passion for Indian history, its ancient commerce, temple architecture, epigraphy, iconography by attending seminars, references, books. He has traveled extensively through Tamil Nadu, the land of temples, and these are documented in detail in his Facebook tour albums. Is part of Tamil Heritage Trust, THT, which focuses on spreading heritage awareness. He is one of the THT trained do docent guide and handlers, Alamar Avi, Avai, heritage training for teachers. He is involved in THT site seminars, trips for heritage location for six, seven days, with 20 fly plus preparatory lectures for, by participants in prior six months and compilation of them as a tour guide book for an on site appreciation. Covered Bhuneshwar, Badami, Sanchi, Kanchi, Tanjavo, Sanchi, so far. He also does presentations on heritage subjects at groups like Sapatya Kalaparishad, Tripati, IIT, TM, Nellore, CCV, Vijayawada, University, Kerala, etc. And videos are available in his YouTube, Babu for Heritage. His YouTube channel, Babu for Heritage, is a go to place for heritage videos where curated content is available under 50 plus categories. He's an incredible India tourism facilitator from GUI Ministry of Tourism. He has completed certification in old scripts like Tamil Brahmi, Vatelet 2, Grantham to read inscriptions and PG Diploma in Archaeology from International Institute of Tamil Studies, Chennai and TNOU, Chennai. We welcome you, Mr. Sivsankar Babu. Please start your session. Thank you, uh, Indrajit Bhattacharya, sir. Um, that was a pretty long introduction. I have also shared a brief one in the interest of time. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Skankumar Mishra and the team, which has been trying to exceed the performance of this presentations and the, the webinar series year after year. Even three years ago, when uh, it was there, we were surprised about three days even. Now it has gone to four, five, eight. Mm -hmm. And then the number of talks are phenomenal. And then I really salute him for the energy and the effort he is making to uh, have an entire uh, week plus of uh, presentations. So I also thank him for giving me one more opportunity to spread heritage awareness. All of you, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Your screen is visible. OK, thank you, sir. So today, as part of the heritage series, we are going to talk for 45 minutes from now. Uh, on Dwara Palace, the evolution and symbolism and uh, the details. So before going into the talk, I I give my pronouns to Google and our and Wikipedia Pujari, who give all the material on call. But uh, that is only the start where the link is there and then we explore. I also want to thank for Phenomenal image collection by Dr. Ravichandran, who has got a big collection of uh, Facebook uh, classified by various uh, subjects. Dwarapala collection was uh, very helpful to it, uh, me for doing this. In terms of uh, the input material, I had I am not a researcher and other things. Primarily, I read, I understand, and uh, I present my understands in a in a simplistic way. So in this manner. Uh, the blog of Dr. Shankaranaranen and uh, Srinivas Rao and uh, India Temple blog spot, they have helped me in giving a fairly good understanding into this interesting subject. And uh, iconography of Dwarapala by Mainani Krishna Kumar 
but it was also a very good book yeah, where it has given a fairly good in, insight and I have been able to read through the book in detail to understand the final points on this. And I also want to thank uh, Tamil Heritage Trust who has given me this experience and then exploration uh, opportunities to do this presentation. And uh, Dr. Lakshmi Ramasamy who helped me in uh, understanding and then coming out with the nuances where we compare this with the Bharatanatya and its chances. So with this pranams, I go into the presentation. So today we are going to talk briefly about the guardians of gateway, how they are involved over. And uh, we need to talk about static and dynamic Dwarapalas and how they evolved in style and form in Tamil Nadu. Primarily, I have used a lot of Tamil Nadu related experience because that is where I am. So pardon me for that. In future, I will try to add more and more pan-Indian uh, examples. And interestingly, how uh, Dwarapalas are defined in Agamic and, uh, and how the symbolism means. And then uh, how the Dwarapalas defined in um, uh, the medieval period in Tamil Nadu and in South. And finally, to conclude on where Dwarapala is an expressional art form where it conveys a lot of meaning and then it has got uh, the symbolism uh, which is uh, very relevant to this. So to sum up, what do you mean by Dwarapala? So it is in most of the South Asian languages. Surprisingly, Dwarapala is a consistent word. This means that it has been spread from an origin and it is being used consistently across multiple languages. Uh, there it has got a one single meaning, door guards. And then there might be light variation in the phonetics, but ultimately this meaning is same. <coughs> the Dwarapala statues are part of almost all Asian cultures or religions, uh, place of worship, and then they form a prominent place in temple in multiple locations and all the way from the entrance uh, into the sanctum. And th this concept has come uh, from the, the, the door guards of the clan chiefs to the kings to protect them from all things by having guards at the doorway surrounding. So this is naturally extended to gods they worship. And again, if you go further and dig it into the roots, this emanates from the early ages where the men lived in a cluster inside the caves. And then during nighttime, posted guards in the night to protect against wild animals and other things. So this is that primordial and then the age old, uh, the, the security issue, which has been consistently and it has been expanded and then gone into a whole class by itself. Interestingly, in all religions, if you look at the Dwarapala, you can identify the, the uh, guard inside. So they extend in many forms the weapons, the attire, characteristics, pose, and the body language of the primary deity. So that is an interesting comparison, and it helps in many situations to identify uh, where we have blank uh, sanctums, and by Dwarapalas, we can identify what is the deity inside that particular sanctum. So this is a brief about Dwarapalas. Now, let us see how Dwarapalas have been there from men's ages. When you talk about Dwarapalas, immediately anything and everything big, we have Egypt in mind. Let us see what is uh, the concept of Dwarapalas in uh, Egypt. During, in the Abu Simal, Ramesses II and Nefertiti, Nefertari has got a huge monument which has restructured. And again, we find grand uh, uh, door uh, security kind of uh, figures there inside. And also, you when you go to the sanctum, you have around eight Dwarapara like figures uh, standing it. But again, Ramesses loves self. And then these are all door guards, that is Ramesses himself in various forms. 
So his self-help is the best help. So he is his own God. So this is one aspect of he guarding himself. Then let us see how temple guards are visualized for the centuries. In Roman, many guard palms and other guards were there in different palms. So this is one example of a palm of guard in, in a niche in Cologne. And uh, if you look at uh, the Thai and other things in the Grand Palace, so Yakshas and Yaksis are represented in a very beautiful ornamental way just outside that. Everywhere we will have different forms of uh, threatening and uh, imposing guards. Even in Japan, the concept is there. But again, if you see this, the dress and the body posture and the other things is different and aligned to that culture. So if you compare the three different areas, even though they have a common um, uh, work, the design structure, the dresses, the pose, everything is different. Now let us explore uh, the Southeast Asia where we, in different countries, different forms of Dwarapalakas are exposed. Now in Bali, Goa Gaja Temple, so the Dwarapalas are uh, highlighted by this kind of fun figure uh, in a cave. This cave contains Ganapati in, in, a, in a simple form. So even in smaller caves, we see extensive Dwarapalas. And, and we have uh, Bali, Indonesia, we have got Dwarapalas having lungis. So the lungi dance is not a uh, new phenomena, the lungi dance is a age-old phenomena. And then see the pose, see the look, the way, the style and other things. It is as though they are performing a dance rather than doing a security job. But again, they are imposing. Then we go to Java, 12th century, in Klosan Temple, where we have huge flower palace and then with the with uh, threatening eyes and uh, things with the huge gather, and you can compare the size and uh, depending on how big it is and then how big the nails are. So again, when you go at Southeast Asian temples, the Dwara Paras match the size of the temple. We have grand temples and we have grander and matching size of Dwara Paras. So, Again, the purpose is to present a magnificent and imposing uh, structure. Now let us move over to Malaysia in Buddhist and in Chinese God. So there is a uh, Buddhist temple and in that various forms of Dwaraparakas are mentioned with the different structures. So again, uh, and if you can see a huge collection of uh, Dwarapalas here. So with this, we see that Dwarapalas have been there in almost all Southeast Asian countries. And that too, in a way in which it is consistent across the religions. And then they reflect the local culture and the local gods things. So far, we have been uh, seeing some interesting static uh, Dwara Palakas. Now we are seeing some dynamic Dwara Palakas of current times. So this is the famous Dwara Palaka in 10 Downing Street. And the famous guy who is trying to taking advantage of this is static nature. The same thing, another famous uh, Dwara Palaka. And uh, this is the um, Vatican guards and the who who got uh, uh, the holy church and other things. And down so in Chennai, there is an interesting Dwara Palaka. This is in BJP uh, Golden Beach in a resort. This is something similar to your 10 Downing Street. The challenge here is he will be static and he will not smile and he will not move. The objective is whoever makes him move 
gets a prize. So every day there is a torture for him and then he handles all this for his master. So this is the current day and then real time masters from Britain to uh, Vatican to Chennai. So Dwarapalakas come in various flavors. Now, having seen the Dwarapalakas, now let us see what, what Agamas talk about Dwarapalakas. So this is the current uh, day Dwarapalaka, a detailed depiction with the beautiful ornamentation and uh, and the weapons and the consort. So my mother says that it is it has got four arms, has two or three, a trinetra, and uh, terrifying fangs, and then fearful stare, and then trident as part of the headgear or somewhere, and the inner hand in suchi mudra, saying warning, and then outer hand in visme mudra, saying that uh, in in um, excitement or in how. And one leg slightly bent, leaning on the weapon. Here it is more than bent. It is a very, very aggressive stance. And then having coiled snakes and other things under the So this usually comes in a later chola and other things where you have a lot of snakes and uh, animals under the control. So this is what the chapter 36 verse talks about Dwarapalakas in Mayamata. If you look at this pose and in Bharatanatyam, this is something similar to some of the Bharatanatyam pose where if you compare a, a Dwarapalaka, a female Dwarapalaka and uh, the pose, so the common postures from Bharatanatyam is fixed upper torso and then bent legs and there is a beautiful hand and eyes gesture. Okay, this is a duo and it has got a solid stance and it has got a gesture, and then it has got uh, complementing each other, um, and then the the signals what she is giving is one of protection, and one of threatening, and one of support. So all this combination, which are used typically in Bharatanatyam, are also conveyed by Dwara Palakas in various stances. Now, having understood the definition of what is a Dwarapalaka, now let us see where all we can find this Dwarapalaka. Normally, the, the Sanctum Sanctorium will have the older period Dwarapalaka because this is uh, fairly inside and they would have been constructed at the earlier period. This is this one shows beautiful one from Mamundu. And, uh, when you come up at the Mandaba, we will have some slightly bigger one, probably of a later period and somewhere around 11th, 10th centuries. And uh, when you come outside, uh, after the Adha Mandaba, you will have Savka Santrala, where you have side steps and other things. And we also find some huge um, Dwarapalakas. And uh, when you have bigger temples, where on all the four side entrances, whether there is an entrance or window, we can also find Dwarapalaka sets. Similarly, whenever we go into Gopuram, in the Gopuram entrance on both sides, we can see Dwarapalakas. And for each tier inside the, the, the Nilay or Dwaras, you can see a set of Dwarapalakas consistently going. So, everywhere, this Dwarapalakas will be reflecting the characteristics, attire, and the pose of the deity inside the temple. So by looking at the Dwaraparakas in a Gopuram, you can say who is the deity inside. Now having seen where to find the Dwaraparakas, now we are going into the early Dwaraparakas, how it is progressed. Here I am giving examples from Tamil Nadu. Uh, where uh, I am more familiar with, and then slowly we can do a uh, little more uh, detailed presentation. Some of the early Dwarapalakas were village guardian deities or people who have been doing a job, and after their death, they have been deified 
and then worshipped as village gods. And then later on, Yaksha cult also improved and where they started worshipping uh, gods for uh, the various uh, uh, primary deities. And this is what we see in Sanchez to be as uh, a king or a Dwarapalaka. And uh, we also come up with a lot of Naga Dwarapalakas from the second century onwards. And then later on, it expands into uh, zoomorph zoomorphic forms, and then where they they attire giant proportion various uh, uh, animal heads, and then slowly it distills into human-like figures around fifth to sixth centuries. So this is one of the zoomorphic Ajamukha uh, Dwarapalakas in the Siddhana Kola in Ayodhya. This is in sixth century. Still, if you look at the the stage. It is very, very basic ornamentation. So only one stick, but uh, with the zoomorphic figures. And this is a Saptamatrika temple. Then coming to Tamil Nadu, one of the earliest Dwarapalakas is during Mahendra Pallava time, where uh, he instituted uh, a Mandapattu cave for three deities Shiva, Vishnu and <laughs> Brahma. So here we have the Vaishnavite Dwarapalaka as a Garuda and a Shaivite Dwarapalaka and with a Yakata and a snake and like a Solum Katafa background and this are the inner things. <coughs> the Dwarapalakas are very rudimentary but they convey the facial expression and the message very, very clearly saying that the God is inside, go, pray him, and then you will get the bliss. Then, next slight variation in Vallam caves, again Mahendra period. Here the interesting point is, uh, this Dwarapalakas represent the weapons of Shiva, like uh, Sula and uh, uh, the axe. So that is there in part of headgear. And even here, you see that rudimentary basic dress and then uh, rough gathas and other things. So this is Shaiva. And then there is a Vishnu cave for which, see the difference, the, the kind of detail Makuda is there. And then more ornamental dresses for uh, Vaishnava things. So they don't have any weapons here. And then they are saying that Vishnu is inside. Then, Slowly, the refinement increases, the amount of ornamentation increases, and we are seeing the Lavanur cave. So if you see this, the dresses are more refined and then more ornamentation. Here they are uh, um, seeing less threats, so they don't have great arms and other things. And then they're in a very casual way. And uh, not a threatening and, uh, and a beautiful stances also. So that is the class or uh, hallmark of Pallavas. Then the ultimate is C.A. Mangalam in Mahendra period, where uh, the first dancing Nataraja appears in uh, Pillar. Here, this are very clear, ornamented, and then you can see the Trishula and uh, the Parasu as part of the indicator and with the Gathas. So far, we have been consistently seeing only two handed Dwarapalakas where uh, uh, they, they are being represented. Again, it is Pallava period in Tirumayam where you can see the Tirsula in the background and acts to a certain extent in here. And then uh, they are also attendant deities. But the beauty is the body ratio and everything is fantastic and then in line with the, the Pallava class. Now, after seeing all these things, we are coming to uh, Mahabalipuram, Trimurti cave, where the Dwarapalakas can compete in style and pose with any of the current day superstars, okay, whoever it is in any, any, any uh, cine field. They define the way they stand, the way they uh, give pose, and then the way they 
look at you and then give the the body language ultimate the rajini style or uh, your uh, superstar style everything is nothing compared to this here also we see a uh, uh, three caves dedicated for uh, brahma shastra or skanda and then shiva and vishnu and see the difference for brahma shastra the kind of dwara uh, parakas here is sages and with the long dress whereas uh, here this is a um, uh, typical uh, um, uh, shiva kind of and dwara parakas and when you come to vishnu the dwara parakas have fairly ornamented uh, setup and with the nice long drapes so there is clear differentiation in line with the deities and how they are represented in dwara parakas now in some of the cases where you can identify the inner uh, deity by the the dwara parakas outside obviously uh, this is one of the ratas in mahabalipuram darupati ratha but we say that it is for for durga primarily because they are female dwara parakas and similarly there is one more cave there where it is blank sanctum inside but the dwara parakas are outside so we think and we guess that this is a durga temple so in that way it helps identify now for a small exercise in mahabalipuram there is a mandava where you have five cells five cells occupied for five different gods but the sanctums are empty but how do we identify the sanctums and this is the view once you step in inside there are dwara parakas now we can make a guess and then we can make uh, uh, what is a potential thing so possibly this might be for the three gods and maybe harikara or uh, indra or uh, or uh, muruga okay and normally at the time durga was also on the left hand side so to just to check that if you check at this cell you get the confirmation you clearly say that this are all female dwara parakas and then this cell is for durga so by this we can also guess and we can fill in the blanks on what the cave is about in many situations they will call the dwara parakas door jams and everything and then only they will come into the sanctum now having seen the dwara parakas we also saw that the dwara parakas can be in different places and in different locations uh, mahamata talks about the location of dwara palakas in chapter 36 310 to 315 when you have a shivalinga which is facing east okay you have on the on the east we have kala and nandi and we have south mundi and nandi and then in uh, in west vijaya and bringati and uh, in north we have anantaka and gopa so for each of them it also talks about the color and then what aspects of shiva like uh, the maze or kala or sword or combat or trishul it they represent so this is going into an extensive definition of dwara parakas in various agamas this is my mata like that all these agamas have different definitions of the gods or dwara palas of shiva and then in various directions so there is a again this is something which we need to deep dive and the comparison and do it now having seen the agamas let us see some of the agamic dwara palakas post 18th century where this kind of an agamas got established when you take about north amalai this definition and the the ornamental setup tally switch aditya akama as per dr shankara narayanan and similarly this beautiful dwara palaka set in 
Takalo with so much of hands and then uh, uh, two hands and then two uh, gathas, all these things entirely with Asitalya Agama, where, uh, um, where you see four hands appearing instead of two. So like that, each Agama has got different version as things progress, the refinement started happening and then we started seeing different Dwarapalakas. So there is a story, Purana story about Nandi and Mahakala who are the eastern Dwarapalas of Shiva. This is uh, mentioned in Skanda Purana. So where Nandi was a merchant and Mahakala was a hunter and then whatever Nandi was doing uh, puja, Mahakala used to remove and then put uh, uh, meat and then his uh, uh, water taken from the mouth, he used to do puja. So there is a conflict and finally God appeared, pacify everybody and took both of them to Kailasa to head Ganas and be Dwarapalas and uh, along with the afternoon puja darshan. So this is a story which is associated with Saiva Dwarapalas. Similarly, we have uh, stories for Vaishnavic Dwarapalas also. If you see after this, even during 8th century, still we have eight hands, uh, two hands uh, presence, and then very, very lean and stylish. But now the lion and uh, other, other details start appearing. Now, around 11th century, Panjavan Mahadevi Pandipade in Padayare, the old capital. Now we are seeing far more wider thing with the details. Now we have, he is going into threatening force and then they are more dynamic and aggressive and then they have a lot of weapons and then finer details on this like your, your Preta Kuntala and, and uh, Makara Kuntala as well as Patra Kuntala. All these details, finer details are uh, emerging with uh, far more uh, refinement. In Pandya, we have this imposing Dwarapalas who stand on a gata with the lion and very, very grand uh, eyes and uh, fangs and also uh, the weapons. So this is how they are becoming grander and grander. And by 17th, 18th centuries, instead of just having bar reliefs, this started becoming 3D proper chitras with the three-dimensional structure and beautiful uh, dances and then they started getting colored and painted also. So if you see this, this Dwarapalakas almost mimic Nataraja's uh, grand dance and rather than going into an offensive, almost mimic the grand dance. So the, the Dwarapalaka is an extension of the main deity is again and again repeated in multiple forms. Now, going later period around the 16th century during Marathas, the Dwarapalakas are becoming bigger and bigger, grand, and then they also get additions of the kings also being standing alongside with them. This is again another trend. This is in uh, Tirupalandal. Now, when you talk about Dwarapalaka, there is always a confusion in many situations between Nandi. Nandi is admin, Nandi is a Vahana, Nandi is a Dwarapalaka also. So, the first version is Adhikara Nandi, who is supposed to be son of uh, um, Shiva in a way, and there is a grand marriage ceremony happening in Tiruvayyari near Tanjavur for the Adhikara Nandi. So, he is an administrative assistant. And uh, next is the Nandi as a Vahana, Rishaba. The third one is the Nandi as a Dwarapalaka on the east right side in, in his Shiva temple. So when you talk about Nandi, so this means three things. We need to take it in the right spirit or in the right context. So again, thanks to Dr. Sankarana Ranan for putting this as a clear detail in one of his blogs. Having seen the Saiva Dwarapalakas, now let us visit 
Vishnu Dwarapalaka, and this is one of the, the grand thing. And there is a story about Jaya Vijaya. And then uh, during uh, the earlier thing, uh, they refused entry to Sanaka, the sages, and then they were cursed as mortals. But Vishnu gave a bypass for them and uh, gave an option whether they want to live one famous life or three short lives as Rakshasas. So both of them took a shortcut and said that they want to die shortly. So they were born as a Hiranyaka Shibu Hirane, uh, and Hiranyaksha, Ravana and Kumbhakarna, Sisipala and Dantavadara. And they were uh, released uh, and given to Moksha by Vishnu during their various avatars. So this is the background and the story on the Jaya Vijaya, the prime Eastern uh, bodyguards of Vishnu. Now, there are some beautiful Vishnu related uh, Ranganatha. This is Ranganatha uh, temple in Erkambati. It's one of the uh, rare ellipsoidal kind of an, uh, temple here. Uh, you can find a similar temple in Hampi outer uh, near Hosapete by Krishna Devaraya. So in this temple, you have a beautiful stylish Dwarapalaka. See this. And, and uh, unfortunately, the legs are broken, but the way the body language, the face expression and everything uh, raised to the core and then the pinnacle by nine century itself. Similarly, as uh, days progressed, by the time we went to uh, Kumbhakonam and uh, 16th century Nayaka period, uh, the stone Dwarapalakas attained a lot of ornamentation, headgear and other things. And even the swords got a lot of ornamentation. But also the trend of building Dwarapalakas in Sudai with the color and other things happen. And then they look more real life like and beautiful. And then the, the Dwarapalakas in even the, the Kopurams become very ornate and then it is it is a it is a overdose of uh, beautiful uh, structures in Sarangapani Temple Kumbhakonam. There are so many beautiful structures and then so many Dwarapalakas in each with a different pose. And this is the finer aspect, both with the Sanganidhi, Padmanidhi, and uh, and uh, attendant uh, for both the Dwarapalakas. So if you see this, not only for Shiva and Vishnu, even for Brahma, Ganesha, Skanda, for everybody, there are uh, uh, defined Dwarapalakas for all the four directions. So far we have seen Shiva, Vishnu, and then similarly there is for Brahma, but we have not seen many uh, Brahma temples in South India, so we are not able to identify this. Ganesha also, there is a lot of Dwarapalakas like Skanda and for Sakti. There are things. Uh, I need to explore more and fill up these tables at a later point of time. So here we are seeing one of the Sakti Dwarapalakas and it reflects the pious and they look like your mothers. They are not so threatening, but at the same time they have control and then they they control you to behave and then they also support you so beautiful case of the god getting extended into the dwara palakas now for ganapati it is a rare case of standing ganapati dwara palakas in singapore even though it is a very 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 late period temple but uh, mostly they have confirmed to the agamas and whatever definitions are there, they have faithfully followed. And for Skanda, this is the two Dwara Palakas, Sudeha and Sumuka. This is in Tirupuru near Chennai. Now coming to uh, the biggest one, this is the Egyptian like Dwara Palakas out of Tamil Nadu. This is in Elora Caves. In six centuries, you have a bland roof you don't have any ornamentation but the dwara palakas are huge their headdress is huge and uh, their concerts are huge and we have a very basic shivali.
can get there. Now coming to uh, the outside, Patadakal. The Dwarabharatas are refined and then have more ornamentation and then uh, another Dwarabharata sitting at the side uh, relaxing. So the interesting thing is the Silpis also mentioned uh, specialization in various cultures and uh, there are inscriptions saying that Baladeva was specializing only in the Dwarapalakas. And slowly, they are becoming more human-like and looking more like soldiers. Now, again, we go to the Tantric Dwarapalakas. This is in Mahakuta, and where the, the, uh, the, the figures are something similar to the Jogulamba temple kind of a Tantric uh, images like this. So this is another aspect of Pearsam Dwarapalakas, which are belonging to the Tantric uh, stream. Now, interestingly, we see this. The moment we see three legs, we always straight away jump in to say the bringi. But this is not a single bringi. It is a double bringi. Now, how do you say that? Now, we have a problem. If it is a single, it will be bringi and one more rishi uh, who uh, who are normally below the Nataraja thing. Now we have double bringing. So this is the issue which was uh, uh, raised by Dr. Sulali, uh, Manjanath Sulali sir, and then it was uh, uh, it solved by Dr. Sankara Narayanan by referring to this one. So in Ananda Kanta, Kantara text talks about uh, Shiva South Dwarapalakas as Bringi and Dritti, both having three legs. So, this is another variation where uh, we have still a lot of unexplored validations and variations of Dwarapalakas as per Agamas. So, thanks to Dr. Manjanath Sulali for highlighting this. This was an interesting discussion in Facebook. Now, coming to Kerala, see the styles of Dwarapalakas where the attire, the headdress, and the weapon, everything is different. There, the culture is to have Dora Palakas in bronze uh, or in copper. And uh, the other famous medium for Dora Palakas is wood. Fantastic details and the expression and the amount of ornamentation for the Dora Palakas. And Dora Palakas, don't remain stationary in a place. Sometimes they get stolen also. The, it is art uh, lovers always like Dwarapalakas. The proof is that so many Dwarapalakas are now in foreign museums. But even during early times, people used to take Dwarapalakas from the winning countries. This is one of the famous uh, Dwarapalaka which has been taken by Rajendra period, by Vijay Rajendra, his son, from Kalyanapura, that is the capital of Chalukyas. So there is an inscription there which says that it has been taken from Kalyanapuram. Such a beautiful Dwarapalaka, so they have immediately taken it back. Again, uh, in the later uh, Vijayanagara period, we also see a lot of uh, finer details Dwarapalakas where uh, it, it confirms to the Agamic text that even the stomach should resemble the mouth and the head of a Nandi. So people have validated it so many times that the, the uh, mouth part and the head part has been polished so much and it stands out like anything. This is the Vaidhanadesara temple in Talkar. And see the ornamentation, and but the ratios are wrong the, because the height height and uh, the head ratios are little off and then uh, the figure looks less human life like but ornamentation wise beautiful and this is the the details polished details when we talk about dwarapalakas or any sculptures without referring to hoysala the sculptures are incomplete and this is the ultimate in Dwarapalakas. It's very difficult to focus and go through unless you have a zoom camera. And the amount of ornamentation, gaps, and other things, 
just the damaru the amount of uh, uh, the fan tail it is uh, spreading ultimate detail so much of jewelry so much of detail and in any situation vaisala soapstone sculptures are the ultimate in terms of final details this is how the best dwara palkas look like but when it comes to collection collect biggest collection of dwara palkas nothing to beat tanjavur big temple and then this is yoga jagma is partially followed for this dwara palkas and uh, uttara karana mentions different names for different locations okay and in santa we have bindi and mundi and then we have four more in the savakasa antrala and the steps on on the south and the north side and we have three ganadwaras on uh, south uh, north and uh, west and each two another six in ardha mandapa nandi mahakala and then maha mandapa we have nandi and gundodara and in nritya and mukha mandapa front end we have vikata and bhima and in gopuram we have jaya vijaya four batches so so total it comes to around 26 kind of one thing 22 kind so this is the ultimate collection but again this is one of the the two grand uh, dwara palas which is uh, near the ganadwara this is an opening like window but the ultimate is already in in uh, tanjavur they have made the dwara palaka so big but again they wanted to say that they are bigger and bigger how do they convey it what they do is they have the two biggest dwara palakas in the front gopuram they are huge you can compare this size and this size and then they are huge but still they are saying that they are bigger how do they do that so if you look closely in this area you find that there is a snake trying to swallow a big size elephant and the dwara palaka is putting his uh, leg on top of the tail of the big snake so you can progress uh, and say that a snake which can easily swallow a elephant and that too coiled under and uh, that kind of a snake he is putting under the leg and then he is telling that the bigger god is back on the on the temple so that is a kind of bigness projected by innovation in sculptures see this is the the, the zoomer details where it is trying to a, a, a crocodile is there and this elephant is pushing the crocodile and the elephant is being swallowed by a, a snake and the snake is being pushed by the leg of the torapaka so this is what is projects the ultimate hugeness by a simple sculpture and then it it is a it's a scale multiplier to the ultimate now this is how the dwara palaka is giving outstanding service to the master when i say outstanding they are literally standing they are standing all over the place except in cba or in us no nowhere else the dwara palaka stand primarily because of the readiness and other things most of the time uh, they they are always standing and the, and in very rare situation they sit only in kerala for for shopkeepers after so much of pressure they give the right to sit so that till such time all the shop agents sales person were always standing now tamil nadu is also following it on 2021 and then if you look at any tamil nadu or any apartments uh, the guard always ha- takes a rejected chair somewhere some old chair will be there or somebody will be donating the chair and, uh, and uh, particularly after 10 o'clock you will go one round and then quietly getting settled in the uh, chair for a sleep so at least they have things to sleep but our dwara palakas are standing over 1500 years without changing position without sleeping standing in the same place 
But even the God, Lord Nataraja, has changed the standing position once. Uh, in Madurai, uh, when uh, the Madurai king requested that why you are standing in one leg for uh, uh, such a long time, uh, he changed his stance and instead of standing on uh, right leg, he changed it to left leg. So even Lord Nagraja has changed the position, but the Dwarapalakas are still standing in the same position for uh, 1,500 years. Let us have our pronouns. And then next time, I hope all of you will be observing the Dwarapalakas a little more closely whenever you visit the temples. And to sum up, the Dwarapalakas are not a Nataka by themselves. Beautiful different headdresses they convey the looks, so much of messages in the looks itself, the benign looks, the terror looks, the protective looks, and the mudras. Each hand gives a different mudra, and then they never stand straight like your official one, always on the various abanga posts, the collection of weapons, the ornaments, and the dress which reflects the incoming deity. The body language, the way they say that, beware, the big god is inside. And a lot of Puranic stories around the Dwarapalakas. And they represent the Stula Sarira of, uh, of uh, the uh, Sanctum Sanctorum and the god inside. So they are a representation and then they are extension of the god inside. So with this uh, brief uh, time, I complete my presentation. So if you want to see this presentation or any of the other similar presentation, you can connect to my YouTube channel, Babu for Heritage. You can subscribe and do the detail. And uh, you can also connect me in mobile or in email in this details. Thank you very much. And thanks for uh, the patience and time. Now this session, I, sir, I hope I was in time. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Mr. Shirsankar Babu. Uh, now the session is open for questions. If there is any question, please put your question forward. If you are finding it difficult, uh, you can type the questions in uh, chat box also. Attendees, please ask questions. If you have any queries or any curiosity, then please put your question orally or on the chat box. बताखाई जी क्या चैट बॉक्स में क्वेश्चन है थोड़ा देखें आई थिंक देयर आर फ्यू फीडबैक्स ओनली दीस आर फीडबैक्स सर बेसिकली देयर आर नो क्वेश्चंस एक्चुअली सर कैन आई टॉक सर ओके यस श्योर श्योर हां यस सर Sir, uh, good afternoon. This is Dr. Shivanagiri Distapati, and uh, thanks to Dr. S K Mishraji and uh, his team for organizing such a nice uh, seminar. And uh, it is actually both tradition and nature and culture. It is a combination of the series. It is a combination of nature and culture. Very good. Extremely happy. So regarding this talk. i really wonder myself though i am working as sabati i couldn't even uh, visit those many places that mr shivashankar babu ji has shown us and varieties of dwarapalas this is uh, really i uh, am uh, very interesting to note that uh, we in general we see generally jaya vijaya and uh, uh, dindi and mundi like that now in routine format but he, he had the the beauty lies in his lecture that he has compared for example some dwarapalas to nataraja and uh, some other dwarapalas in uh, uh, naikas they were uh, sorry marathas they were also there. this is a new thing that i come across uh, to know 
and uh, uh, unless until he does a considerable research he never comes for his presentation we had his presentation earlier i congratulate the uh, speaker and thank profusely the organizers for arranging a nice lecture that we all learned new things from his talk thank you sir thank you thank you sir pranam ji this this words from you are no, a no, real no, blessing no, no, that no. is an interesting for me no, to go sir, through no, sir. thank you very our much. pleasure our pleasure thank you yeah any anybody asking questions please no i don't see any questions coming up okay uh, sir uh, mishra sir shall i conclude the session uh, yes, uh, uh, yes sir. Uh, dr sir sir murthy sir uh, uh, online online sir yes sir Hello. yes sir please Hello. yes sir so the lecture i mean uh, presented by mr shivashankar sir is very much astonishing he has made an successful attempt to trace an account of the dwarapalas and dwarapalaki right from the pallava mahendra movement period of sort of the not only in tamil nadu not only in karnataka not only in andhra pradesh kerala even in south east asia it is a very to trace account of all these dwarapalaka because dwarapalaka study is neglected now in senses that under made by Mr. Uh, Sir is very very laudable. Not that I pointed out very very important points also. For example, the Pallava and Dwarka Pallas are always very simple. So in archaeological studies, more simple, more uh, naturally is the early early. So that is what Sir yes. has very much pointed out. Yes, we have traced almost all the details about the the culture and the even the the structure and all the theory regarding the Dwarka. At the uh, Tanjore Bhagwadeshwara Temple, the imagination of the sculpture, everything is very useful to this uh, historian. Sir. So whatever it may be, your lecture is very much useful to us. So in this way, I am very much thankful to you on behalf of the the webinar uh, conducted by Professor uh, the uh, Professor uh, Dr. Chandra Kumar Mishraji. I also I thank Indraji Ji also for this. So thank you very much for everybody who are patient with. Thank you very much, sir. So thank you, Tirumuthi, sir, for a very, very pointed yes, lecture. Thank you, Mr. Shiv Shankar ji. Your research is wonderful, and your presentations are equally wonderful. We are delighted with your presentation. I have just two additions, uh, if you mind, in speaking it. Uh, one is that uh, there is a reference in Indian mythology that uh, there was a asur called Banasur. Uh, you might have heard uh, yes. who uh, took a boon from uh, Lord Shiva to be his gatekeeper. Yes. So that also you can take into consideration. And while visiting one fair at Jaipur uh, that was held by the Chhattisgarh uh, peoples, means uh, the tribal area peoples, I purchased mm -hmm. two artifacts. Uh, uh, Means uh, the artifact looked uh, bronze uh, uh, statues. You can say they that the it is in the form of a plate. You can say and when I asked them, they said that they, it is normally fixed on the doors, wooden doors, to keep mm -hmm. the uh, bad souls away from the home. So that also mm -hmm. you can take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. It was an interesting insight. I will also check out this. Thank See, you. there are so many Puranic stories around Dwarapalas and their role and other things. Uh, and uh, since it is uh, 45 minutes, I had a challenging time to compress my maximum information. And definitely, when I uh, publish this as a detailed YouTube series, I can include more and more. I am looking forward to more input from scholars on different aspects of this. Because uh, we need to do a lot of research and then we'll do it. And if you come across any Dwarapala related uh, tidbits and then insight, I request all the scholars here to share it with me. I'm trying to put it and uh, going a little more deeper into this. Thank you for uh, thank you for the support and uh, an insightful feedback. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you Mr. Shivshankar Babu, sir, giving, uh, giving a nice talk in this webinar series.
and uh, thank you uh, dr tirumurthy sir for share the session and uh, in the uh, mr indrajit bhattacharya for co chair the session uh, all of you thank you uh, welcome sir dr panduranga sir welcome yes so our next session uh, is uh, eminent speaker dr lalit pande former director professor sahit sansthan vidyapeeth deemed university udaipur our chair person dr y s rawat former director of gujarat state archaeology and museum gandhi nagar gujarat and co chair person dr madan meena honorable director adivasi academy tejgarh gujarat welcome all of you sir and i am request to uh, request to do dr y s rawat sir please share the session and introduce our upon eminent speaker dr lalit pandey sir please unmute yourself sir rawat sir please unmute yourself Uh, thank you professor i am grateful to you for giving me this chance opportunity to chair this session of the eminent scholar dr lalit pandey uh, who is ma phd in ancient indian history culture and archaeology and he has an illustrious career in education and academic field he served as a dean faculty of social science and humanity Uh, Bhopal Noble University Udaipur and Director Sahitya Sastan Institute of Rajasthan Studies. He also held the charge of the Registrar of the University uh, of the Rajasthan Vidyapeet, and he has more than thirty years of experience in teaching and research. His area of specialization is in the proto history and early hist historic archaeology of. india with a special reference to rajasthan which is very rich in the this uh, culture the early historic and the rural civilization the rural archaeology he has been instrumental in designing various courses optional paper for archaeology and museology pg diploma mphil and ma in archaeology and ancient history culture and archaeology of rajasthan he has coordinated programs for various certificates and diploma courses in french vastu and jyotish at the institute he also organized about 13 seminar on different aspects of archaeology and culture of rajasthan he is a life member of so many society like the ispqs intec vigyan samiti udaipur and so many others he was actually the member of many expert committee uh, constituted by the various government agencies and university and also was an international association in international association he has actually supervised phd under the fulbright program and also did the same the work with the japanese at uh, in the international conference he has delivered several lecture in various institution based in rajasthan and outside the rajasthan and he edited uh, many books out of them jis patamta andolan mein mewad ka yogdan pratap aur unka yug rajasthan mein vyapar aur vanijya yugyogin mewad aur nandi puran and nandi puran and also he has been editor to uh, of the sod patrika uh, which is actually a bilingual journal of the institute of rajasthan vidyapeeth he also he is also credited with the monograph on dakshini rajasthan ka puratattva evam prachin itihas his major contribution is in the field of archaeological research based on several exploration excavation he conducted in the southwest rajasthan 
in the banaras river valley and its tributary region and so my and jakham river in dungarpur and baswada region since 1993 balathal gilun ishwal natra ki pal etc are his major excavation work uh, which he did did in collaboration or independently he said he had headed joint projects for archaeological excavation and exploration uh, with many reputed university in addition to archaeological research he carried out so many other projects and successfully completed them uh, which include descriptive catalog of kothari balwan singh collection a survey and historical study of inscription of mewar uh, 500 bc to 1000 ad and archaeological deed did work for the archaeological study of places in marana of the marana pratap and also uh, completed the project of documentation of manuscript with the finance assistance of national mission of manuscript his extensive archaeological field work has resulted in publication of 42 research papers among which two important articles based on the badlathal excavation in uh, udaipur district are uh, noteworthy dr lalit pande is still active on various projects related to documentation exploration excavation and publication uh, now with this brief introduction i welcome dr ralit pande and invite him to deliver his talk on early village rural culture of south east rajasthan since mesolithic mesolithic time to 400 bc welcome dr pande uh, thank you dr rawat sir uh, you have told uh, many things about me i am not such a um, big man <laughs> Uh, very little I have done in my life, and a uh, pressure आपने डाल दिया है कि मुझे बहुत सावधानी से बोलना पड़ेगा कि आपने बहुत ज्यादा मुसीबत में डाल दिया है मुझे कुछ भी हो आपको आपका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद कि आपने मेरे बारे में सब कुछ इतना कहा अब देखिए मैं कितना खराब उतरता हूँ इसके बाद तो अब मैं आप पिस्तालीस सैतालीस मिनट के वार्ता के दौरान आप समझ पाएंगे मैं आ, हिंदी में ही बहुत बोल आज बोलूँगा विशेष रूप से आ, और जहाँ तक मैंने जो विषय अपना मिश्रा जी को दिया था तो उस विषय में पिछले पंद्रह बीस दिनों में और आज में बहुत परिवर्तन आ गया क्योंकि तो मैं अब दूसरी एस्पेक्ट पर भी कुछ बोलूँगा जिसमें राजस्थान इन जनरल पूरा का पूरा होगा क्योंकि तो इसका कारण क्या है अभी पिछले पंद्रह बीस दिन पहले एक किताब मेरी नज़र में आई और मैंने उसको खरीदा दिलीप चक्रवर्ती साहब की किताब है बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग किताब है एंशियंट राजस्थान रिसर्च डेवलपमेंट्स एपिग्राफिक एविडेंस ऑन पॉलिटिकल पावर सेंटर्स एंड हिस्टोरिकल परस्पेक्टिव तो इस इसको देखने के बाद मुझे लगा क्योंकि वह एक वेरी रिनाउंड स्कॉलर एंड ही हीज डन अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वर्क इन दी इंडियन हिस्ट्री एंड आर्कियोलॉजी एंड ही इज ए वर्सिटाइल स्कॉलर ऑफ इंडियन हिस्ट्री ये ये स्पेंड इन मेनी प्रॉब्लम लगता है क्या हो गया कुछ
डॉक्टर पांडे आई थिंक देयर इज सम इंटरनेट इश्यू हेलो 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 ओके आप अनम्यूट कीजिए अपने आप को डॉक्टर पांडे तो लाइट चले जाने से थोड़ा इंटरप्शन हो गया तो उन्होंने लिखा है कि राजस्थान की हिस्ट्री में चार या पांच जो हैं स्टेजेज हैं ये पहली स्टेज को उन्होंने डिवाइड किया है कि उन्होंने कहा आर्कियोलॉजिकल स्टडीज है जिसमें प्री हिस्ट्री प्रोटोक हिस्टोरी पार्ट है जिस पर बहुत इम्फेटिकली नंबर ऑफ रिसर्चर्स एंड स्कॉलर दे हैव वर्ल्ड है ना वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वर्क लाइक दी एन मिश्रा एस डी साकलिया एंड ऑल अदर स्कॉलर इवन फरकवाल एंड ऑल दे हैव डन ए वेरी लॉट ऑफ वर्क एंड देन राइट की अर्ली हिस्ट्री इज ए नेगलेक्टेड फील्ड ऑफ राजस्थान जिसमें बहुत कम लोगों ने काम किया है और उस पर उन्होंने एक तो बड़ा प्रेशर डाला है दूसरा वो कहते हैं कि जब उसके बाद और राजपूतों से पहले का जो इतिहास है राजस्थान का वो काफ़ी नेगलेक्टेड रहा है और राजस्थान की हिस्ट्री को जब हम शुरू करते हैं तो हम ओरिजिन ऑफ राजपूत से ही शुरू करते हैं और उनका ओरिजिन ऑफ राजपूत में भी जो अभी तक पॉलिटिकल हिस्ट्री जो पढ़ी गई है और पढ़ाई गई है उसमें पिछले कुछ सालों में चेंज आया है एक तो पहला तो थ्योरी ओरिजिन ऑफ राजपूत की है इसके बाद जिसे 36 जो क्लांस हैं और ये सूर्यवंशी क्षत्रिय हैं चंद्रवंशी क्षत्रिय हैं इसके बाद वो कहते हैं कि इस अभी एक दो दो थ्योरीज और डेवलप हुई हैं राजस्थान की हिस्ट्री के कंटेक्स्ट में एक तो स्टेट फॉर्मेशन की थ्योरी की बात आती है और एक दूसरी बात आती है अर्ली मेडिवियल राजस्थान की जो बड़ा इम्पोर्टेंट पार्ट है राजपूत पीरियड के अंदर स्टेट फॉर्मेशन कैसे शुरू हुई और खास तौर पर मेवाड़ की जब हम बात करते हैं दक्षिणी राजस्थान की जब हम बात करते हैं तो ये इस, इस इलाके में जो स्टेट फॉर्मेशन का जो प्रोसेस है वो अपने में बड़ा इंटरेस्टिंग है और अध्ययन करने लायक है उसका थोड़ा सा वर्क कुछ मैंने भी किया है उसके बाद कहते हैं फोर्थ जो आस्पेक्ट है राजस्थान की हिस्ट्री की वो फ्यूडलिज्म है सामंतवाद है जिसको काम करने का श्रेय कर्नल टॉट को जाता है उन्होंने इस बात को शुरू किया जब वो भारत के अंदर ब्रिटिश रेजिडेंट बन करके आए दूसरा उन्होंने बड़े अच्छे बड़े अच्छे तरीके से अपनी पुस्तक में उन लोगों का जिक्र किया है जिन लोगों ने राजस्थान की हिस्ट्री को मैं को शुरू किया और भारत के अंदर एक बहुत बड़ा ऐसा डिसिप्लिन बना दिया जो सारी इंडियन हिस्ट्री के समकक्ष आके खड़ा हो जाता है और उस और इस समय मेरे ख्याल से बहुत लोग जो है राजस्थान पर इस समय काम कर रहे हैं तो इसका श्रेय उन्होंने जेम्स टॉट को दिया है जेम्स फर्गिसन को दिया है ए सी कार्लाइल को दिया है और इंडियन स्कॉलर्स राजस्थान के स्कॉलर्स में सबसे पहले कवि राजा श्यामल दास थे जिन्होंने मेवाड़ के या हम कह सकते हैं राजस्थान के पुरातत्व पर काम किया वैसे तो सांभर का एक्सकेवेशन हेडले उन्नीसवीं शताब्दी के मध्य में ही कर चुके थे Uh, लेकिन कबीराजा श्यामल दास क्योंकि एक इंडिजीनियस स्कॉलर है नेटिव स्कॉलर है इसलिए उनका काम जो है बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण हालांकि ए सी एल कार्लाइल उससे पहले नगरी जो है सर्वे कर चुके थे और उसके रिजल्ट उनके आ गए थे लेकिन श्यामल दास ने जो सबसे बड़ी इम्पोर्टेंट खोज है वो इंडियन हिस्ट्री के कंटेक्स में बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है उन्होंने सबसे पहली बार यहाँ दो अर्ली ब्राह्मी के इंस्क्रिप्शन जो है डिस्कवर किए जो अपने में एक बड़ा माइल स्टोन था राजस्थान की हिस्ट्री में और इंडियन हिस्ट्री के अंदर इसमें एक सरोताद का अभिलेख है दूसरा जो है नारायण वाटक का अभिलेख है 
घोसुंडा का अभिलेख है ये अभिलेख जो है बड़े महत्वपूर्ण जानकारी देते हैं श्यामल दास ने यह भी लिखा है कि ये चित्तौड़ के उत्तर में दस पंद्रह किलोमीटर की दूरी पर है और यहाँ बुद्धिस्ट स्तूप का ए सी एल कार्लाइल भी डिस्क्राइब करते हैं और कविराजा श्यामल दास भी उसको वर्णन करते हैं उसका लेकिन उसके बाद जब भी मैंने स्वयं जब विजिट किया नगरी को लेकिन मुझे वहाँ उस तरीके के कोई जो है प्रमाण जो है नजर नहीं आए इसके बाद मैं अपनी बात पे आने की कोशिश करूंगा मेवाड़ जो है या दक्षिणी राजस्थान जो है इसकी जो टोपोग्राफी है फिजियोग्राफी है फिजियोकोनॉमी है उसने इसके इतिहास को बहुत अधिक प्रभावित किया है और वो बड़ी ऐसी रही है जिसमें मानव मनुष्य जो है आराम से उसको हैबिटेशन बनाने में सेटल्ड होने में अपने कल्चर को शुरू करने में बड़ी आसानी रही है और सबसे पहले मेवाड़ के इतिहास को जो काम शुरू करने का जो श्रेय है वो बंगाल के लोगों को जाता है और इसका कारण शायद ये है जब कर्नल टॉड ने मेवाड़ और राजस्थान के बारे में लिखा तो सबसे पहले बंगाल के अंदर महाराणा प्रताप को पढ़ा गया और महाराणा प्रताप को जब डिटेल्स में पढ़ा गया तो बंगाल के अंदर बंगाल के जो स्कॉलर्स थे उनमें एक रुचि जागृत हुई राजस्थान और मेवाड़ का अध्ययन करने की उसमें मेवाड़ ज्यादा जो है इंटरेस्ट लिया उसमें इसमें एक तो गांगुली है उनका बड़ा अच्छा कल्चरल हिस्ट्री और राजस्थान और मेवाड़ पर उन्होंने बहुत अच्छा काम किया है दूसरा एक नाटक लिखा गया उन्नीस सौ एक सेंचुरी में एक बंगाल के बहुत अधिक प्रसिद्ध साहित्यकार थे डी एल रे डी एल रे ने एक बंगला में ड्रामा लिखा मेवाड़ का पतन और बाद में इस का पुनः इसका इंग्लिश अनुवाद जो है उनके बेटे दिलीप कुमार ने किया और जिसको उन 1958 में उस इंग्लिश ट्रांसलेशन को उन्होंने छापा तो इसमें उन्होंने बड़े अच्छे तरीके से मेवाड़ का जो भूगोल है उसको वो वर्णन करते हैं वो लाइन है मैं आपके सामने पढ़ने की कोशिश करूंगा मेवाड़ माउंटेन मेवाड़ माउंटेन फ्रॉम हुज हाइट्स रिच रिवर्स फॉल डाउन फर्टाइल सेफराइट ग्लिस्टरिंग वेल्स एंड विद इकोज रिच पेरेनियल रिवर्स इसमें वो लिखो इसका हिंदी में है ओ मेवाड़ के पर्वतों मेवाड़ के पर्वतों जिनकी उत्तरी चोटियों से जल से समृद्ध नदियां झरनों के प्रतिरूप में उर्वर नीलम के दैदिक पर छटा लिए वर्ष पर्यंत सघन जल राशि से समृद्ध हो गुंजायमान होकर गिरती हैं तो भौगोलिक दृष्टि इस तरीके से उन्होंने जो वर्णन किया है ये बड़ा आपके में कम्प्लीट वर्णन है यहाँ के भूगोल को समझने के लिए और जहां तक आर्कियोलॉजिकल रिसर्च की बात का प्रश्न है कविराजा श्यामल दास पहले व्यक्ति थे मैंने बताया नगरी का जिन्होंने काम किया उसके बाद फिर सिक्सटीन के अंदर भंडारकर ने नगरी का दोबारा एक्सप्लोरेशन किया और वहां से उन्होंने ये एस्टेब्लिश किया कि ये प्री मॉरियन सेटलमेंट था 400 हंड्रेड के आसपास ये एस्टेब्लिश जो है हो चुका था सिटी वॉल थी जो बड़े मजबूत स्लैब्स की स्टोन स्लैब की जो है बनी हुई थी वो एक बड़ा फ्लरिशिंग रीजन एक सिटी सेंटर रहा होगा उसके बाद फिर बहुत काम राजस्थान पर नहीं हो पाया कंटिन्यूटी डिसकंटिन्यूटी रही उसके बाद आजादी के समय का जो पीरियड था जब आजाद हो रहा था भारत हम जिस प्रक्रिया में थे तो उस समय सौंदर राजन ने एस एस आर राव ने सौंदर राजन ने यहाँ पर बेड़च बेल्ट का चित्तौड़ के आसपास का सर्वे किया और उन्होंने यहाँ पर जो है स्टोन टूल्स को जो है उन्होंने खोजा और जो उस समय का जो इंडियन आर्कियोलॉजिकल रिव्यू का जो रिपोर्ट है उसमें उन्होंने लिखा है इस क्षेत्र में सर्वप्रथम एस आर राव ने कार्य किया उन्होंने बेड़स समुच्च में चित्तौड़गढ़ के समीपवर्ती क्षेत्र में महत्वपूर्ण खोज कर यह मत प्रतिपादित किया कि यहाँ से सोहन और मद्रास दोनों प्रकार के परस्तर उपकरणों का मिलना बहुत अधिक बहुत महत्व का है चित्तौड़ से सोहन संस्कृति के चौपट उपकरणों का कम संख्या में मिलना और मेड्रोसी अचूलियन 
बाईफेस के पर्याप्त मिलने से अनुमान होता है कि यह सोन संस्कृति विलुप्त तो होती हुई मद्रासी प्रस्तर संस्कृति में समाहित हो गई होगी इसके बाद जो है वी एन मिश्रा ने गंभीरी और कदमली नदियों का सर्वेक्षण किया उन्होंने एचोलियन परंपरा के यहाँ से जो है और चौपर चौपिंग उपकरण जो है ढूंढे स्क्रैपर भी उनको मिले और इस संबंध में सांकलिया का काम एक 1958 में सांकलिया जी ने नादवारा के अंदर सर्वे किया और नादवारा को वो ये कहते हैं नादवारा जो है वाज दी मोस्ट फेवरेट लैंड ऑफ पेलियोलिथिक मैन इन इंडिया और उन्होंने जो आ, जो आदि बनास है उसका उन्होंने सर्वे किया था और वहां पर उन्होंने ये नहीं कहा कि अर्ली मैन वहाँ आया था लेकिन अर्ली मैन के टूल्स वहाँ मिल रहे हैं उनको प्रारंभ हो जाते हैं तो उन्होंने लिखा है कि ये फर्दर डिस्कवरी के लिए एक बहुत बड़ा क्षेत्र है और उन्होंने इस रिफरेंस में ही कांकरोली का जिक्र किया है कांकरोली एक टाउन है जहाँ द्वारिकाधीश का मंदिर बड़ा फेमस मंदिर है वो कहते हैं कांकरोली नाम ही इस बात को डिनोट करता है कि वहाँ राउंड गोल जो है पत्थर थे पेबल थे जिनसे उसको टूल बनाने में उस आदमी को बड़ी आसानी हुआ करती थी इसलिए वो नाथ द्वारा कांकरोली इस क्षेत्र के अंदर रहा उसके बाद उन्होंने लिखा है कि चित्तौड़ की जो फूट हिल्स हैं वो जो है अर्ली मैन था पेलियोलिथिक मैन था उसकी जो है वो बड़ा एक फेवरेबल लैंड थी क्योंकि जहाँ उसको बेडर्स बनास नदियों का पानी गंभीरी नदियों का पानी मिल गया और उसको थिक जो फॉरेस्ट थे डेंस फॉरेस्ट थे उनसे उनको खाने पीने को सामग्री मिल गई और अरावली की जो फूट हिल्स में जो शेल्टर्स थे उसने उनको रहने की जगह दी और इसका वो अपने हमने ही उनकी एक किताब जो है नाइनटीन एटी एट में छापी थी नाइनटीन सिक्सटी सिक्स सिक्सटी सेवन में जब हम पढ़ा करते थे तो उन्होंने शायद विद्यापीठ में कभी लेक्चर दिया होगा आर्कियोलॉजी आर्कियोलॉजी इन राजस्थान तो उसमें उन्होंने इस बात का जिक्र किया है कि जब हम पुल से नदी को पार करके जब हम चित्तौड़ के किले की ओर बढ़ते हैं तो उसके नीचे उन्होंने लिखा है कि हाईएस्ट प्लेस ऑफ दी कंसंट्रेशन ऑफ दी पेलियोलॉजी टूल्स है तो इसलिए उन्होंने इस बात को बड़ा इम्प्रेसिव किया है कि चित्तौड़ जो है वह मनुष्य का ऐसा केंद्र रहा जहाँ पर उन्होंने कहा आने के रास्ते तो दो थे जाने का जाने के रास्ते के रास्ते दो थे आने का रास्ता सिर्फ एक ही था लेकिन इस फेवरेबल लैंड ने आदमी को अपनी ओर इतना अट्रैक्ट किया कि जो यहाँ आ गया वो यहाँ से माइग्रेट नहीं किया तो एक तरीके से इसने सेल्टर दिया चित्तौड़ ने और यदि हम सारी इंडियन हिस्ट्री में देखते हैं मेडिवियल पीरियड में भी ये बात सिद्ध होती है कि चित्तौड़ ने जो है नॉर्थ इंडिया को बहुत समय तक रजिस्टेंस करके बचाए रखा विदेशी आक्रमणों से जो चित्तौड़ का अपने एक बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण स्थान है तो इसके बाद में बी एन मिश्रा जी के जो काम है उससे अधिक हम सब लोग परिचित हैं जिसमें उन्होंने पेलियोलिथिक और कैलकोलिथिक जो आहार साइट जो है उन्होंने जो है ढूंढी थी पचास से साठ जो है उन्होंने जो साइट्स ढूंढी थी वो मल्टीकल्चरल साइट्स थी स्टोरेज की साइट थी और वो कैलकोलिथिक फोटो हिस्टोरिक साइट्स भी थी तो इस क्रम में इसी बीच में 1953 से 54 से लगा दो तीन वर्षों तक लगातार रतन चंद्र अग्रवाल जी का काम बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण है एक माइल है अपने में अग्रवाल साहब ने जो है आहार के अंदर खुदाई करी और सबसे पहली बार उन्होंने यह बताया कि एक यहाँ तांबे का इस्तेमाल करने वाले और सांस में पत्थर का भी प्रयोग करते थे वो लोग रहते थे और काले ब्लैक एंड रेड वेयर बनाया करते थे जिन पर सफेद रंग से चित्रकारी भी की जाती थी इस तरह से उन्होंने आहार संस्कृति को 2000 हजार बीसी के आसपास की संस्कृति उन्होंने बताया उसके बाद जो है गिलुंड के अंदर बीबीलाल साहब ने एक्सप्रेशन किया हालांकि एक ही साल का एक्सप्रेशन था उसमें उन्होंने ब्रिक्स स्ट्रक्चर्स की बात करी पब्लिक स्ट्रक्चर्स की बात करी पैरेडल फोर पैरेडल वॉल्स के जो स्ट्रक्चर्स हैं जो ग्रीनरीज के काम आते रहे होंगे शायद सरप्लस प्रोटेक्शन रहा होगा तो एक रूरल से सेमी अर्बन सोसाइटी की ओर बढ़ रहा था ये उनके उस एक्सप्रेशन से पता लगता है फिर सांकलिया जी ने सिक्सटी के आसपास फिर दोबारा आहार के अंदर एक्सप्रेशन किया जो बड़े पैमाने पर एक्सप्रेशन किया गया था वह एक्सक्रेशन अपने राजस्थान आहार कल्चर को समझने के लिए एक बहुत बड़ा मील का पत्थर था 
और उसमें उन्होंने जो जो कुछ नई चीजें उनके पोट्री के बारे में उनके हाउस पैटर्न के बारे में और उनके टूल्स के बारे में कॉपर टूल्स के बारे में और टेराकोटा फिगराइन और फिगर्स के बारे में जो उन्होंने सब विस्तार से लिखा है वह आहार संस्कृति को उसने आहार संस्कृति को इसने उनकी खोज ने डिस्कवरी ने जो है एक भारतीय मानचित्र पर प्रागैतिहासिक इतिहास के मानचित्र पर स्थापित किया उसके बाद फिर एक वैक्यूम आ गया बहुत समय तक फिर नाइनटीन एट्टी फाइव एट्टी टू एट्टी थ्री एट्टी फाइव के आठवें दशक में हम कह सकते हैं रीमा होजा ने कैम्ब्रिज में रहते हुए बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण काम किया आहार कल्चर पर जो अपने में एक बहुत महत्व का काम है और जिसने उन्होंने भी एक कुछ सर्टेन लाइंस एक्स्ट्रा रिसर्च की फर्दर लाइंस को उन्होंने गाइडलाइंस को एस्टेब्लिश किया जो निश्चय ही आहार कल्चर को समझने में बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण सिद्ध होती है फिर इसी बीच में राजस्थान विद्यापीठ जहाँ पर मैंने काम किया है वहाँ हमारा संपर्क मिश्रा जी से हुआ के डी वाजपेयी हमारे मेरे गुरु थे उन्होंने मुझे उनका संपर्क दिया कि उनका लेक्चर कराओ मिश्रा जी को हमने 89 के अंदर विद्यापीठ में बुलाया और 93 में हम इस तरीके से आ, मार्च के महीने में हमने पहला सर्वेक्षण किया जिसमें संजय साहब और आर के मोहन जी हमारे साथ थे और जिसमें कुछ साइट्स को मार्क किया गया जो रिविजिट किया मिश्रा जी की ही साइट्स थी ढूंढी हुई और उसमें से एक साइट बालाथल को हमने एक्सकेवेशन के लिए चुना और 93 दिसंबर 94 जनवरी के अंदर मिश्रा जी के डायरेक्शन में बालाथल के अंदर जो खनन किया वो बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण खनन रहा जो सात साल तक लगभग एक्सकेवेशन चला और उसमें उनका हॉरिजेंटल एक्सकेवेशन आहार में एक ही साल हुआ था उसके बाद बड़े पैमाने पर ओरिजेंटल एक्सप्लोरेशन पहली बार जो है क्लियर तो हुआ जिसमें यह उसकी जो फेजेज हैं अर्ली फेज मैच्योर फेज और डिक्लाइन की फेज तीन फेजेज को बिल्कुल उसमें क्लियर कट उसमें नजर आती हैं और अर्ली फेज में आदमी जो यहाँ बसा वो पेड्रॉक पर बसा उसने झोपड़ियाँ छोटी छोटी झोपड़ियाँ बनाई और उसमें एक मृदभांडों को पोट्री को बनाया जो रिजर्व स्लिप्ड वेयर इसे कहा गया और और इस बालाथल के इस उत्खनन ने रिजर्व स्लिप्ड वेयर के ओरिजिन के बारे में कई मान्यताओं को बाद में बदला कि जो हड़प्पा की देन है तुरकोटुरा से मिले हैं इससे मिले हैं वहाँ से सीखा है लेकिन वो उसमें प्रायर डेट के हैं बालाथल से हमको खेती के भी एविडेंस जो है पहले के मिले जो तीन लगभग आज से फाइव थाउजेंड पुराने हैं तो इस तरीके से ये हुआ कि बालाथल की जो कल्चर थी आहार संस्कृति जो थी वह एक ऐसी कल्चर थी जो इंडिजीनियस थी जिसका हरपन इन्फ्लुएंस उस पर नहीं था और वो एक इंडिजीनियस रूप से उसने वहाँ के लोगों ने फूड गैदरर और हंटर से धीरे धीरे वह फूड प्रोड्यूसर बना था तो इस तरह बालाथल में ये बात हमको ये पता लगती है और गुजरात के हड़प्पा के लोगों से उनके जो हैं कॉन्ट्रैक्ट थे ये उनकी पोट्री में हमको पता लगता है और मकान उनके आयताकार मकान स्लैब स्टोन स्लैब्स के बनाया करते थे और कई तरह जो रेड स्लीप है थिक रेड स्लीप है थिन रेड स्लीप है टेन वेयर है कई जो पोट्रीज हैं मृदभांड हैं उनका उसमें सब ये बातें आई उसके बाद जो है सिंधे साहब ने फिर गिलुंड में जो है एक्सकेवेशन किया वह भी लंबा एक्सकेवेशन जो है तीन से चार साल तक चला और यह सीधे साहब का यह एक्सकेवेशन बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण था इसी दौरान उन्होंने दोबारा बागोर जो मिश्रा जी की एक बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण साइट थी जिसमें मिश्रा जी ने मिजोलिथिक साइट थी वहां पर उन्होंने एक्सकेवेशन किया था दो से तीन और वहां पर उन्होंने जो प्रमाण पहली बार जो मध्य पाषाणकालीन जो इतना बड़ा स्थल उनको मिला था और बड़े पैमाने पर तो उपकरण मिले थे उसके आधार पर और पहली बार वहां से मानव कंकाल भी उनको मिले थे तो इस तरीके से उस और कॉपर टूल्स भी मिले थे तो इस तरीके से मिजोलिथ इसके अलावा मिश्रा जी ने एक एक्सकेवेशन बाड़मेर के अंदर भी किया तिलवाड़ा के अंदर तो ये दो एक्सकेवेशन उनके बड़े छठे दशक में बड़े महत्वपूर्ण थे लेकिन और बागोर ने जो है फिर लोगों का बहुत अधिक ध्यान आकृष्ट किया और उसको दोबारा से रिवाइव डॉक्टर सिंधे ने फिर किया
डॉक्टर साहब कोई पीपीटी तो नहीं है नहीं नहीं पीपीटी नहीं है साहब पीपीटी क्या मैं आज मैं मोबाइल से बोल रहा हूँ असली में खराब खराब है हाँ तो उन्होंने जिलून के एक्सकेविशन के बाद सिंधे साहब ने जो कुछ जो डिस्कर्स निकाले उनको चार या पांच पॉइंट पे मैं बताने की कोशिश करूंगा आ, एक तो वह लोग सन बर्न सन बेग्ड और क्लीन बर्न ईटों का ब्रिक्स का इस्तेमाल किया करते थे और सीमित अनुपात में वास्तु उन आर्किटेक्चरल प्लानिंग जो है उसका एक इनिशियल स्टेज पर उन्होंने डेवलपमेंट कर लिया था और आ, उनकी क्राफ्ट जो है बड़ा कॉम्प्लेक्स और वेरियस किस्म के थे और उपज के अनाज के सुपर सरप्लस ग्रेन को एकत्र करने के को स्टोर करने के लिए उन्होंने आ, जो है बड़े खूबसूरत बड़े अच्छे तरीके के जो हैं ग्रेनडीज बनाई थी आ, जो हमको कल्चर्स में बहुत कम देखने को मिलती है इस तरीके से आहार कल्चर एक पहली संस्कृति बनती है जिसमें हमको कुछ अर्बन ट्रेड्स जो हैं देखने को मिलते हैं इसी बीच में उन्होंने जो बागोर के अंदर जो खुदाई करी वह खुदाई बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण थी बागोर से उन्होंने अः ये कहना चाहिए कि प्रोटो हिस्टोरिक पीरियड के जो इतिहास की जो डेट्स है उनको बदलने का काम किया तो वहां से उनको दो तरह के जो है अवस्थाएं मिली एक ए सीरेमिक मिजोलिथिक फेज मिली दूसरी सीरेमिक फेज मिली और ए सीरेमिक फेज के बारे में वो कहते हैं कि उसका जो पीरियड था वो लगभग सिक्स सेंचुरी सिक्स मिलेनियम बीसी के आसपास था तो इस तरीके से लगभग मेहरगढ़ के पैरल था और इसी डॉक्टर सिंधे के बागोर का जो एक्सकेवेशन के जो रिजल्ट हैं उनके आधार पर ये दिलीप चक्रवर्ती ने भी जो वो लिखा है अपनी किताब में वो कहते हैं कि बागोर एक ऐसा विजुअलिटी सेंटर है जहां पर हमको एग्रीकल्चर के डेवलपमेंट के जो है एविडेंस क्लियर कर देखने को मिलते हैं और बागोर में उनकी एक विद्यार्थी हैं जो तो बी अमेरिका में है अरुणा अरुणा कश्यप उन्होंने बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण कार्य कार किया वहाँ पे उसका साइंटिफिक एनालिसिस करके उन्होंने बताया कि किन किस किस तरह की वे लोग अनाज जो हैं यूज करते थे जिसमें तिल था जिसमें बैगन था जिसमें तूर की दाल थी और अनेक चीजें जो हैं वो लोग पैदा करते थे और इस तो बागोर जो है इस तरीके से एक ऐसे सेंटर के रूप में उभरा जिसको हम पैरल हम रख सकते हैं मेहरगढ़ के कि मेहरगढ़ और हड़प्पा के साथ साथ इसी इस क्षेत्र में भी एक इंडिपेंडेंट संस्कृति जो है पनप रही थी आउटसाइड दी हड़प्पन एम्पायर तो ये बड़ा महत्वपूर्ण कार्य थे दूसरा यहाँ से गिलून से सिंधु साहब को कुछ सील्स मिली थी क्ले सील्स मिली थी जिन पर जिन पर उन्होंने कई कहा मार्ग थे सन मार्ग था और दूसरे कई मून मार्ग था दूसरे मार्ग थे उसके आधार पर उन्होंने कहा कि ये जो सील्स हैं मुद्रा मुद्रांक है यह लॉन्ग ट्रेड डिस्टेंस को जो है सूचित करते हैं और बहुत लंबे दूर तक मकरान और इधर मेरेजियाना बैक्टीरिया मेरेजियाना आर्कियोलॉजिकल कॉम्प्लेक्स है वहां तक से उनके रिलेशन थे और यह आदान प्रदान का साधन थे और ये एक कॉम्प्लेक्स एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव स्ट्रक्चर की भी सूचना देते हैं उसके बाद इसी बीच इसके बाद एक इंडो अमेरिकन प्रोजेक्ट के अंतर्गत हमने डेकन कॉलेज के प्रबोध डॉक्टर प्रबोध चिवलेकर के साथ और ईशा भी थी उसमें उनके साथ और तेरेसा अमेरिका से थी हम लोगों ने छतरी खेड़ा और पचमता का एक्सकेवेशन किया छतरी खेड़ा का एक्सकेवेशन इसलिए महत्वपूर्ण था कि वो पूरा माउंट जो है लगभग वो जमी हो गया था समान धर, धरातल बन गया था तो वहाँ पर टोटल स्टेशन से उसका कंटूर बनाया गया फिर एक जगह एक मकान के अंदर जहाँ कुछ थोड़ी सी जगह एक माउंट जो है उपलब्ध था वहाँ पर खुदाई करके एक सीक्वेंस को समझने की कोशिश जो है की गई उसके बाद पचमता को खुद खोदा गया जो गिलूर से हार्डली आठ या दस किलोमीटर की दूरी पर है और उसको देखने से लगता है 
कि वो इतना ही बड़ा माउंट रहा होगा जितना गिलुंड का था लेकिन अनफॉर्चुनेटली जो कैलकुलेटिंग माउंट है उसी के ऊपर मॉडर्न विलेज बसा हुआ है तो माउंट जो है उस सारा उसके सिर्फ चार या पांच जो है एक छोटे छोटे माउंट के पार्ट्स रह गए तो वहां पर उनमें से जिसमें से दो तो बिल्कुल नष्ट हो चुके हैं और एक या एक में बिजली ये आर एस सी वालों ने राजस्थान स्टेट इलेक्ट्रिसिटी बोर्ड ने कुछ अपना काम धाम कर रखा है दो एक में हनुमान मंदिर है वह सुरक्षित है दूसरा जहां हमने खुदाई की थी वह थोड़ा सा सुरक्षित था हालांकि वहां पर भी दरगाह भी थी एक प्राइमरी स्कूल भी था नीचे बना हुआ लेकिन एक छोटे से पार्ट में उसी तरीके से हमने उसका उत्खनन जो है दो वर्ष तक जो है किया और बहुत अधिक हमको एंटी एंटीक्विटी के या एविडेंस के मिलने की उम्मीद नहीं थी लेकिन उसके बावजूद भी हमको वहां से ठीक गिलुंड की तरह का पैरेलल वॉल्स का पब्लिक स्ट्रक्चर वहां मिला जो ब्रिक्स का बना हुआ था और जिसमें चैम्बर्स थे जो लाइन थे कोटेड थे जिसमें अनाज जो है रखा जाता था और उसका जो है डेटिंग उसकी वहां से उसको देखने के लिए कि किस अवधि में ये बना और कब उजड़ा इसके लिए वहां एक्सटेंसिवली उस पार्ट से छोटे से पार्ट से हम लोगों ने जो है कार्बन सैंपल से लगभग 18 से 20 कार्बन सैंपल जो है इकट्ठे किए और उनकी जो डेट जो है वो जो आई है उसे पता लगता है कि वह एक बहुत कंसनट्रेटेड सेंटर था हैबिटेशन का और बिजनेस सेंटर था और जो बहुत कम अवधि तक रहा डेढ़ सौ वर्ष के अंदर वो बना और उजड़ गया ना शायद उसी पचमता क्योंकि बड़ा सेटलमेंट था शायद बिजनेस सेंटर वहां से शिफ्ट होकर के दूसरी जगह चला गया होगा तो और लेकिन एक बड़ा वह इस बात का सूचक है कि व्यापक स्तर पर किलुंड की तरह ही वहां पर सरप्लस प्रोडक्शन होता रहा होगा और वह लोग वहां से भी किलुंड के तरह के ही जो सील्स हैं वहां से भी मिली हैं जो बिन्स के अंदर पड़ी हुई मिली हैं टूटी भी हैं तो उससे अनुमान लगता है कि जो व्यापार के अंदर जो सील्स जो है काम आया करती थी और जब सामग्री पहुंच जाया करती थी तो शायद सील को तोड़ दिया जाता था ताकि उसको दोबारा से उसमें जो है हेरा फेरी नहीं उसके लिए काम खुलिया जाता था तो इस तरीके से एक बहुत अच्छी और दूसरा पचमता और गिलुन से हमें एक दूसरी बात ये भी पता लगती है जैसे आहार के अंदर हम देखते हैं या बाराथल के अंदर देखते हैं या ओजियाना दूसरी साइड है भीलवाड़ा के पास उसमें हम देखते हैं कि स्ट्रक्चर जो हैं वो स्टोन के हैं लेकिन गिलुंड में नाइन्टी नाइन स्ट्रक्चर जो है मठ ब्रिक्स के बनाए गए हैं और पचपता के भी मठ ब्रिक्स में बनाए गए हैं शायद इसका कारण ये रहा होगा क्योंकि नदी के किनारे हैं बनास के और वहां पर उनको अच्छी जो है लेविगेटेड क्ले सॉइल जो है क्ले मिल जाती थी और उससे बड़ा आसानी से वह लोग अच्छी मिट्टी की मिट्टी बनाया करते थे आज भी गिलुंड और पचमता के आसपास के जो इलाकों में ईट बनाने का काम बड़े व्यापक पैमाने पर जो है होता है तो इस तरीके से उन्होंने जो उनका सेटलमेंट पैटर्न था उसमें जो बनाने के बनावटे स्ट्रक्चर थे उसमें जो तो उन्होंने लोकल जो रॉ मेटेरियल था उसको बड़ी तवज्जो दी उसमें वेरिएशन हमको देखने को मिलते हैं ये एक बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण बात है तो हालांकि ये बहुत लगभग 130 सौ तीस से ऊपर साइट्स हैं वो डिस्कवर अभी तक वो साइट जो है डिस्कवर हो गई है एक्सकवेशन जितनों में हुआ है उससे एक बड़ी स्पष्ट सी तस्वीर जो है नजर आती है गिलुंड की रिपोर्ट लिखते हुए डॉक्टर सिंधे ने एक बात और लिखी है वो ये लिखते हैं कि माउंट का सर्वेक्षण माइक्रो सर्वेक्षण करने से उन्हें ये इस तरह का आभास हुआ मतलब कर्क पर वो पहुंचे कि उनको बड़ी रिफाइंड किस्म की ग्रे वेयर वहाँ सरफेस पे और सेक्शन पे देखने को मिली और उसके आधार पर वो ये कहते हैं कि शायद गिलुंड जो है कैलकोलिथिक के डिजर्शन के बाद आठवीं नवी शताब्दी ईसापुर एट और नाइन सेंचुरी ईसापुर के अंदर ये तक यह चल रहा था और उसके बाद हिस्टोरिकल पीरियड में भी यह बता रहा मतलब जो एक डिसकंटिन्यूटी जो है मानी इंटरप्शन जो है वो शायद नहीं था इसकी पुष्टि बाद में और दूसरी चीजों से होती है जैसे अभी अगुचा और, और रामपुर गरीबा और अगुचा के अंदर जो कुछ नई डेट्स जो आई हैं जिंक की डेट्स हैं उसमें सिल्वर की भी डेट्स हैं 
वो डेट जो है लगभग उनमें एक डेट तो स्टे डेट है आइसोलेटेड डेट है 1650 की डेट है उसको हम नहीं भी मान सकते हैं लेकिन जो दूसरी डेट है उन सब में जो है बारह तेरह ट्वेल्व थाउजेंड ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड थर्टीन हंड्रेड जी बी से लेकर के नाइन हंड्रेड एट हंड्रेड जी से रेगुलर कंटिन्यूटी है कि वहां पर दस्ता भी निकलता था तांबा भी निकाला जाता था और सिल्वर भी निकाली जाती थी और अभी एक कैम्बिज की ही डॉक की ही स्टडी है उसमें उन्होंने कहा है कि शायद उनकी उनका जो आगुचा और है वह मॉरियन एम्पायर से सेंट्रली गवर्न था और जो मगध एम्पायर को जो सिल्वर पंचमार्ट पॉइंट बनाने के लिए जो सिल्वर दी जाती थी वह जो है सिल्वर अगुचा के इलाके से दी जाती थी और इट वॉज सेंट्रली कंट्रोल बाई दी मौर्याज इट वॉज ए कॉम्प्लेक्स एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव सिस्टम उनका था और शायद वो उज्जैन से या गिरनार से वह कंट्रोल होता रहा होगा इसकी यह एक फर्दर बात है लेकिन यह बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण बात है कि जो राजस्थान को मेवाड़ को खास तौर पर माना जाता है कल्टी तक था एरिया ऑफ आइसोलेशन था ऐसा नहीं है वो इंटीग्रल पार्ट उसी तरीके से भारत का था जिस तरीके मौर्याज के पीरियड में भी जिस तरीके से और पार्ट है और बात इसकी बात में यदि हम देख इसमें इसी साथ में देखते हैं इससे पहले जो नगरी का एक्सकेवेशन हुआ उसमें भी हमको प्री मॉरियन सेटलमेंट के एविडेंस हमको देखने को मिलते हैं उसके बाद बालाथल के अंदर जो हमको डेट्स आई हैं फोर्थ सेंचुरी बीसी की हैं गिलून से भी फोर्थ सेंचुरी बीसी की डेट्स आती हैं तो अर्ली हिस्टोरिक पीरियड यहाँ जो सेकेंड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन की फेज थी उसी तरीके से यहाँ भी वह फ्लरिश कर रहा था डेवलप कर रहा था तो और मौर्याज के बाद तो कंटिन्यूटी राजस्थान की हिस्ट्री में पूरी की पूरी हमको देखने को मिलती है कि जैसा हम इसमें हमको लिटरेरी सोर्सेज भी मिलनी प्रारंभ हो जाती हैं इसमें आर्कियोलॉजिकल एविडेंस तो है ही जैसे इसके अलावा जो आर्कियोलॉजिकली जो महत्वपूर्ण साइट है उसमें जो है अगुचा बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण साइट है जो प्री मॉरियन सेटलमेंट है लछूरा जो एक दूसरी साइट है वो भी मानसी नदी के किनारे है सेवन्थ और एट्थ सेंचुरी बीसी के वहाँ से जो है एविडेंस मिले हैं और उसके बाद हमने जो दो ईसवाल और नथारा की पाल जो दो साइट हमने खो दी हैं उसमें भी हमको लेटर मॉरियन और सुंगा कुशाणा पीरियड से लेकर के हमको राजपूत पीरियड तक के इलेवंथ और ट्वेल्थ सेंचुरी तक के एविडेंस बराबर देखने को मिलते हैं नाथ द्वारा और नठारा की पाल जो है वह हालांकि एक अर्ली मेडिवियल क्या अर्ली मेडिवियल मेडिवियल पीरियड की एक साइट है वहाँ से हमको और बहुत तो एविडेंस नहीं मिले हैं लेकिन वहाँ पे सबसे बड़ी एक उपलब्धि यह हुई है कि वहाँ एक्सवेशन के दौरान हमको थर्टी से ऊपर इंडो सेशनियन कॉइंस मिले थे जो ये बताते हैं कि नाइन टेंथ सेंचुरी में यह सेटलमेंट जो है अच्छा रहा होगा और जो इलाका मेवाड़ की हिस्ट्री के अंदर जो महत्वपूर्ण इलाका माना जाता है छप्पन का इलाका इसे कहते हैं जो महाराणा प्रताप के आने के बाद जो है महत्वपूर्ण हुआ उससे पहले उसका हिस्ट्री के अंदर कोई बहुत बड़ा स्थान नहीं था तो वहाँ से हमको और आस उसके जो दूसरे सेटलमेंट मिले हैं उसमें आयरन एक्टिविटी के आयरन वर्किंग के काफ़ी एविडेंस मिले हैं और आज भी नठारा के पास जो है आइडेंटिफाइड है राजस्थान स्टेट माइंस एंड मिनरल्स ने एक बहुत बड़ा आयरन का डिपॉजिट वहाँ जो है आइडेंटिफाई कर रखा है और जहाँ पर बड़ा प्रचुर मात्रा में आयरन तो इस वाल में भी इसी तरीके से हमको एक्सकेवेशन के दौरान लगभग 40 से 42 हमको आयरन इम्प्लीमेंट्स मिले जिनका जो है साइंटिफिक एनालिसिस जो है हमने सिंधे साहब के प्रयत्नों से कोरिया से कराया गया और जिससे हमको ये पता लगा है कि उसमें जो चार जो टूल्स हैं वह प्योर स्टील के बने हैं और बाकी जो शेष टूल्स हैं उसमें भी आयरन प्योरिटी जो है 90 परसेंट से ऊपर की है मतलब कहने का अर्थ यह है कि आयरन जो मेटर जी है आयरन जो तो बनाने की विधि है वह उन्होंने डेवलप कर रखी थी और एक हमको वहाँ से बाई मेटेलिक टूल मिला है जो ब्रॉन्ज का और आयरन का फ्यूजन से बना है लॉस लॉस टेक्निक से उसको जोड़ा गया है 
और बड़ा अच्छी उसमें जो है कारीगरी की गई है उसमें जो वो उससे लगता है कि या तो कोई वह क्या प्रपज रहा होगा मतलब फ्लैग की तरह झंडे की तरह से देखने में लगता है तो या तो कोई उसका धार्मिक प्रपज रहा होगा इस विषय में हमने वहाँ ईसवाल के पास ही एक प्राचीन मंदिर है जैन धर्म का जिसको संपत्ति से जोड़ा जाता है तो वहाँ हमने श्वेतांबर संप्रदाय का मंदिर है वहाँ के लोगों से भी हमने इस बारे में पूछताछ करने की कोशिश करी तो उन्होंने ये बताया कि ये मोटिव कुछ इस तरीके के सिंबल्स थे जो दान में दिए जाते थे और ये परंपरा जैन धर्म में काफी समय तक रही है हालांकि अब यह परंपरा देखने को नहीं मिलती है तो प्लीज कंक्लूड सर कंक्लूड कर रहा था एक बार हाँ सर प्लीज कंक्लूड कर टाइम हो रहा है प्लीज हाँ तो ये इसके बाद जो है जब हम राजपूत पीरियड में जब हम आते हैं तो हम देखते हैं कि मेवाड़ के संदर्भ में ही सिर्फ थोड़ी सी देर आपसे गुहिल डायनेस्टी की बात करूंगा हम हर्ष का हम जानते हैं जो पतन डाउनफॉल हुआ वो सिक्स हंड्रेड फोर्टी सेवन एडी के आसपास हुआ और लेकिन उससे पहले ही मेवाड़ के अंदर जो है गुहदत्त ने सिक्स सेंचुरी बीसी में एडी में ही उन्होंने यहाँ अपना गुहलों की एम्पायर की स्थापना कर दी थी और उसके बाद लगभग छः सौ पच्चीस छः सौ बीस ए डी के आसपास यहाँ पर शिलादित्य का अभिलेख मिलता है अपराजित का अभिलेख मिलता है मतलब एक वेल एस्टेब्लिश जो है स्टेट फॉर्मेशन यहाँ जो है शुरू हो गया था और ये गोहिल जो है तीन थे एक तो नागदा के गोहिल थे जहाँ पर ये अपराजित था शिलादित्य थे नागदा जहाँ है एक सिंह जी का मंदिर जहाँ है पापा जहाँ थे और दूसरे जो गोहिल थे वह भीलवाड़ा के पास एक जहाजपुर जगह है वहाँ पर धवगर्द या धोड़ के गोहिल थे जो दूसरी ब्रांच और तीसरी ब्रांच जो है डूंगरपुर में सिंधा पुरी में थी जिसका आधुनिक नाम है कल्याणपुर है ये तीन जो है गोहिलों की ब्रांचेस थी इसमें से जो नागदा के गोहिल थे ये इनका मिलिट्री ऑर्गेनाइजेशन बड़ा स्ट्रांग था और जो किसकिंदा के जो गोहिल थे उन लोगों ने इरिगेशन सिस्टम एग्रीकल्चर का बड़ा अच्छा डेवलप कर रखा था और उनका एडमिनिस्ट्रेट उनके जो अभिलेख जो पांच कॉपर प्लेट्स मिली हैं वहां से जिनका डीसी सरकार ने एनालिसिस किया है तो उनका यदि आप पढ़ें तो आपको ये कितना कम्प्लेक्स कॉम्प्लेक्स एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव स्ट्रक्चर उनको देखने को मिलता है उसे पत, उससे पता लगता है कि वह काफी एक वेल ऑर्गेनाइज पोलिटिकल पावर रही हो लेकिन इन तीनों में कैसे संघर्ष हुआ या कैसे ये एसिमिलेट हुए और नागदा के गोहिल जो हैं ये क्यों सुपर पावर हो गए यह एक ऐसा प्रश्न है जो अभी तक निरुत्तरित है और इसके प्रश्न चिन्ह इसके अंदर लगे हुए हैं शायद इसका कारण ये रहा होगा कि क्योंकि नागदा के गोहिलों ने फॉरेन रेजिस्टेंस को इन्वेडर्स इन्वेडर्स के रजिस्टेंस को बहुत सहा मिलिट्री उनकी सुपीरियर थी सुपीरियर थी शायद इस वजह से धवगर और किसकिंदा का जो गोहिल थे उन्होंने तो एज ए नेचुरली उन्होंने उनकी सोवर्निटी को एक्सेप्ट कर लिया होगा और इस तरीके से ये गोहिल डायनेस्टी रही जो दुनिया की सबसे पुरानी डायनेस्टी में रही है और लगभग 1350 साल तक इन लोगों ने राजस्थान में मेवाड़ में और भारत के भाग में जो है राज्य किया है तो इस तरीके से अभी भी मेवाड़ के इतिहास में राजस्थान के इतिहास में काम करने की बड़ी गुंजाइश है और शायद ये छोटी सी जो बात मैंने करने की कोशिश की होगी हालांकि बहुत पूरी तैयारी के साथ नहीं था मैं भी लेकिन कुछ इसमें शायद रोशनी पड़ेगी इसी के साथ ही धन्यवाद अब धन्यवाद डॉक्टर साहब बहुत अच्छे ढंग से आपने एक्चुअली समाप्त किया यू एक्चुअली दिस इज ए वेरी यूनिक एरिया यूर दिस आहाड़ बेसिन एंड सराउंडेड बाई दरावली रेंज फ्रॉम very prehistoric time to even modern age is very 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 attractive for the settlement and that's why you have got all the cultural phases from prehistory to today only the thing is the identity remain actually very regional because of the hills and the valley and the people develop their own actually culture and civilization later and but at the same time they have got contact with the harappan on the west 
and the Bactrian Marjana in the Central Asia, as the Gilind excavation has shown. And I think that site actually been actually a unique uh, cultural area, which was thought actually it was a, a isolated area. Earlier it was thought actually it was isolated, but not now it is not actually. And it is very much contemporary to the Harappa. And then the, as you said, the, the Mauryans and other things that that's where this valley has got full the deployment of the all the culture from the prehistoric time to even the, the middle medieval period. Thank you very much, Doctor Sir, for this enlightenment. Thank, Thank you. Any query? Please, if any question. Hello. How much is it for Amzara? I want to know. Yes, sir. It, that is a very important mound, and it hasn't been explored. Only some some work was done by R. R. C. Agarwal. But hmm. still, there has to be done. Are you talking about Ahar? Amjara. Amjara. Ha. Ha. Amjara is a very uh, important early historic site. Uh, there are two sites uh, in uh, that area. One is Amjara, and another is the Luhalia. Hmm. And both are the early historic site. Or Luhalia was a very uh, major center of the iron working. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, after Arsi Agrawal, no one uh, worked there. Uh, once or twice, I visited um, uh, there, and uh, from surface collection, I got a few evidence of the spouted shirts uh, 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 and uh, red uh, polished or washed red wear and some. Refined, fine uh, gray wear, burnished uh, gray wear. Uh, um, I collected from that side, but uh, not much uh, I worked there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Ah, namaste, sir. Namaste. Ye apne jahajpur ka jo guhils ka banana hai, us bataya hai. Uske baare mein thodi si. आजकल कहते हैं धोड है ना और यहाँ पर एक धनिक था धनिक राजा थे यहाँ के फ्यूडल थे वह बड़े पावरफुल राजा थे और उन्होंने प्रतिहारों से युद्ध किया था और वह युद्ध जहाज जहाजपुर से करने के लिए वो डबोक में आए थे डबोक में आकर के उन्होंने जो उदयपुर के पास ही एक बीस किलोमीटर की दूरी पर एयरपोर्ट है वहां पर उन्होंने देवपाल को हराया था मतलब एक अच्छी पॉलिटिकल पावर थी रीजनल पावर थी लेकिन बाद में जब ये एसिमिलेशन हुआ नागदा के गोविलों का और किसकिंदा के गोविलों का तो ये उसमें एसिमिलेट हो गए उसके बाद से टेंथ सेंचुरी के बाद से इनकी हिस्ट्री हमको नहीं मिलती है थैंक यू सर कंक्लूजन रावत सर एक कंक्लूजन थैंक यू सर एक्चुअली देयर इज अ टाइम स्ट्रेन आई एम वेरी मच थैंकफुल टू यू फॉर दिस एनलाइटनमेंट एंड कनेक्टिंग द फ्रॉम प्री हिस्ट्री टू द मॉडर्न टाइम पर्टिकुलरली द मेवाड डायनेस्टी Guhil and others, and with this, I I want to conclude and I, I thank the Professor Mishra for actually conducting the whole kumbh of the scholars. I think uh, for so many long time, this is actually very amazing. You are managing all these things very perfectly. Thank you very much. An uh, unprecedented job. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mishra Sir, thank you, and uh, I am very much thankful to Rabu Sir. तो राजस्थान पहले याद आता है भारत में तो उसको आपने और स्वयं आपने ये कार्य किया है आपने उसको स्वयं देखा है तो अः इतिहास को आपने स्वयं अपनी तरह से आपने देखा भी है उसको तो ये अनुभव जो शेयर किया आपने विद्यार्थियों के साथ निश्चित रूप से हमारे ऑडियंस उसमें 
जानकारी प्राप्त किए हैं आगे भी आपसे हम चाहेंगे कि हमारे जो स्टूडेंट हैं वो आपसे शेयर चर्चा करेंगे और आगे की जो उनका उनकी जो भी उत्सुक होंगे या विषय के बारे में जो और भी गहराई से जानना चाहेंगे क्योंकि आप न केवल एक एक खोजी इतिहासकार हैं बल्कि प्राध्यापक भी हैं तो उसकी उस बारीक बारीकियों को भी आप समझते हैं तो एक बार मैं पुनः अपने महाविद्यालय की ओर से हायर एजुकेशन की ओर से ऑर्गेनाइजिंग कमेटी की ओर से आपके अच्छे इस व्याख्यान के लिए हम धन्यवाद देते हैं डॉक्टर रावत साहब ने हमारे इस वेबिनार में उन्होंने अपना समय दिया सेशन को शेयर किया और अपित एक ही नहीं और भी सेशन में वो लगातार अपनी सहभागिता दिए हैं और यही बात है कि जो जहाँ तक मैनेजर की बात है मैं तो बनस्पति शास्त्र का विद्यार्थी हूँ और हमारे हायर एजुकेशन डिपार्टमेंट ने हमको ये ऑर्गेनाइज करने के लिए क्योंकि आई क्यू ए सी प्रभारी हूँ मैं तो इसलिए रूषा के माध्यम से हम हर विषय पे चर्चा कराते हैं और हमने क्या सोचा कि यदि साथ में कई विषय आ जाएंगे तो और अच्छा रहेगा तो बीच बीच में जो है वो बॉटनी जुलाजी और अन्य विषय के भी चर्चा होती है अभी कमलेश शर्मा प्रोफेसर कमलेश शर्मा मैडम बैठे हैं वो कुछ कल्चर पे भी बात करेंगी कल जो है मदन मीना साहब डॉक्टर मदन मीना साहब ने ट्राइबल आर्ट की बात की तो इस तरह से एकता में अनेकता जैसे भारत का सूत्र है उसी तरह से हमने कोशिश की है इसको चलाने के लिए और आप लोगों के सहयोग के बिना आप लोगों के मार्गदर्शन के बिना ये नहीं हो सकता था और हम इसके पहले भी चर्चा के पहले भी आदरणीय पांडे जी से बार बार जो है इस मामले में चर्चा किए हैं पहले भी तो इस तरह से आप सभी का सहयोग और मार्गदर्शन मिलेगा खासकर जो विषय के जानकार लोग हैं और इसी के साथ हम पुनः आदरणीय रावत साहब को आदरणीय पांडे जी धन्यवाद करते हैं। धन्यवाद को और मिश्रा साहब को कि आपने आपने अपॉर्चुनिटी दी और इतना सब कुछ आप आठ दस दिन आपने जो महाकुंभ जो कर रहे हैं इस महाकुंभ के बाद यदि जितने दिन चलेगा उतने दिन उतने स्कॉलर पे यदि जागृत हो जाएं काम करना शुरू कर दें तो हम सब शायद कृतार्थ होंगे <laughs> इसी के साथ ही भी नहीं सर ये महायज्ञ है ज्ञान का महायज्ञ है वो है इस इम, इमिनेंट स्पीकर भामनी ए महिदा चीफ क्यूरेटर हैं साइंस सेंटर सरदार वल्लभ भाई पटेल म्यूजियम सूरत की चीफ क्यूरेटर हैं आप और जो चेयर पर्सन है डॉक्टर पंकज शर्मा डायरेक्टर डायरेक्टरेट ऑफ आर्कोलॉजी एंड म्यूजियम गवर्नमेंट ऑफ गुजरात गांधीनगर डॉक्टर पंकज शर्मा सर स्वागत है आपका और वो चेयरपर्सन डॉक्टर के आर पीर मोहम्मद एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर पीजी एंड रिसर्च डिपार्टमेंट हिस्टोरिकल स्टडी नंदा नाम चेन्नई वेलकम पीर मोहम्मद साहब डॉक्टर पीर मोहम्मद साहब वेलकम और आई एम रिक्वेस्टिंग टू डॉक्टर पंकज शर्मा प्लीज नमस्कार सर एंड आई एम वेरी थैंकफुल टू गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू चेयर दिस सेशन एंड स्पेशली भामिनी जी तो भामी जी भामिनी जी शी इज लाइक हर डन शी कम्प्लीटेड हर मास्टर्स डिग्री इन एम ए आर्क्योलॉजी एंड इन एम ए म्यूजियोलॉजी इन नाइनटीन नाइनटी टू एंड इन नाइनटीन नाइनटी फोर she started her career as a teaching like professor in the ms university history of uh, art department uh, faculty of arts ms university baroda and she has organized so many exhibitions during during her tenure currently she is working as a chief curator in uh, municipal corporation museum we have a regional science center over there in surat so she is the chief curator over there uh she also been to usa to 
just to see the uh, rarest total solar eclipse during 2017. And she is very hardworking curator over there in 2006 when in Surat there was flood. So during that time also she worked very hard and she retrieved the entire collection. Uh, they have almost uh, 30,000 collection over there in the museum. So uh, they have retrieved almost entire collection during the 2006 flood. So she is very hardworking. She has organized various fairs and festivals also. So as per the, if you'll talk about as a curator, so she is very proactively working in the field. Now I will request uh, Bhamini ji to present her presentation and uh, to give her talk. Thank you. Namaskar sir. Thanks a lot for my brief introduction. Uh, today my topic is regarding the historical heritage core of Surat and blending it with the museum collection. Uh, first, I would like to give brief about the Surat city because basically this webinar is being viewed by all over India. So Surat is a city located on the western part of India in the state of Gujarat. It is second largest city of Gujarat and considering as a financial capital of Gujarat. Surat is also famous for diamond and textile industry. One tenth of the total collection of diamond is being polished here at Surat. Uh, this is the uh, small history of Surat. Uh, the origin of Surat dates back to 300 BC. It was ruled successively by the kings of Surira, Mahabharat period and the other Hindu period till 1194 AD. Thereafter, uh, till late 18th century, Ahmedabadi Sultanate rulers from dynastics like Tughlaq Muhammad Mughal, among other health, uh, saw over the city. So likewise, even in 16th century, we have Portuguese, British arrived first in Surat in 1608 AD. And the, particularly, the, if we see the architectural elements of the city, we have Dutch elements, we have few French elements also in the city because it was a pro uh, in trading center. Surat has thus been an important trading port on the western coast, uh, flags of 84 countries were seen uh, flying on their ships, indicating the vast range of trading partners that patronize Surat. It is said that the province surrounding Surat has acquired the name of Choriasi Taluka, that is 84 Talukas, since then. The city was originally established on the southern bank of the river Tapi, with a port on the eastern bank of the river. The activities were concentrated within the inner wall constructions of which was started in the year 1664 AD. The area of the city at that time within the wall was 1.78 small square kilometer. The entrance of the wall city area was to 12 city gates and these, the construction of the second fourth wall was completed in the year 1707 AD enclosing 7.36 square meter area. Uh, this is the old uh, uh, painting which uh, gives highlight of the city and which is dated to 1738. And particularly it shows the fort of Surat, the inner wall that is known as Shaherpana and the outer wall which is identified as Alampana. This is the urban uh, growth of the city from 1688 to 1991. Today, the city limit of Surat is almost 324 kilometer area. Since the museum, the uh, fort and the science center is run by Surat Municipal Corporation, I think it is one of the important municipal corporation who is taking care of lots of civic amenities and along with these civic amenities uh, also uh, it has given emphasis to 327 schools providing primary education seven in seven different languages other than that uh, we have smc has developed uh, numerous health center hospitals along with medical college 
साइंस सेंटर म्यूजियम एक्वेरियम लाइब्रेरी रीडिंग रूम नेचर पार्क बॉटनिकल गार्डन जू गार्डन ऑडिटोरियम कम्युनिटी हॉल स्पोर्ट कॉम्प्लेक्सेस परफॉर्मिंग आर्ट सेंटर पीस सेंटर इन दिस सिटी now i would like to give brief uh, regarding the history of the fort the fort of surat was initially built on the bank of river tafi in south gujarat during the tughlaq dynasty that is 1373 later on it built stronger bigger during the gujarat sultanate period that is 1546 ce further the fort was ruled and governed by moguls east india company and lastly by the british rulers The fort has six buildings, four bastions, and two partial bastions. It was protected by moat on fort's outer boundaries. The fort had an installation of cannon guns on its rampart and bastions. Uh, now the fort has restored moat, gatehouse, hydraulic uh, drawbridge, approximate thirty-five galleries of collection of Sardar Vallabh Bhai Patel Museum. Uh, is on display uh, which will be complementing architectural beauty and the history of the fort here you can see the layout of the fort and uh, the government of gujarat in the year 2015 uh, gave an opportunity uh, to surat municipal corporation to restore the ancient fort to begin the restoration work was itself a big task for smc because likewise for any municipal corporation the prime objective is uh, for ba basically providing civic services like health water sanitation and transportation uh, restoration of very old structure like fort is very challenging because as it is historical many portions of the original structure was often changed there are no records of it there were numerous alterations made on its outer facade and internal architectural which were never recorded with time many structural unstable parts were abandoned which were either buried or plastered into the walls example vault water tank etc building techn technique kept on changing from 14th century tughlaq era to 16th century gujarat sultanate period and from 17th century mughal era to 19th century british rule so from 14th century to 19th century lots of changes were done uh, on the uh, fortification wall or on the structural uh, thing of the fort fort so here i will be showing you few important aspects of how the restoration was done on the first phase so this is from 2015 Uh, till 13th April 2018, SMC had successfully restored three buildings and one gate, which was kept open for public as a phase one of restored fort. I would like to show you a film which highlights how restoration work has been carried out. वक्त की लहरों के साथ कई नुकसान हुए और वक्त की लहर उन सभी निशानों को भी जानी है लेकिन कुछ जाबाज किरदार ऐसे भी हुए जिन्होंने वक्त के सीन पर अपनी मार लगा दी और जब वक्त के सीन पर कोई निशान आता है तब वक्त वक्त नहीं रहता तवारीख बन जाता है और यही तवारीख तवारी के लिए एक वो मिसाल मिलेगी जो आज भी एक अपराजित योद्धा की तरह सूरत शहर की शान बना हुआ है यह तवारीख है उन अहम सालों जो इस किले में गुजारे अपने सीने पर कई बंदों के और तोपों के बाहर सहने वाला यह किला जो अपनी असली पहचान खो बैठा था उसके रिस्टोरेशन की जिम्मेदारी सन 2015 में 
गुजरात सरकार द्वारा सूरत म्यूनिसिपल कॉर्पोरेशन को दी गई पुनर्निर्माण के इस कार्य को आगे बढ़ाते हुए यह पता चला किले की दीवारों पर वक्त और हालात की कई परतें चढ़ गई थी एक के बाद एक परत हटती गई और हर परत के पीछे एक नया रास पाया इतिहास की किताबों का अध्ययन करते हुए किले के रिस्टोरेशन का काम शुरू किया गया सबसे पहले तो किले का जो हिस्सा जीर्ण हो चुका था उसे ध्वस्त किया गया और कुछ हिस्सों को मरम्मत के बाद और मजबूत बनाया गया सुरक्षा के लिए लोड टेस्टिंग किया गया और आगे काम शुरू किया गया इसमें इस्तेमाल की गई ईटों का प्रकार इसे जोड़ने के लिए चुने का मिश्रण इसके बनाने की शैली यह सब चौदह सदी की बनावट से मिलती है सूरत महानगर पालिका ने अपनी विरासत की हिफाजत को लेकर जो जागृति उठाई है वो काबिल तारीफ है इस इमारत पर जो भी अतिरिक्त निर्माण से थी उनको एक के बाद एक हटाया गया और इस किले का असली चेहरा धीरे धीरे सामने आने लगा रेस्टोरेशन कार्य दौरान पता चला कि किले का नीचे वाला एक हिस्सा फिरोज शाह तुगलक के समय का है उसके ऊपर ब्रिटिश कंस्ट्रक्शन और एक तरफ गुजरात सल्तनत यानी खुदावन खान के समय का है इन सब में से जिस हिस्से से महत्व की जानकारी प्राप्त हो और जो अति महत्वपूर्ण हो उसे रिस्टोर किया गया इसके तहत फिरोज शाह तुगलक के समय में बने हुए किले पर काम शुरू किया गया उसमें मोटार की चौड़ाई ज्यादा होती थी ईटे पतली एक या डेढ़ इंच जितनी होती थी और चौड़ी ईटे हुआ करती थी और खास बात यह है कि उस समय लकड़ी के अलावा कोई स्पानी सिस्टम नहीं थी इसीलिए छत बनाने के लिए लकड़ी का इस्तेमाल किया गया था इस तरह किले को ओपन बिल्डिंग कंस्ट्रक्शन सिस्टम तहत रिस्टोर किया गया किले में ब्रिटिश काल की जयकार्च फ्लोरिंग मिली उसके कुछ हिस्से को भी ओपन रिस्टोर किया गया है किले के ऊपरी हिस्से में जब फ्लोरिंग के प्लास्टर को हटाया गया तो पता चला कि यहाँ पर कोर्ट न्यायालय जैसा था और बनावट से ऐसा पता लगा कि इसका निर्माण डच शैली का है किले के अंदर एक टंकी भी पाई गई संभवतः इसका उपयोग पानी को संग्रहित करने के लिए होता होगा किले में एक और हिस्सा मिला इसमें ऐसी व्यवस्था की गई है कि कमरे में नीचे की ओर से ठंडी हवा पहुंचती है और गर्म हवा ऊपर की ओर से बाहर निकल जाती है इसकी रचना ऐसी की गई है कि कहीं पर भी बाहर से यह टनल्स सुरंगे नजर नहीं आती यह किले के पांच बुर्ज है और हर बुर्ज अद्भुत है किले में इस जगह को देखकर लगता है मानो यह हमाम होता होगा गर्म पानी आने का रास्ता के निकलने की व्यवस्था और ठंडे पानी के निकास के लिए भी टनल बनाई गई थी सूरत शहर की इस ऐतिहासिक धरोहर का पुनर्निर्माण करते हुए सूरत शहर की शान को नई चमक प्रदान करते हुए इस पुराने किले को एक नई पहचान देने का सूरत महानगर पालिका द्वारा यह एक नम्र प्रयास है यह ऐतिहासिक किला राष्ट्रीय संपत्ति है इसकी रक्षा करना हम सबका कर्तव्य है आशा है इस किले की मुलाकात आपके लिए रोमांचक आनंदमयी और फलदायी बनी रहे हियर आई वुड लाइक टू शो ऑलरेडी इट इज शोन इन द फिल्म बट देन आल्सो आई वुड लाइक टू शो टू इंपॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट्स लाइक प्रीवियसली हाउ द बिल्डिंग वाज एंड हाउ प्रेजेंटली व्हाट टाइप ऑफ रेस्टोरेशन इज बीइंग डन बाय सुरेंद्र कॉर्पोरेशन एंड हाउ प्रेजेंटली इट लुक्स लाइक so these are few uh, buildings it is a1 building before and after and uh, here this was a recent discovery previously when we had uh, so while we were doing excavations uh, there was a wall so which i will talk about it later on this is a2 building uh, which has been identified as treasury building 
and here we have displayed excavated material mughal gallery and armenian collection coins and trade gallery and british lifestyle room and the food room these are also few glimpses of the same building at different level this is i uh, did as well tower where the um, is being uh, found so you can see what type of building actually it was and how restoration work has been done and presently how it looks like this is uh, barracks a3 building uh, which was constructed during the 19th century and it is a british uh, style uh, style of building this is the inner view of the galleries now i would like to highlight few important elements of restoration process of the fort Uh, while doing restoration work, we have been noticed that there were say seven different layers of plaster walls there, which uh, highlights that there might the plaster on the outer fortification wall or on the inner building so was done several times. So it is almost measuring four inches. So this is how previously the building. and uh, looks like one can see the vegetation roots and debris of the structure to strengthen the uh, particularly the building uh, transferring the structural load was also taken into consideration with steel frames uh, restoration at fort again waterproofing of roof and strengthening of the truss was also taken into consideration these are few elements of uh, excavations uh, while checking the foundations of the structure this is the back portion from the river side how the fort actually look like and uh, there was a gabion wall to prevent the soil erosion on the river side particularly for the restoration like uh, while we were removing the plaster then the layers of the plasters uh, it was identified that uh, lime might have been used uh, during the earlier period so same kind of material was taken into consideration and ingredients used in preparing lime plaster uh, in appropriation portion was also taken into consideration so we have for making this plaster we had uh, used slag lime uh, fine river sand sulfate and other ingredients like proportions uh, appropriate proportion in jaggery fenugreek and google was also in use and all the uh, plaster was in house made at fort itself this is the way how uh, restoration was done and flooring of basalt black stone and specially manufactured marble tile was used in the inner area of the fort preparation of fresco to enhance the dome uh, painting on restored dome was uh, done uh, which highlighted the city and the gates of the city uh, this is again pointing work and furniture preparation in house uh, furniture was also done at fort itself uh, surat was uh, during ancient time as it was a trading center and Uh, in the city, like large number of uh, cannon gangs uh, were found here and there. So SMC surveyed the city, and particularly from the main city, main the central zone from the main city heart where the port is located, uh, we had found large number of cannon guns. So from each and every part of the city, cannon guns were removed from the original post place, and then it was uh, brought back to the port. and they were again be displayed at the gun pockets of the fort these are major uh, tests which were been taken into con consideration while doing restoration work
along by uh, we were doing this several discoveries were made which were not at all known to surat principal corporation that what all things were there so when we removed the layers we could see uh, the various type of different kind of bricks were used and different kind of mortar was used so with the help of these type of structure we could identify that the extended bigger fort building of during sultanic period was of different uh, brick was there different kind of mortar was used and during tughlaq era the size of bricks were much uh, larger they were thinner and the size of the mortar was more than that of the uh, sultanic period uh, while doing the uh, ex excavations we could remove this uh, heritage tank and uh, which was also restored and it has a capacity of 25 Lack liter water. So these I was talking to you that uh, while we were doing excavation, particularly this portion was covered. Uh, there was a wall there. So while we were removing the debris, one portion of the wall was removed, and we could identify that there was an arch. So when we, then we got an idea that something might be there inside. So then we tried to remove the whole structure. and when we went inside two another build, uh, rooms came into existence so this was a new discovery and these were never recorded in any of the ancient maps which were uh, which we had with the corporation so this hama same likewise hamam also we uh, had been found simultaneously uh, looking at the water channels to carry out hot waters and there are separate channels to carry out cold water also uh, this is the discovery of moat and foundation so while we were doing excavations we we could here see three structures so with this idea we got an idea that during ancient time or during uh, 17th century a drawbridge might have been here and looking at that presently surat municipal corporation had on the same area we have again uh, redeveloped a drawbridge of similar kind which might have been there during previous period so this is a rediscovery of a court room and rampart on the court here you can see this is the old rampart how it was and how recently we have uh, developed it likewise this is tughlaq vault Uh, this is sultanat burj and uh, burj and the british para this is uh, these uh, basically highlights these basically highlights a different kind of uh, various style, styles in the same building are being noticed this is that uh, one is dutch influence here you can see the dutch influence here it is british decor influence it is here this is sultanat period and the tughlaq wall so looking at this different kind of structures it was uh, noticed that particularly from 13th century to 19th century different people or different uh, type of uh, dynasties might have occupied the same uh, fort during uh, various times uh, now i would highlight to highlight sardar vallabh patel museum because we have uh, redisplayed the whole collection Uh, to the fort building uh, it is a sardar vallabh patel museum is a multidisciplinary museum comprising of more than 15000 collection which includes uh, stone inscriptions sculptures manuscripts copper plates coins and currency arms and armory porcelain uh, armor uh, we have philately textile beadwork woodwork ivory uh miniature paintings oil paintings which wise pots and jars etc it was inaugurated on 1st february 1890 and it is the fourth oldest museum of gujarat which was named after the then collector of surat mr winchester winchester hence it was known as winchester museum in the year 1953 it uh, since the collection in, uh, increased it was shifted to a bigger building known as lady weaving shed and on 24 december 1957 the museum was uh, renamed as sardar vallabh patel museum 
in the year uh, 1970, uh, the, the third, there were lots of uh, floods came into the city, but in the year 1930, for the third time, this museum was hit by flood. And uh, in this way, the museum lost almost 1300 valuable rare art objects. Again, in the year 2006, the whole museum was underwater and the museum had a loss of more than 2,000 objects. The water stayed almost five days in the museum and majority of documents, textile paintings and not many other articles were destroyed as uh, there was 14 feet water in the museum. You can just uh, have a look at that. What is the scenario of flood in the city? This is... Uh, here is the river Tapi, so, and this is the city where the water entered. In the in almost eighty percent of the city was submerged in water. Uh, this is the effect of flood of the museum, and this is the outer portion, uh, outer building of the museum. The water level was up to this much. Here you can see the almost each and every collection because uh, the museum is, was all, uh, on the ground floor only. So 98% of the collection was submerged in water. We had only one gallery on first floor. So a majority of the collection was displayed on the ground floor. So these are few sections and how what was the situation after flood scenario one can have a look to it this is woodwork gallery uh, this is administrative office almost majority of our documentation and almost all the papers uh, were uh, being in the flood we could not survive a single paper This is uh, all documentation, uh, uh, idea, catalog cards, and all the things were had gone. These are books, musical instruments, stuffed birds. Uh, Surat Municipal Corporation, uh, when we first opened the museum on 16th of August, uh, first of all, we started taking care of how. Uh, of the objects, whatever when this uh, lying as it is, we tried to remove the collection from the cupboards and slowly and steadily we started removing the showcase in all that. So at times we had taken care of our fire department because they are very much uh, uh, helpful and they are the important persons who can take of, uh, care of the object or person much better than uh, we as a curator. So we had taken their help and with their help, we could survive this 18th uh, century collection. These are uh, our staff who are taking care and we are working and re removing the silt of the water, uh, river, which came to the museum. So these are few photographs which highlights before and after, that is about the museum, how it was and then how it looked like. Uh, to bring uh, the museum was closed from 8th of August and we reopened the museum on 2nd of October. So after 42 days only, the museum was back open, brought open back to the public. So these are few collections. In the year uh, the 2007, Surat Municipal Corporation uh, thought of developing a science center. And that time it was decided that since the museum has faced periodic floods of River Tapi and each time lost significant numbers of delicate objects, considering these major problems and the need of a science center in the city, the museum was shifted to science center on 29th November 2009. And it was inaugurated by the then Chief Minister of Gujarat and present Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi. The museum has uh, lots of publications. 
that is from the year uh, 1990 till date. Uh, shifting of Sardar Vallabh Patel Museum collection to four. Uh, in, uh, in the year 2019, on accession ongoing restoration work in rest of the building of the fort, it was decided uh, that if we shift historical collection of the Sardar Vallabh Patel Museum to the historical fort of Surat, both will complement each other naturally and the visitors will get chance to learn about various history, art, heritage, culture and architecture all at one place. So in the year 2020, in view to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic, the fort was closed for public visit and subsequently the restoration work is kept ongoing till now in full swing. Since then, the planning and display of various galleries based on the subject and on various themes of museum collection was carried out. And now the display and development work of these galleries is completed. These are the fort architectural facades, how presently it looks like. Uh, the, how the collection has been displayed in all these buildings. So these are the few again, how the building looked like, what it was before, and what all things are being displayed in these galleries is highlighted here. Since we have very good collection of miniature paintings, we have a good collection of inscriptions on copper plates. We have many scripts also, uh, which are on display. Other than that, Surat Municipal Corporation has very good collection of arms and armory. Uh, this particular gallery highlights the city museum, the Mughal gallery, uh, gallery of coins and currency. Uh, since uh, this particular fort was occupied uh, by, might have occupied by uh, the Dutch and the Britishers, so we have developed two lifestyle rooms uh, that is of Dutch period and the British period. This is the British lifestyle room we have, since it was a trading center from 16th to 18th century, we have large number of porcelain collection uh, from Japan, from China, and from London. So all this uh, collection is on display. This is Sally Fort Tower before and after restoration. And here we have displayed sculptures. Uh, since uh, Surat was visited by a large number of travelers during the ancient period, we have developed a traveler's gallery. Uh, Indian, we have very good collection of Indian bronzes and Indian handicraft gallery. So these are few examples of uh, copper bronzes, South Indian copper bronzes, Himalayan bronzes, and Gujarati handicraft gallery. This is a water tower, A5 boot, uh, wherein we have displayed uh, philately and water storage boot, pots gallery. This is again A5 building. Uh, and uh, here we have displayed wood art gallery and ivory gallery. It is said that teak wood from Burma, seasoned teak wood from Burma used to come to Surat. Uh, basically, craftsmen were large, large number of craftsmen were residing at Surat. So, craft work was done at Surat and then it was re exported to other countries. So, these are best examples of woodwork at Surat. Same wise, ivory from South India, raw material of ivory used to come to Surat. It was crafted here and again it was exported to Far East and other countries. Uh, we have uh, created a small space of conference room. Uh, we have a Surat reference library and an art gallery. So that whosoever comes and if they want to do uh, some kind of small meet, they can do it at conference room. And if somebody wants to exhibit, we have, a, uh, we have developed a space uh, to develop, uh, to create an art space. So for particularly for uh, local artists, 
this type of uh, structure was created. These are a few elements of the fort. Uh, this is one of the example like how a single object can be studied. So I have just uh, given an example of Kalantak Shiva and it is a multidisciplinary approach in studying museum object. So by, one can do a mythological study, one can do a craftsmanship, art history, historian can study based on the art history type, mythological study can be also done, historical study can be also done, conservation science can be also done, and iconographic study, performing art study, and apparel and well study likewise can be done. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir, I have completed. The presentation is... Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Bhavani, madam. You have given a vivid picture of the Fort and uh, Sardar Wallabai Hotel Museum. Really, we got a heritage, like a heritage work. So even in, I'm in Chennai, but I got the feeling that I have, as if I have visited the place, and it was a lively, lively session. And of course, uh, there are some, uh, you know, in your, uh, in your slide, you have mentioned that the Tuklats and Mughals, the period was, you have mentioned that there is 18th century. I think there was some mistake. I think that must be due to a typographical error. I'll just and, uh, Actually, you mentioned that there was 18th century, but it was in 12th or 13th century only. 13th century. Until, yes. until 12th century, it was ruled by Hindu rulers, and thereafter, yes. Uh, it was ruled by Tukluk and uh, Mughal dynasties. Yes. And, uh, but the thrust for that uh, Muslim rulers, you know, it was not uh, clearly mentioned. I think there must be some evidence, but you have given mostly thrust on the Dutch period and British period only. Yes. And uh, uh, it's a very uh, lively session. And uh, it is open to the uh, participants to ask questions. Yes. Sir. Any See, questions? Yeah, basically, uh, since I have taken it, up, taken it up to British period only, because after British period, the same building was used as offices. Yes. Uh, the Nawabs never entered to this fort. Oh, we don't you. have any records. And uh, we, after the Britishers, because yeah. during British time also majority, post, majority portion of the fort was used to keep the records. Yeah. After that, the same building was during Nawab period also. Oh. used uh, as a record office only sir. and as you mentioned that is the uh, flood prone area because in 2006 uh, you have meticulously worked and restored of, of 98 percent of the documents and yes. before uh, even before there was a flood but at that time the facility was not that much so most probably the records might have uh, depleted or uh, discarded due to uh, oh. the impact of the flood and uh, it's a lively session, ma'am. Really, we indebted to you for giving a very nice uh, talk on this topic. And uh, yeah. thank you very much on behalf of the organizer. Yeah. Actually, uh, yes, Professor Skant Kumar uh, sir is organizing this uh, uh, webinar for 10 days. And uh, he has meticulously worked on uh, uh, conducting this program very effective manner and the themes also very useful and uh, it is very useful to the students but many of the students are not utilizing and these are the uh, topics which will be useful for the next generation research scholars to explore more on this area and thank you very much uh, to the chairperson and the speaker yes, sir. I just one question from uh, Krishnan sir sir please ma'am question from it was a nice talk and we could understand how a museum can be developed from uh, from a dilapidated dilapidated condition to a uh, to a recent one yeah. like which you made it. That is great, sir. great, madam. Very good. I do appreciate your efforts. 
to bring that museum in a uh, modern modern shape. Thank you. Thank you. Since it's associated with uh, uh, Surat Municipal Corporation and uh, the museum, uh, she knows each and every part of that museum and fort. From her uh, yeah. presentation, we can understand that this is uh, very much involved in the restoration of the fort as well as preserving the artifacts. And uh, uh, I think she is responsible for increasing the gallery from 3 to 35. I think you have 35 galleries, right now? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, 35 yes, galleries sir. and uh, artificates also. She is responsible for computerizing all the more than 15,000 artificates. Yes, and uh, these are all uh, com uh, computerized. And the administration was totally revamped. So now they are maintaining the visitors, vis uh, vis uh, visitors uh, number of visitors ledger and the no, number of uh, no. visitors, everything. And once again, on behalf of the organizer, I thank you very much, ma'am, and thank you, participants. Thank you. Yes, ji, आप कुछ कहना चाहते हैं? सूरत से हैं आप? हाँ. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. Alkesh ji, कुछ कहना चाहते हैं सूरत के बारे में? सूरत. सूरत का Sure, sure. Sure, sir. Thanks for your invitation. You come to Chennai. Ah, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Peer Muhammad Saab, our co chair the session, and uh, uh, Madam Bhavani uh, Mahida, Madam, give a nice talk on Surat, Holt, uh, 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 Trade Center of India, a famous trade center of India, and uh, a sign building. Uh, Gujarat Holt, have a Surat Holt. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you. Thank you. Oh. Sir, I am thankful to you and particularly to Alkesh who has helped me in coming to this webinar. Otherwise, I would have not known, sir. So, thanks yeah. a lot to uh, the whole team, sir, for doing okay. such a good uh, webinar for all these long days, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Bhavi. Uh, my my, my yeah. we, we will notice. Thank you, Mr. Ji, to bring us, us, us together yes, after a long time of like yes, sir. more than 40 years. Yeah. We were in school. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we were the classmates. Uh, okay. Now, now, next talk. Eminent speaker, Dr. Isha Prashad, visiting faculty center for Liberal Arts, Symbiosis College of Art and Symbiosis International Deemed University, Pune. Chairperson of the session is Dr. Prabodh Sirwalkar, Assistant Professor, Department of Ancient History and Archaeology, Deccan PG College, PG College and Research Institute, deemed to be University, Pune, and co-chairperson Dr. Ganvir, Ganvir, Assistant Professor, Ancient Indian History and Archaeology, Deccan PG College, Research Institute, Pune. Welcome all of you, sir. And I am requesting to Dr. Prabhos, sir, please share the session and uh, uh, Dr. Ganvir, sir, co-chair the session and uh, introduce our eminent speaker, Dr. Isha Prashad. Dr. Prabhos. Thank you very much, sir. And at the outset, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to be part of this very valuable webinar, which is happening over a few, year, few, month, uh, few days. And uh, I, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Isha Prasad. So she has been a student of Deccan College. Uh, she completed her uh, master's degree from archaeology department and then her PhD uh, from the same department. And uh, over the years, she has worked on Chalcolithic cultures and Harappan culture. So specifically, she worked on Kaitha, then she worked on Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture in Rajasthan for her PhD. Apart from that, uh, she is uh, teaching in two different universities. That is basically Center for Liberal Arts, the Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, and Symbiosis School of Liberal Arts, Symbiosis International uh, Deem University. Uh, where she's teaching archaeology and anthropology for last six years 
then apart from that, uh, she has uh, participated in different excavations in different capacities uh, of like Pachamta, then Jawasiya, uh, Kotara Badli, Chirand. She has participated on these excavations. Uh, she has published uh, research articles in national and international journals, as well as she has presented uh, many research papers in international and national conferences. Uh, she has published one book, uh, then uh, she has published uh, chapters in the edited volumes and research papers in uh, different journals. Uh, like uh, for her PhD, she worked on the Ganeshwar Jodhpura Chalkolithic culture. And after her PhD, she is continuing that area and she is working in Sikar and Junjunu area of Rajasthan to understand this Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture in a better or holistic way. And for her work and proposal, she has awarded Homi Baba Fellowship, which is considered to be a very prestigious uh, fellowship in archaeology as well. So she has received that and through that Homi Baba Fellowship, she is continuing her uh, PhD work and she is continuing the uh, explorations in that area to understand this particular culture. So without wasting much of time, uh, now I would request Dr. Isha Prasad uh, to present her paper. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that introduction. Um, if you could just give me a minute to share my screen and then start with that. Uh, can you all see the screen? Yes, do you see? Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Isha Prasad, and I'll be talking on the topic reappraisal of the Ganeshwar Jodhpura Chalcolithic culture. Uh, when we talk about the Chalcolithic culture of the Ganeshwar Jodhpura, it's basically located in the state, in the present state of Rajasthan. And within Rajasthan, the major, majority of the sites are mostly located in the northeastern section of Rajasthan, right? Till date, we have more than 500 sites uh, that has been reported as belonging to the Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture. However, we only have two sites, that is the site of Ganeshwar and the site of Jodhpura that has been excavated as of this culture. Uh, chronologically, we have been able to date the whole culture as somewhere around belonging to the third millennium BCE, with dates being somewhere around 2750 to 2000 BCE. Uh, when we look at the different nomenclatures or how the Ganesha Jodhpura culture has been named and termed uh, for the past few years, there has been different ways in which the scholars have basically tried to uh, name the culture depending on which site was excavated and the kind of data that has been found from these different sites. So the first site that was excavated of this particular culture was the Jodhpura culture. And because a completely new uh, cultural assemblage was found at the site, the culture was first named as the Jodhpura culture. Later on, we have uh, the site of Ganeshwar being excavated after which the culture was named as the Ganeshwar culture. However, because of the similarities between the material culture of Ganeshwar and Jodhpura. It was later on termed as either the Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture or the Ganeshwar Jodhpura cultural complex. However, these nomenclatures all mostly talk about a culture complex, a, a culture which is spread across the northeastern portion of Rajasthan and specifically in the districts such as Junjuno, Seeker, and Jaipur. So out of these 500 sites, approximately two, 425 sites is something which is only located in these three districts of uh, Rajasthan. However, there are some number of sites which is present even in the Bilwada region, the Tong, Savai Madhapur, Bharatpur, and one site in Jaisalmer region in itself. Again, coming back to the chronology of it, so this map basically shows the site location of Ganeshwar and Jodhpura. And Around it, we have the other Chalcolithic sites, such as the Chalcolithic culture of Ahar, which was contemporary to it, the Chalcolithic culture of Kayatha in Madhya Pradesh, which was also contemporary to it. And towards the north, we have the Harappan civilization with sites such as Harappa, Kalibanga, Farmana, and Mohanjadaro, which were again contemporary to the Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture. Now, Dr. Uh, Dr. Isha, your slides are not going ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, now it is visible. Okay, so I won't go on the screen. Isha, okay, can so you present it on a, on a slideshow mode so that everybody can see, please? Okay. Uh, so if... 
Sir, can you let me know if the slides are moving now? Yes, I would let you know, but you first put on the slideshow mode. Okay. On. This is a slideshow only, so I put it on full All screen. All the way on the top, you will see a slideshow mode. And start from present slide. Good. Yeah, Which you... version of Windows you are using? Okay, so can you all see the slide now? No. Okay, one second. Okay, slide okay. Okay. right bottom corner may it minus ka sign or so tick pass while I can pick click here. Ah, yeah, yeah, see. Okay, now it's on full screen. No, still not visible. No, I think I think don't full screen. Okay. Not that one. That correction mode. The last cup like one. Yeah. So I did that, but uh, uh, I ah, think it's not. Push it. के ऊपर रखे क्लिक कीजिए ये अपने आप हो जाएगा फुल स्क्रीन मोड पे जो प्रवोस सर चलने दे अभी भीड़ भीड़ तो रहा है हेलो यार वही बेटर डोंट डू फुल स्क्रीन जस्ट इंक्रीज द साइज ऑफ द लाइट फ्रॉम द राइट साइड बटन यस Sometimes it happens that you know when you share the screen, it doesn't go ahead in the link. Okay, so I'll continue like this. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay. Ah, uh, so this was what I had shown till now: the extent of the Ganesha Jodhpura culture in the northeastern portion of Rajasthan. With maximum concentration in Jyoti Musi Garam Jaipur district, and the other map that basically shows the Ganeshwar, the site location of Ganeshwar and Jodhpura, and along with it, towards the north we have Kalibanga, Harappa, Farman, and Mohenjo-daro, which are contemporary to Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture, and towards the south we have Ahar and Kayatha, which again were cultures which are contemporary to Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture. Now, if you talk about the culture in itself, this culture was in the first place. Uh, identified in the early 1970s after excavations at Jodhpur and Ganeshwar. However, what we have also noticed is that when we look at this culture, it is at a very incipient stage of study because we do not really know a lot of details about this culture. As far as the ceramic assemblage, which is one of the most important aspects of the archaeological material, what we have seen is that uh, the ceramic assemblage has been very haphazardly described through the years without any proper connotation towards what is it that really classify the whole cultural assemblage as a whole. A loosely used terminology that was given by the excavators early on is basically OCP or ochre colored pottery, which is a natural occurrence uh, rather than a characteristic of the pottery itself. However, one aspect that has been really worked upon when we look at the Ganesha Jodhpura culture is basically the copper artifacts. So the site location of Ganeshwar on one hand and Jodhpura on the other basically shows that these sites are very closely located to the Khetri copper belt. And because of this close proximity, a lot of different kinds of copper artifacts were basically recovered from these different excavations. Now, the presence of these copper artifacts along with the very strategic location of the site of Ganeshwar and Jodhpura, that is they being very close to the Khetri mine, basically led to the conclusion that these sites and the culture in itself is uh, a copper producing come copper manufacturing culture, which were then mining the copper from the Khetri belt itself, producing it and to some extent were in trade contacts with all the contemporary 
uh, civilizations and cultures at that particular point of time. Other material culture were also found from the excavations at Jodhpur and Ganeshwar, which mostly were limited to some semi-precious stones, uh, some kind of structural evidences, and some uh, uh, agricultural tools such as pestles and mules. The structural evidences, again, were very limited in nature, which mostly talked about the presence of uh, semi-permanent structures such as houses and huts. In some cases, there's a stone embankment in the case of Jodhpura. However, again, not much evidence as far as even the micro-settlement pattern or the structural evidence is concerned was uh, published or known about this culture. Uh, the one area in which a lot of work has been done in this culture is the exploration and to understand the settlement pattern. And based on the exploration, different districts, different uh, tehsils were identified wherein, wherein the Ganesha Jodhpura culture uh, sites has been reported. So uh, Rizvi, Raghubans, Kumar, all of them in their PhD uh, thesis has basically reported more than 500 sites as belonging to the Ganesha Jodhpura culture. Now, uh, recently uh, in 2013, RN Singh, along with a team from Cambridge, re excavated the site of Ganesha, wherein they basically put in three trenches uh, on the site itself. So, the red dots that you see here are basically the uh, places wherein the trenches were. Uh, put the location of the trenches in itself. And out of these, only one trench they could excavate up to the natural soil. The other two trenches they could not excavate completely because they could they had uh, hit the rock belt, uh, the rocky area as soon as they started excavating it. So because of the problems that has been uh, associated with the Ganesha Jodhpura culture, specifically the idea of not having a specific character as far as the ceramic or the cultural material is concerned, I looked at this recent excavation to understand the Ganesha Jodhpura culture in a better light. Now from the excavation in total, 10 layers were mostly identified, out of which the layer 1 to layer 6 were identified as layers belonging to the Chalcolithic Ganesha Jodhpura culture. From layer 7 to layer 10, we have mostly microlithic assemblage that is present in there. Now, from these three different trenches uh, and the first phase, I started out an analysis of the pottery from the site of Ganesha in itself to understand what is it that characterizes the Ganesha pottery. So the whole assemblage of the Ganesha uh, pottery has was could be basically divided into three different wares. We have the red ware, the Ganesha reserve slip ware, and the gray ware. Now, all of these three ware is mostly characterized on the basis of either the technique through which it has been made or the section or the firing in itself. So red ware has then been further subdivided into different varieties based on the kind of surface treatment that has been given on the ware itself. So the different varieties that has been uh, recorded from the site of Ganesha is the black on red, bichrome effect, bichrome red slip, red untreated and wash variety. The Ganesha reserve slip pair has not been further subdivided into any variety. And then we have the gray wear, which has been divided into slipped and painted variety. Now I'll quickly go through what the characteristic features of these different pottery in itself is. So the first is the black on red variety, which has a red color slip on the exterior up to throat on the interior in case of closed vessels, a complete slip on the exterior and interior in case of open vessels. And over this red color slip, we have paintings that has been done in black color. However, what is interesting is that along with the paintings, there is a lot of different kinds of incisions that has also been made on the pottery itself. And these incisions has been done in various permutations and combinations, which basically goes on to say that it is not just one kind of geometric design that has been used in order to incise the pot, but different kind of geometric designs has been combined together to incise the pot. And along with this, we have different uh, painting designs that is also present on the portraits itself. Uh, the next variety in the red ware is the bichrome variety, which is very similar to the Sochi style of bichrome variety, wherein a red color slip has been done, over which paintings in black has been done, and between the black paintings, infilling of white is something that has been carried out. However, this kind of variety, the bichrome variety in itself, is not very prevalent at the site, and at the site itself, we just found one particular shirt of this variety. Followed by that, something which is very interesting and unique to the site of Ganeshwar is the bichrome effect variety. In here, what they have done is that uh, 
they have used the red color both as a slip and as a pink along with the red color they have used a uh, black color pink and there are certain portions of the pot that has been left either unslipped or unpainted which basically shows the uh, surface color of the pot itself so once you look at the pottery or a piece of pot you will find that there are three different distinct colors the red color the black and the un uh, the the portion that wherein there is no treatment that has been done however since there are only two colors that has been used i'm calling them as a bichrome effect that it gives you the effect of three different colors yet there is the use of these two colors in itself as was seen with the black on red variety even in the bichrome effect variety what is again very unique is that these different permutations and combinations the red the red the black and the uh, uh, untreated surface is again combined with the presence of different kind of incised designs on the surface of the pottery itself. Uh, this is the this is the only example of a naturalistic motive wherein uh, using incised designs, what we see is that an animal has been made. So this is the face of the animal, the horns, the leg of the animal. So that, that's the only design of a naturalistic painting that was present at uh, Ganeshwar. Then we have red slip where or uh, the red slip variety wherein the use of red color slip uh, is predominant and along with the red color slip another aspect of which is which is present is again the use of different kind of incisions uh, made on the pottery itself. Uh, these are all different examples of the red slip variety. Now lastly one another unique aspect of the Ganeshwar uh, pottery is basically what I call as the Ganesha reserve slipware. Now, reserve slipware is something which is not uh, unique. We already know of reserve slipware occurring uh, within the Harappan context. We know of the reserve slipware occurring within the Ahar context, right? But in the case of Ganesha, the reserve slipware is a little different. In case of both Ahar and Harappa, what we see is that there is a distinct use of two different slips. So a slip is first put, it is let to dry. Once the first slip is dried, a second slip is put on top of it and it is scooped out, which basically uh, uh, reveals the lower slip. So that's the technique that has been used by both the Ahar culture and the Harappan civilization. Now the people at Ganeshwar used a similar technique, but the way that this whole reserve slip was executed was very different from what has been done either in the case of Ahar or in the case of the Harappan civilization. Now at Ganeshwar, what we can see is that instead of using two different slip, what the people were doing is that they had a red color slip that they had put first. And over the slip, they had these broad black color bands uh, that were uh, put over it right now once they had put the black color band they would scoop out the band so the red color slip in itself is something that was visible uh, underneath it so even though the technique was similar what the way or the how the execution of the Ganesha reserve slipper run basically makes it very uh, different from all other reserve slippers that we have seen in the other contemporary cultures. Now if you look at uh, the whole assemblage of the Ganeshwar uh, culture what we see is that there is a similarity in which there in which the designs has been made but there is not a lot of different kind of shapes that has been made by the people there are predominantly two shapes that is found throughout the whole assemblage on one hand we have these globular pots that is found right from layer six to layer one on the other hand the most important or the characteristic feature that we can talk about in the case of the Ganesha Jodhpura culture are these carinated pieces Again, these carinated basins is something which starts right from the lowest level, that is layer six, and continues throughout the layers, that is still layer one. Apart from these, there is hardly any shape that has been introduced uh, from one layer to the other. So as far as the shapes are concerned, that is something which continues through all the period. Even when we talk about the different wares and varieties, there is a continuity of these wares occurring right from layer 6 to layer 1. Uh, the only difference is that of the bichrome effect variety, which is present in the lower layer, in the lower layer. Uh, layers that is from layer six to layer four. Uh, in layer one, two, and three, the bichrome effect variety is something which is completely absent. Now, uh, 
Uh, so we have the bikram effect variety on one hand we have the ganeshwar reserve slipware on the other hand uh, the carinated basins which makes the whole pottery assemblage pretty unique and then of course we have the different kind of motors that has been made on the ganeshwar pottery so these motors specifically the whole combination of incised along with the painted motifs basically is one of uh, is another characteristic feature of the ganeshwar pottery in itself and looking at the different permutations and combinations that has been made on the ganeshwar pottery i have divided the whole motif assemblage into three different parts we have the simple or the singular motif we have complex or composite motif and the naturalistic motif uh, the simple or singular motif is basically any kind of geometric designs that we see so in in so for example the horizontal lines oblique lines wavy lines uh simple dots so these different kinds of motifs that has occurred that has been occurring uh basically has been clubbed together as simple motif now complex or composite motif basically means that two or more simple motifs has been made together on the same pot so for example we have wavy lines along with uh Uh, along with a panel of horizontal lines or we have dots along with checkered pattern or diamonds that has been made in itself so that's the complex or composite motif what is interesting is that both the simple and complex or composite motifs has been made using not just incisions but a combination of both incisions and black paint these black paints however in most cases has been used as uh the borders or the bordering lines of these incisions but in some cases have been made independently of the incisions as well and lastly we have naturalistic motif again like i said there isn't many examples of naturalistic motif that is present uh, in the pottery of ganeshwar however the presence of an animal uh, some naturalistic some motifs which looks like plant motifs and in some cases we have what looks like a pure drop or a water drop motif has been identified from the pottery of ganeshwar now looking at the complete assemblage what we, what we can see is that this complexity of motif design specifically in terms of incisions and the use of both incisions and paint in order to decorate the pottery in itself is very very unique to the ganesha jodhpura culture now if you look at all the contemporary culture be it the kartha culture in madhya pradesh be it the ahar culture of rajasthan be it the harappan civilization all of these different cultures and civilization had this whole idea of incising and painting the pot so that was a similarity that existed between all these all these different cultures however <laughs> what sets the ganesha jodhpura culture apart is basically the complex nature of designs which also somewhere or the other talks about the idea of them trying to create an identity of their own through the pottery decorations in itself now moving forward if we look at the other aspects of the ganeshwar uh, from the pottery of ganeshwar from layer 1 2 3 and 5 we have different kinds of uh, geography marks that uh, Uh, that was found however the maximum occurrence of these graffiti marks are from layer 1 and 2 again these are mostly geometric in nature but there are some naturalistic uh, graffiti marks that is also present so for example there is this animal design that is present there is a hunting scene that is there there is a human stick figurine that is uh, present as in the form of uh, graffiti marks now graffiti marks becomes really important because that also helps us understand trade patterns that also helps us understand any kind of connection or cultural connectivity that was present between contemporary cultures and one of the biggest problems that was there when we talk about the ganeshwar jodhpura culture is to have an actual date of the ganeshwar jodhpura pura culture so in order to relatively date the culture and the site what i did was i carried out a comparative analysis between the graffiti that is found from the site of ganeshwar with sites such as kalibanga mohenjodaro harappan farmana because all of these sites have been dated on the basis of either radiocarbon dates or other absolute dating methods and all in all more than 60% of the graffiti that was found from the site of ganeshwar had similarities with these other with one of these other sites uh, of the harappan civilization now based on these comparison what we could see is that all of these graffiti could be compared with the mature phase that is in at kalibanga period to mohenjodaro harappan farmana the mature phase of the harappan civilization and the 
dating of these sites is mostly from 2500 or 2600 BCE to 2100 BCE. Now, based on these comparisons, I came to the conclusion that at least the first and the second layer, wherein a uh, majority of the graffiti is coming from, and which is comparable to the other mature Harappan sites, the layer one and layer two in itself could be dated to around 2600 and 2100 BCE. And interestingly, this is not the only uh, aspect of the different periods that is present at the site of Ganeshwar. One aspect that is the bikram effect is completely absent in layer one and layer two and starts occurring in layer, from layer three to layer six. Graffiti is present in layer one and layer two, which is con and is contemporary to the mature Harappan phase and is almost absent from layer three onwards. Again, the Ganeshwar reserve slipware that we have been talking about has been found from the site of Farmana. There were two shirts that have been found from, from, from the site of Farmana, which goes on to say, that in the mature phase of the uh, of the Harappan and the Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture, what we see is that there were either trade contacts uh, between Haryana on one side, on one side, along with Rajasthan on the other hand. Then there is the S-shaped jars that was found uh, in layer two, which is again a very characteristic feature of the mature Harappan phase at uh, uh, mature Harappan phase uh, in general in itself. Now, based on all these different comparative methods and similarities in the ceramic assemblage, I then divided the whole of the uh, Ganeshwar pottery and the site of Ganeshwar itself into two periods, that is period one, which is an early phase, and period two, which is a mature phase. Period two was easily... Uh, dated to 2600 to 2100 BCE based on the comparative analysis. However, when we talk about period one, that is something which can at right now we can say that it is prior to 2600 BCE, but we cannot really say as to when is it that that period would have begun in the first phase. Uh, moving forward, now when we look at the distribution of the Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture, like I said, that the maximum number of sites is mostly found in the Seeker, Junjunu, and Jaipur districts. And even out of these three districts, it is the Seeker districts which has such a large concentration of sites. So in the last two years, I took up a project to understand the settlement pattern of the Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture and specifically to see as to why there are so many sites in such a small area that is uh, the seeker and within the seeker, the Neemka Thana Tehsil in itself. So I did a village to village survey. Uh, which included field walking, survey of the sites, uh, the documentation of stratas, a relative dating, and to understand the settlement pattern. But the main objective of the whole survey that I carried out was to understand, A, of course, uh, the reason for the huge number of sites. Uh, second, to categorize the whole sites into an early and mature phase of the Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture. And then mostly to reconfirm the cultural affiliation of the sites to ascertain if they really belong to the Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture in itself. And then one aspect that has been missing from all the earlier works is basically the relationship with the ecology and the resources that is available uh, in the vicinity in itself, because that basically helps us understand the settlement pattern. So I carried out a village to village survey in 184 villages and within the 184 villages around 79 uh, sites were documented out of these 79 sites 51 sites were something that has been previously documented and approximately 20 25 sites are newly discovered sites in itself. Now, the exploration showed that there are mostly four different ecological zones that has been utilized by the people in the Neemka Thana Tehsil or Seeker district. The first is basically the top of uh, the mountain ranges, right? So in those, in that case, there is one side, which is a rock art site, in, uh, wherein on one hand, we have the humped bull uh, figurine that was found painted in red ochre, and on the other hand, something uh, of a circular nature that was found at the painting in itself. Uh, then we have other sites which is found at the top of the hills, uh, wherein mostly uh, these sites are medieval in nature with uh, bastions and the structures very well preserved till date. Uh, then majority of the sites that we had are basically on the Piedamon surface or on the slopes of the uh, mountains. Now an interesting aspect or feature of these different sites that were found on the Piedamon surface is that a lot of these sites have evidence of ash deposit present on the site itself. So most of the sites on the Piedamon either has evidence of ash deposits or in some cases we have direct evidence of iron slag, uh, huge heaps of iron slag being present on the surface of the site itself. 
then the other area that was occupied by the people are basically sites that is located on the sand dunes now these sites are uh, not very huge or not very uh, large these are uh, at match sites that uh, that were occupied by nomadic people guessing by the amount of cultural material that has been actually found on the site itself and then we have sites on the agricultural plains that is the flatlands and not either on sand dunes or on the hilly terrains of the aravallis in itself now one interesting aspect that we also notice along uh, with these is that most of the sites were actually located very close to different water resources so these water resources could either be uh, the river systems or that is present in the area or the uh, natural lakes or uh, or the natural lakes that is basically present in the area in itself. Uh, now, based on the field walking, different kind of material culture was also collected from uh, this area. And one uh, aspect of it which helped us identify or link these sites with a culture is basically the ceramic assemblage. Now, the ceramic assemblage that we again found, of course, there was a black on red uh, where we have uh, the red slip where that is present in huge quantity within the red slip where and uh, the black on red variety we have globular pods we have basins bowls v-shaped jars pouts that is present uh, then we have these different kinds of incised pottery that again was found from a lot of different sites and then the mud applique web now, interestingly, some of these pottery might look very similar to the Ganeshwar Jodhpura pottery uh, in the sense that they are black on red pottery, in the sense that there is incisions being present in here. But if we look very closely at the rim shapes uh, that is there on these different, uh, the rim shapes of the pottery uh, from the exploration itself, what we can see is that most of these rim shapes are very early historic in nature and is very comparable to the Rang Mahal uh, pottery that has been found from the excavations at Rimmel. Now, uh, this is one aspect of it. Apart from that, different kind of antiquities, right, from copper coins uh, to horse figurines to uh, to beads of Vishnu statues, all of these were also recovered uh, from the exploration. Now, the other kind of sites that were found are mostly the medieval sites, which is found right at the top of the mountain, which gives them a very strategic position, mostly from the perspective of uh, security. And in the medieval ceramic assemblage, we have, I have basically classified the whole assemblage into mica slipped ware, uh, mica slipped painted ware, and, uh, and the micro ware. So both mica slipped and mica slipped painted ware basically has a golden or silver color mica that has been used as a slip. And over the slip, in some cases, paintings either in black or uh, red has been done. In case of bichrome, the use of a slip along with uh, the use of a mica slip along with black, red, and white color paintings is something which is uh, which has been found. Uh, in the exploration, what we also found is a is a hoard of 180 copper coins, which is mostly uh, the horsemen and bull type coins that were found from one of the villages during the exploration. Now, an interesting aspect that was seen is that through the exploration in the early uh, in the Neem Kathana Tehsil or Seeker district, there are 47 sites which has been identified as belonging to the early historic period. There are eight sites which has been identified as belonging to medieval period and 22 sites which has uh, both early historic, which is multicultural, that is they have evidence of both early historic and medieval periods. Interestingly, there wasn't, except for the site of Ganesh, where no other charcoalithic site was actually identified at the site itself. Now, if you look at the distribution or the use of different ecological zones by the people of the early historic and medieval uh, times, what we can see is that majority of the sites were actually located on the Piedmont surface or the slopes of uh, the Aravalis followed by agricultural or flat land and the least number of sites that were found were basically present in the sand dunes. Now, this basically uh, points towards a very important question as to uh, why or how is it that a problem with identification of the Ganesha Jodhpura culture site started. Now, uh, if you think about it, there are very there are similarities between uh, the Chalcolithic uh, Ganesha Jodhpura culture, the Harappan civilization and the Rang Mahal culture. So even in the first place when that site of Rang Mahal was discovered, people believed it to be a site belonging to the Harappan civilization. It was later on after the excavations that the differences specifically in the cultural material, the ceramic was observed. So uh, in 
in all probability, that was what has taken place when we are talking about the Ganesha Jodhpura sites in Rajasthan and specifically in the Neem Kathana Tese, wherein the sites which are early historic in nature has been identified or wrongly identified as Ganesha Jodhpura uh, culture sites. Uh, the other aspect that comes in here is that, okay, if they are not Ganesha Jodhpura culture sites, why is it that we have such a great number or a large number of early historic sites? Now, uh, if you all remember, I was talking about the people them on sites and the sites that are located in the slope and in there a huge number of iron slag or uh, ash deposit is something Thing that has been uh, that has been found on the surface itself. This goes on to say, and the Nimkathana region is said to be one uh, said to be the richest area in the whole of Seeker district as far as the iron content in itself is concerned. So this basically goes on to say that all of these sites were very strategically located on the Piedmont surface for the mining of iron itself or for the exploitation of the iron resources, right? And it was the use of this ecological zone. Uh, that was being taken up by the early historic people, wherein majority of the sites are in the Piedmont from the very functional aspect of exploiting iron in itself, followed by sites which are on the agricultural, all the plain lands, which could have been used for agricultural purposes. And then there are some semi-permanent sands, uh, sites that is present in the sand dunes, which could be sites that were either used for trading purposes or people by uh, the pastoral communities. So based on this, now uh, areas in the different, different areas of Seeker, I have taken up the Homi Baba Fellowship and for that, uh, different areas of Seeker will be explored in order to understand if the same uh, type or the same way in which the early historic sites have been found in the Neem Kathana Tehsil continues in the other Tehsil and also to understand the whole settlement pattern of the early historic period. Uh, that would be all. Thank you so much. Um, questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. And now to open the discussion with the library of the world. So the paper is open for discussion. If any question. Okay, Dr. Prabodh. Yes, 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 I'm here. Ah. Conclude, sir, please. So, if no questions are there, then I will conclude this session. Uh, so, the work what uh, Dr. Isha is doing is very important uh, because, you know, so far we have given so much of importance to Harappan civilization. And in these chalcolithic cultures, which are there in the form of uh, different cultures in like, you know, like Jyaneshwar Jodhpura or Ahar or Malwa or Jorwe. So we have so many different chalcolithic cultures, but they have not paid a uh, required attention. And a very haphazard work has been done so far. So with this systematic exploration, systematic research, so probably we will be able to have a better understanding of this local chalcolithic culture of Ganeshwar Jodhpura. And not only that, but then a lot of questions regarding the number of settlements, the, uh, the kind of settlement pattern, then uh, probably the interaction network with the Ahar and the Harappans. So that would give us a better understanding of proto-historic past of India, uh, rather than, you know, like uh, just uh, making the list of sites. So now we need to analyze the data so that we can have a better uh, perspective towards our ancient people and the uh, landscape archaeology and its relationship with the development and the cultural processes. So I think in that way, uh, this is a very important step forward, uh, particularly for the local chalcolithic cultures. So I congratulate uh, Dr. Isha Prasad for taking up uh, Ganeshwar Jodhpura for her research. Uh, that is a very required step, in fact, now in Indian archaeology. So. Uh, I give her all the best for her future and all the explorations. And hopefully now, instead of early historic, she gets some Ganeshwar Jodhpura sites. Uh, so that would be like, you know, the interesting part to get the actual dates from the site, because unfortunately, uh, Ganeshwar is never dated. So that is the biggest problem in Indian archaeology, in fact. 
but hopefully with the new coming up of data we might be in a better position to tackle these sort of issues in indian archaeology so thank you very much and uh, i also thank uh, uh, dr shrikant ganvir who is co-chairing this session so i am thankful to him as well and to the organizers for beautifully uh, organizing this webinar thank you very much yes sir uh, dr ganvir dr ganvir hello ah, yes sir yes sir uh, your your brief view sir so uh, thank you very much dr isha for uh, shedding a light on uh, an uh, re an re appraisal of ganeshwar uh, jodhpura culture very important regional celtic culture and as done said by uh, dr pragoti shirwarkar the chairperson of the uh, session that such studies are very important to understand basically the uh, history of uh, not only the, um, uh, the proto historic period but also the uh, to understand the different important dimensions of the psychologic uh, uh, studies which is a uh, comparatively the less uh, less studied um, uh, area as a research area as one of the less studied the research areas in the um, studying the ancient past or studying the heritage thank you very much now i um, i ask uh, to take over the uh, to the organizer sir thank you thank you sir i would like to thank mr sir for giving me this opportunity and uh, organizing such a wonderful webinar thank you sir thank you uh, dr prabod dr manvireshar and uh, dr isa for given talk and sure the session and co chair this webinar thank you all of you now next session uh, talk of a senior professor uh, of uh, uh, ancient history uh, eminent speaker professor dr kamlesh sharma formerly professor and head history tradition and culture vm open university kota rajasthan chair person professor dr pratibha pande department of history ml sukhadia university udaipur rajasthan and co chair person dr diva srivastav professor government gdc college riva mp so welcome all of you madam kamlesh sharma madam pratibha madam pratibha madam professor dr pratibha pande shayad wo abhi hai nahi rawat sir please okay so oh, welcome madam uh, professor uh, kamlesh sharma madam welcome so oh, please uh, give your talk then if uh, uh, dr pratibha madam join introduce you uh, to audience yeah Please okay sir start your talk yes सर स्क्रीन विजिबल है नहीं अभी नहीं हाँ आ रही है मैडम अभी तो आ रही है ये हाँ ये सही है आ रहा है हाँ ओके सर एंड आई आई एम वेरी थैंकफुल टू प्रोफेसर स्कंद गुप्ता स्कंद मिश्रा जी मिश्रा मैडम Uh, Mishra ji and his team for this wonderful webinar. 
and so I have a chance to give a lecture before you. और मैं चूंकि एंशियंट हिस्ट्री से हूँ लिटरेचर हूँ तो अभी आर्कियोलॉजिकल उसके बहुत सारे ये लेक्चर्स चल रहे हैं और आर्कियोलॉजी हिस्ट्री या इतिहास क्या है इतिहास से तात्पर्य है निश्चित रूप से ऐसा हुआ है इसका अध्ययन हम विभिन्न साहित्यिक एवं पुरातात्विक स्रोतों के माध्यम से किया जाता है और ऐसा नहीं है कि हम कोई लोक कथा गाथा मौखिक परंपरा या किसी को भी हम इतिहास कह सकते हैं और इतिहास को पुष्टि करने के लिए हमें विभिन्न स्रोतों पर निर्भर रहना पड़ता है और चूंकि हम हमारे पास जो हेलो शर्मा मैडम एक मिनट श्रीकांत गणवीर गणवीर साहब हैं क्या लाइन में हेलो हेलो डॉक्टर गणवीर ओके ओके मैडम चलिए शुरू करिए हाँ शुरू करिए हाँ सर ये हम चूंकि भारत में साहित्य परंपरा जो हमारी संस्कृति हमारे पास एक जो लिटरेरी हेरिटेज है वो बहुत विशाल है और इसमें हमारे जो साहित्यिक जो बहुत ही विशाल साहित्य हमारे पास है और विश्व का सबसे विशाल साहित्य जो हमारी सांस्कृतिक धरोहर है और उसी के माध्यम से हम जो साहित्य के कई ऐसे गैप्स हैं उनको हम फिलअप कर सकते हैं और बहुत सी जो अधूरी बातें हैं उनको हम पूरा कर सकते हैं तो साहित्यिक स्रोत अपने आप में या जो लिटरेरी हेरिटेज है उसको भी हम हमको जानना चाहिए और प्राचीन भारतीय इतिहास का जब हम अध्ययन करते हैं तो पुरातात्विक स्रोतों के साथ साथ सबसे पहले साहित्यिक स्रोतों का अध्ययन किया जाना चाहिए और ये साहित्यिक स्रोत हमारे पूरे बहुत विशाल साहित्य मेरे ख्याल से विश्व के किसी भी देश के पास जो हमारी जो हमारा देश है मल्टी लैंग्वेज मल्टी लैंग्वेज यहाँ पे हैं उन सब में विशाल साहित्य है संस्कृत पाली प्राकृत कन्नड़ तमिल तेलुगु सब में बहुत ही साहित्य है जिस समय बहुत सी ऐतिहासिक सूचनाएं मिलती हैं जानकारियाँ मिलती हैं और चूंकि प्राचीन भारत के इतिहास का जब हम अध्ययन करते हैं तो हमें बहुत सारी कठिनाइयाँ आती हैं और उन कठिनाइयों में ये है कि जो आक्रमणकारियों द्वारा हमारा जो बहुत सी लाइब्रेरीज थी नालंदा तक्षशिला और और एक विशाल जो स्रोत थे साहित्य के जो ग्रंथ थे वो नष्ट कर दिए गए जला दिए गए और इसके अलावा साहित्य का जो उसका अनुवाद है वो विदेशियों द्वारा किया गया मैक्स मुलर या मोनियर विलियम्स द्वारा तो वो भी प्रॉपर संस्कृत या प्रॉपर जो भाषा का वर्ड है उसका अनुवाद भी प्रॉपर सही नहीं हुआ है तो हमारे पास प्राचीन भारतीय संस्कृति या इतिहास के अध्ययन करने में थोड़ी कठिन बहुत सी कठिनाइयों का सामना करना पड़ता है क्योंकि हमारे पास स्रोत बहुत कम हैं और जो स्रोत हैं वो बिखरे हुए हैं और उन सब को बांध के इतिहास एक तथ्य निर्मित करना ये थोड़ा एक बहुत ही थोड़ा सा टफ टास्क है तो मैं जहाँ तक कहूँगी हमारे इतिहास को लिखने के लिए साहित्यिक और पुरातात्विक दो तरह के स्रोत होते हैं पुरातात्विक के अंतर्गत जैसा कि आप सभी जानते हैं पुरालेख हैं सिक्के हैं स्थापत्य विशेष हैं पुरातत्वी अन्वेषणों उत्खनन को शामिल किया जाता है और इसके अलावा आजकल नया ट्रेंड चला है कि जो मौखिक परंपराएं हैं जो हमारे वंशावलियाँ हैं लोक कथाएं हैं अनुश्रुतियाँ हैं नारशंसी है आख्यान या गाथा उनसे भी हमें जो इतिहास की काफ़ी जानकारियाँ मिलती हैं कुछ ट्राइबल गीत हैं उन सब में हमें मिलती है सबसे पहले हम आते हैं साहित्यिक स्रोतों पर साहित्यिक स्रोत चूंकि वैसे तो ये धर्म के आधार पे बांटना गलत है लेकिन फिर भी अभी एक ट्रेडिशन चला आ रहा है कि जिन ग्रंथों में जिस धर्म की ज़्यादा बात है 
उसको हम उसी कैटेगरी में रख देते हैं तो इसमें तीन तरह के एंशियंट जो ग्रंथ है उनको हम तीन कैटेगरी में बांट सकते हैं हिंदू ग्रंथ बौद्ध ग्रंथ जैन ग्रंथ और कुछ ऐतिहासिक एवं समसामयिक ग्रंथ और इसके अलावा विदेशी यात्रियों के वृत्तांत हैं और इन विदेशी यात्रियों ने भी अपनी दृष्टि से भारत को देखा यहाँ के जनजीवन के धार्मिक सामाजिक आर्थिक जीवन को देखा और उसके आधार पर उन्होंने उसका विवरण किया अब प्रश्न उठता है कि साहित्य को हम किस तरह से इतिहास का स्रोत मान सकते हैं क्योंकि कई जो साम्राज्यवादी सोच के इतिहासकारों ने ये कहा है कि नहीं प्राचीन भारतीय साहित्य तो धर्म प्रधान है उनमें धर्म की ही बातें हैं ये तो माइथोलॉजिकल ग्रंथ हैं या इनको हम इतिहास का सोर्स कैसे मान सकते हैं तो इस बारे में काफी विवादास्पद बातें कही जाती हैं लेकिन यह सही नहीं है क्योंकि बहुत सी इम्पोर्टेंट्स इंफॉर्मेशन हमें जो हमारा प्राचीन साहित्य है जो हमारी लिटरेरी हेरिटेज है उसमें मिलती हैं और चूंकि अंग्रेजों ने ये अच्छा काम किया कि जो दूसरी दुनिया को भी हमारे ग्रंथ दिखाए मैक्स मूलर व मोनियर विलियम्स जैसे बहुत से विद्वानों ने विदेशों में बैठ के संस्कृत ग्रंथों का अध्ययन किया लेकिन इसमें बहुत सी कमियां भी हैं क्योंकि इंग्लिश का अनुवाद जो प्रॉपर संस्कृत वर्ड है उसका अनुवाद सही नहीं हुआ है क्योंकि हमारे तो एक एक एक्टिविटी के लिए बहुत सारे वर्ड्स हैं और जैसे रिलीजन है या धर्म का जो प्रॉपर अनुवाद है रिलीजन वो प्रॉपर सही नहीं है क्योंकि हमारा जो धर्म है वो एक तरह से कर्तव्यों की पूरी श्रृंखला है और तो इसमें मतलब कहने का तात्पर्य ये है कि जो संस्कृत वर्ड्स हैं या जो हमारी हिंदी भाषा के वर्ड्स हैं उनके प्रॉपर अनुवाद सही नहीं हुए हैं और जो नई पीढ़ी को जो जिनको संस्कृत या फारसी जो भाषाएं नहीं आती ओरिजिनल सोर्सेस की तो उनको इंग्लिश अनुवाद से उसका थोड़ा अर्थ डिफरेंट हो जाता है तो हमें थोड़ा सा इस बात का भी ध्यान रखना चाहिए और जो हमारे हिंदू ग्रंथ हैं उनमें हम सबसे पहले वेद हैं वेद ऋग्वेद सामवेद यजुर्वेद अथर्वेद और प्राचीन काल में दो परंपराएं में दिखाई देती हैं श्रुति परंपरा और स्मृति परंपरा श्रुति परंपरा में जो मौखिक शताब्दियों तक वेद रहे वेदों की रचाएं रही उनका निर्माण किया जाता था और बाद में उनको नए कलेबर में उनको मिक्स करके कुछ समय के अनुसार से स्मृतियों में लिपिबद्ध किया गया तो कहने का तात्पर्य ये है कि जो हमारे वेद हैं जब दुनिया के देश अपने पशु चारण या अपने आरंभिक अवस्था में थे उस समय हमारे भारत में वेदों की रचाओं का निर्माण होता था और ज्ञान का जो आदि ज्ञान का स्रोत है वो वेद है और वेदों को अपरुषे कहा जाता है कि ये ईश्वर द्वारा निर्मित हैं ये सार्वभौमिक हैं ये किसी देश जाति या धर्म के नहीं हैं और ये न केवल भारत के वरण प्राचीन कालीन जो विश्व की जो संरचना थी उनकी जो समाज था भाषा था धर्म संस्कृति जो भी थी उनकी जानकारी हमें वेदों से मिलती वेद ऋग्वेद में हम देखते हैं प्राचीन रिचाए हैं और इसमें भी ऐतिहासिक जानकारी मिलती है उस समय कैसा समाज था समाज के लोग कैसे थे किस तरह से उनकी आर्थिक जीवन था उनका धार्मिक जीवन था वो प्राकृतिक शक्तियों की जो वरुण है इंद्र है जल सूर्य ऊषा इन सब की वो पूजाएं करते थे किस तरह का धर्म था इसके अलावा दशराज्य राजाओं के युद्ध की जानकारी मिलती है जिसमें सुदाश ने विजय प्राप्त की थी और सुदाश के जो गुरु थे वो वशिष्ठ थे और इसके अलावा जो दूसरा वेद आता है सामवेद है साम का अर्थ है गायन ऋग्वेद या वेदों में 
गायन को या उसके उच्चारण का बहुत महत्व दिया जाता था कि ऋचा का प्रॉपर उसका प्रोनाउंसिएशन हो उसके जो बोला जाए वो एकदम सही रहना चाहिए ये गा के भी गाया जा सकता है सामने के बहुत से जो मंत्र है ऋग्वेद से लिए गए हैं और खासतौर से यज्ञों के समय गाने जा गाए जाने वाले मंत्र इसमें मिलते हैं सामवेद के अंदर काफ़ी ऋग्वेद के भी हैं और कुछ नए मंत्र भी हैं और तीसरा जो है यजुर्वेद है और ये कर्म कांड प्रधान है इसमें यज्ञ से संबंधित यज्ञ को यज्ञ की संविदा कैसे लाएं उनको कैसे तैयार करें यज्ञ कब किया जाए कौन से वृक्षों की लकड़ियों से किया जाए ये सब उसमें डिटेल या विस्तार में हमें उसमें मिलता है यजुर्वेद में इसके बाद आता है अथर्वेद अथर्वेद को इतिहासकार थोड़ा लेटर पीरियड का मानते हैं और प्रथम तीन जो वेद हैं उनके बाद से अथर्वेद का जो कंटेंट है वो थोड़ा अलग है थोड़ा जैसे लेटर एज का उससे बोध होता है और अथर्वेद में हमें जो चीज़ें मिलती हैं वो ब्रह्म के बारे में कि ब्रह्म क्या है ईश्वर क्या है धर्म क्या है औषधि क्या है या जल से चिकित्सा योग से चिकित्सा कैसे की जा सकती है तो सूर्य से चिकित्सा कैसे की जा सकती है रोग निवारण रोगों को कैसे दूर किया जा सकता है पर्यावरण इस पर विस्तृत विवरण है और आपको ये जान के आश्चर्य होगा कि अथर्वेद का जो पृथ्वी सूत्र है पृथ्वी सूत्र में पूरी पृथ्वी की वंदना की गई है इसमें बहुत विश बहुत सारे ऐसे श्लोक हैं जिनमें पृथ्वी को माता मान के कि अहम पृथ्वी पृथ्व्या प्रजनम आकाशम पिता कि मैं पृथ्वी मेरी माँ है मैं उसे बहुत ज़्यादा नुकसान ना पहुँचाऊँ वो मुझे इतने खाने की वस्तुएं देती हैं तो मैं उसके घर में जाके बहुत ज़्यादा उसको उसको उसकी खुदाई ना करूं उसका उत्खनन ना करूं और एक तरह से पर्यावरण से रिलेटेड इकोलॉजी अथर्वेद में बहुत सारे श्लोक हैं इसके अलावा अथर्वेद में पृथ्वी की वंदना व राष्ट्रवादी विचार मिलते हैं कि पृथ्वी मेरी माँ है और मेरा देश मैं उसको बहुत मतलब बहुत इमोशनल बॉन्डिंग है धरती माँ के साथ तो वो सारे मैं अथर्वेद में मिलते हैं और इसके अलावा अथर्वेद में कुछ ऐसे मंत्र भी मिक्स हो गए हैं जैसे कि कुछ जादू टोना या कुछ विवाह संबंधी या प्रणय प्रणय गीत कुछ इस तरह से भी अथर्वेद में मिक्स हो गए हैं तो अथर्वेद में भी हमें इस तरह से बहुत सारी जानकारियां मिलती हैं और उसके बाद आते हैं उपनिषद क्योंकि जो वेद हैं उनका उनमें संहिता पहला भाग संहिता ब्राह्मण और आरण्यक हर वेद के तीन भाग हैं तो आरण्यक या उपनिषद इन उपनिषद थोड़ा अलग से है और चूंकि वेदों में यज्ञ के वातावरण को पवित्र करो यज्ञ करो घी से या और जो समुदायें से उससे वातावरण की शुद्धि करके यज्ञ को प्रमुखता दी गई है और उपनिषद में जो एक नई विचारधारा मिलती है और उसमें दार्शनिक विचार मिलते हैं कि यज्ञ संबंधी विचार कम मिलते हैं और उसमें दार्शनिक चिंतन की पराकाष्ठा है और दस उपनिषद हैं ईश के कठ प्रश्न मुंडक मांडुक के छांदो के बृहदारण्यक ऐतर तैतरी और उपनिषद शब्द उपनिषद धातु से बना है जिसका तात्पर्य है समीप और निष्कर्ष है बैठना यानी समीप बैठ कर के गुरु से या ब्रह्म से जो ज्ञान प्राप्त किया जाए गुरु से उसे हम उपनिषद कहेंगे तो इसके जो दार्शनिक विचार हैं उसमें हमें सृष्टि की रचना कैसे ये सृष्टि बनी आत्मा क्या है पुनर्जन्म क्या है क्या आत्मा का पुनर्जन्म होता है या इसी जीवन में खत्म हो जाता है शरीर मृत्यु के बाद कौन सा जीवन है जीव कैसा है जीव की क्या प्रकृति है मृत्यु क्या चीज है या ईश्वर क्या है 
तो इस तरह से दार्शनिक इन प्रश्नों के बहुत विस्तार से हमें इसमें जानकारी मिलती है और कई जो ब्राह्मण ग्रंथ हैं इनमें ऐतरेय व कौशिक की तैतरीय व शतपथ ब्राह्मणों में हमें जो प्राचीन कालीन परीक्षित राजा थे उसके बाद से परीक्षित से लेके बिंबिसार के पहले तक की घटनाओं का उल्लेख हुआ है और इसके अलावा राजाओं का अभिषेक किस तरह से किया जाता था ये जानकारी हमें मिलती है और परीक्षित को कुरुओं का राजा बताया गया है कुरु देश की समृद्धि और उसके प्रकृति चित्रण हमें इसमें मिलता है और इसके बाद आता है वेदांग साहित्य तो कई लोग कहते हैं कि लोग प्राचीन भारतीय तो ढंग से बोलना भी नहीं जानते थे उन्हें व्याकरण का ज्ञान नहीं था तो उन सब का प्रश्नों का उत्तर ये वेदांग वाला वेदांग देते हैं वेदों को सही ढंग से समझने के लिए वेदांगों की रचना हुई इनकी कुल संख्या छ है वैदिक स्वरों का शुद्ध उच्चारण आवश्यक था और शिक्षा शिक्षा वर्ल्ड ही अपने आप में विद्या का प्रतीक है कि उस समय कितना एजुकेशन डेवलप था वैदिक स्वरों के शुद्ध उच्चारण के लिए शिक्षा शास्त्र का निर्माण हुआ जैसा कि मैंने प्रारंभ में भी कहा वेदों का उच्चारण पर बहुत ध्यान दिया जाता था कि वेदों का उच्चारण शुद्ध होना चाहिए और दूसरा कल्प है कल्प का अर्थ है कर्म इसमें वो विधि और वो नियम थे और इसमें तीन तरह के इसके भाग मिलते हैं श्रोत सूत्र जिनमें यज्ञ संबंधी नियम थे श्रोत सूत्र ग्रह सूत्र थे ग्रह सूत्र में जो गृहस्थ जीवन है वो किस तरह से दैनिक लौकिक जीवन जिया जाए किस तरह से आपके इस जीवन के बाद पारलौकिक जीवन के का क्या होगा या उसके लिए क्या किया जाए जीवन में उससे संबंधित सूत्र में मिलते हैं और धर्म सूत्र में सामाजिक धार्मिक व राजनीतिक नियम हमें मिलते हैं इनमें यज्ञ विधि विधान राजनीति विधि व्यवहार सामाजिक परिवर्तन जो धीरे धीरे भारतीय समाज के जो परिवर्तन हैं वो हमें धर्म सूत्रों में दिखाई देते हैं और प्रमुख धर्म सूत्र हैं प्रमुख जो धर्म सूत्रकार हैं वो गौतम बोधायन आपस्तम व वशिष्ठ तीसरा जो भाग है व्याकरण है व्याकरण का अर्थ है भाषा को वैज्ञानिक शैली प्रदान करना व्याकरण के ग्रंथों में पाण की अष्टाध्यायी को भी ले सकते हैं जो कि एक प्रमुख ग्रंथ है और इस तरह से वेदों के साथ साथ वेदों को लिखने के लिए व्याकरण शास्त्र का भी प्राचीन काल में विकास हुआ और चौथा जो है वेदांग वो निरुक्त है निरुक्त का अर्थ है व्युत्पत्ति शास्त्र और जिसकी रचना यास्क ने की थी और इसमें जो वैदिक शब्द हैं वो कैसे रचे गए कैसे बने और किस तरह से उनका प्रयोग किया जाए इससे संबंधित विवरण पांचवा जो वेदांग है छंद है तो छंद वैदिक रचनाएं होती थी उनको छंद के द्वारा पदों को चरणों में सूत्रबद्ध किया जाता था और इस तरह से वेदों में छंद शास्त्र का विकास हो चुका था और छठा वेदांग है ज्योतिष क्योंकि प्राचीन काल से ही भारतीय ज्योतिष का प्रमुख महत्व था वो ब्रह्मांड नक्षत्रों के विषय में जानकारी करना और भविष्यवाणी करना ये सब ज्योतिष के क्षेत्र में आता था इसके बाद स्मृति ग्रंथ आते हैं स्मृति हिंदू धर्म के कानूनी ग्रंथ हैं और ये लगभग बीस हैं और जैसा कि मैंने पूर्व में बताया कि हमारे यहाँ श्रुति और स्मृति दो परंपराएं थी श्रुति तो वेदों को कहा जाता है लेकिन वेदों कुछ वेद जैसे जैसे समय बदलता गया वेदों के साथ साथ जो शोषण चेंजेज हैं जो विदेशी जातियाँ भारत भारत में आ रही थी समाहित हो रही थी उनको किस तरह से उनके लिए नियम बनाए जाए कैसे उनको समाहित किया जाए तो वो सब स्मृतियों में हमें देश काल अनुसार जो परिवर्तित विचार हैं वेदों के साथ साथ वो हमें इन्हें इसमें दिखाई देते हैं और इन्हें धर्मशास्त्र की भी संज्ञा दी गई है और आपको आश्चर्य हुआ ये जान करके कि स्मृतियाँ बहुत प्राचीन काल से गुप्त काल से भी पहले से इनका निर्माण होता रहा है और जो मानव धर्मशास्त्र जो मनु का है ग्रंथ तो बहुत प्राचीन है और इनके समय सीमा में भी बांधना बहुत मुश्किल काम है 
और अठारवी सदी तक नई नई स्मृतियां लिखी गई हैं जैसे विश्वेश्वर स्मृति उल्लेखनीय है और स्मृति ग्रंथों को धर्मशास्त्र भी कहा जाता है जैसे कभी हिंदू का हम किसी समस्या में फंस जाते हैं तो हम कहते हैं नहीं धर्मशास्त्रों में तो ऐसा लिखा नहीं है या धर्मशास्त्रों में ये लिखा है तो कहने का तात्पर्य ये है कि हिंदू समाज में जब भी कोई समस्या आए विचार अपने विचारों की को पुष्ट बनाने के लिए हम धर्मशास्त्रों की तरफ देखते हैं लेकिन ये सतही बातें करते हैं कई लोग उनको वास्तव में धर्मशास्त्रों में क्या लिखा है इसका पूरी तरह उनको पता भी नहीं है और ना वो इसको अध्ययन करने की कोशिश करते हैं जो और जैसे मनु स्मृति है मनु को पढ़ाई शायद बहुत कम लोगों ने हुए लेकिन मनु के ऊपर टीका टिप्पणी करने वाले बहुत लोग हैं जबकि मनु मनु में धर्म का एक एक आचार विचार और एक बहुत व्यापक दृष्टिकोण से मनु स्मृति में लिखा हुआ है समाज के बारे में धर्म के बारे में राजनीति के बारे में और मनु को विश्व का प्रथम कानून निर्माता कहा जा सकता है क्योंकि जब समाज में क्योंकि कुछ सामाजिक नियम होते हैं कुछ कानून बनाने पड़ते हैं व्यवस्था बनाने के लिए तो मनु हिंदू समाज का प्रथम लॉ गिवर है और इसका काल मैंने निर्धारित करने की चेष्टा की है ये प्रोफेसर पी वी काणे के हिसाब से लेकिन चूंकि हमारे तो साहित्य बहुत ही पुराना है इसका बहुत दुष्कर कार्य है कि इनको हम शताब्दियों में बांधें मनु के बाद आती है याग वाला किस्मती याग वाला किस मनु के अंदर जैसा कि मैं बताऊं समाज के कानून के अलावा कानून का पूरा क्लासिफिकेशन है कि आप समाज का जो व्यवहार है किस तरह से रिलेशंस होंगे किस तरह से समाज होगा परिवार होगा वो सारी डिटेल पूरे अठारह अध्यायों में पूरा विधि का वर्गीकरण किया किया गया है पूरा और उसके बाद यागवलक स्मृति आती है यागवलक स्मृति में यागवलक को थोड़ा सा प्रोग्रेसिव माना जाता है कि इन्होंने जो मनु के बाद जो समाज में जो जो चेंजेज आए उस हिसाब से थोड़े चेंजेज जिसमें यागवलक स्मृति में मिलते हैं और ये बहुत ही वैज्ञानिक तरीके से लिखा गया एक ग्रंथ है और यागवलक स्मृति को जो माता के या वोमेंस के जो प्रॉपर्टी राइट्स हैं उस हिसाब से भी महत्वपूर्ण माना जाता है और याग्वलक की जो मिताक्षरा टीका है पूरा हिंदू जो लॉ है पूरा उसी पे बेस्ड है तो इस तरह से ये दोनों वर्तमान हिंदू विधि के स्रोत हैं इनमें धर्म विधि आचार प्रायश्चित सैन्य राज धर्म पर विवरण है विधि का विवरण में न्याय व्यवस्था का भी विवरण है पूरा दोनों में और इसके बाद नारद स्मृति आती है नारद स्मृति में जो न्याय व्यवस्था कानून व्यवस्था समाज में किस तरह से चेंजेज हैं वो सारे इस इसमें मिलती है ऐसे ही पाराशर स्मृति में भी उस समय के धर्म समाज आदि का वर्णन है जो चार वर्ण है वर्णाश्रम व्यवस्था है या जो संस्कार किस तरह से किए जाएं वो सब बाराशर स्मृति में मिलता है और बृहस्पति स्मृति में पूरा न्याय न्यायिक व्यवस्था कि किस तरह से प्राचीन काल में प्लेंट वो लिखी जाती थी किस तरह से न्यायिक प्रक्रिया चलती थी और शासन तैयार होते थे और किस तरह से न्याय ज्यूटी शैली का बहुत डिटेल इसमें बृहस्पति स्मृति में बड़ा सिस्टमेटिक तरीके से इसमें विवरण तो जब प्राचीन भारतीय न्याय या समाज या धर्म की समाज की अध्ययन करना हो तो हम इन ग्रंथों का उपयोग कर सकते इसके बाद आती है कात्यायन स्मृति कात्यायन स्मृति उसमें जो जैसा कि अभी अभिलेखों की बात चली तो कात्यायन स्मृति में हमें जयपत्र या शासन पत्रों का उल्लेख मिलता है कि जो निर्णय दिए जाते थे या किसी राजा के बारे में तो वो उस तरह के अभिलेख या लिखे हुए वो घोषणा राज्य द्वारा लिखे जाते थे इसके बाद देवल स्मृति काफी लेटर पीरियड की है पूर्व मध्यकालीन की 
नारद बृहस्पति व कात्यायन को स्मृतियां कात्यायन की स्मृतियां प्राचीन न्याय व्यवस्था व विधि पर प्रकाश डालती हैं स्त्रियों के सांपत्तिक अधिकारों स्त्रीधन की विवेचना और पूरा कात्यायन स्मृति में तो ये भी लिखा है कि स्त्री धन के अंतर्गत क्या क्या आएगा और वो स्त्री धन किसकी संपत्ति रहेगी और वो स्त्री का ही विवाह के बाद वो स्त्री का ही माना जाता था तो इस बारे में डिटेल कात्यायन स्मृति में मिलता है और जो गिल्स थे प्राचीन काल में व्यापारिक जो संघ होते थे उनको किस तरह से नियम उनके रहते थे इस बारे में विस्तृत सारी की सारी स्मृतियों में विस्तृत नियम मिलते हैं जो व्यापारिक साझेदारी होती थी कि कब उनमें आपस में फूट हो जाए तो किसको कितना जुर्माना देना पड़ेगा या उसको कौन सा यदि कोई धोखाधड़ी करे व्यापार में या पैसा ना दे या कुछ भी वो सारी डिटेल इसमें तीनों इन तीनों चारों पांचों स्मृतियों में बहुत उससे मिलती है डिटेल उसका विवरण है इसके बाद महाकाव्य है महाकाव्य हमारे जो भारतीय समाज या भारतीय इतिहास में दो ही महाकाव्य सबसे ज्यादा प्रमुख माने जाते हैं वाल्मीकि रचित रामायण व वेद व्यास और हिंदू संस्कृति के ये दो ही महान ग्रंथ हैं जो यहाँ की संस्कृति के जो मूल्य हैं जो धारणाएं हैं जो विश्वास हैं वो पूरे जो दर्शन है अध्यात्म है समाज राजनीति धर्म सब इसमें मिलता है और महाभारत तो बहुत ही विशाल ग्रंथ है और इनको ऐतिहासिक ग्रंथ माना गया है और इसके अलावा जो प्राचीन जातियाँ थी शक यवन हून पारसी जातियाँ वो सब का उल्लेख इन दोनों ग्रंथों में है और किस तरह से भारतीय समाज की महानता देखिए कि ये बाहर से विदेशियों को आने आने को भी हम उनको अपने अंदर समाहित कर लेते थे हम उनको अपने समाज में स्थान देते थे और उनको उनके साथ सामंजस्यपूर्ण व्यवहार करते थे और इनकी जो वाल्मीकि की जो कहानी है वेद व्यास द्वारा रचित है वाल्मीकि तो रामायण वेद व्यास और रचित है रामायण वाल्मीकि द्वारा और एक और इसका ग्रंथ है श्री भग, भगवत गीता जो कि महाभारत का ही भाग है और वो तो बहुत ही जैसे कहें कि बहुत ही अठारवा अध्याय है महाभारत का वो तो बहुत ही एक प्रेरणादायक और एक मार्गदर्शक ग्रंथ है जो जिसकी महत्ता पूरे विश्व ने स्वीकार कर ली है और कितनी भाषाओं में इनके अनुवाद हो चुके हैं और कोई भी किम कर्तव्य विनोद व्यक्ति हो युवा हो या वो उसको मार्गदर्शन गीता देती है और स्वयं गांधी जी भी गीता को माँ की तरह कहते थे कि जब मुझे कोई उलझन होती है तो मैं गीता माँ की तरफ देखता तो इस तरह से ये जो रामायण है और महाभारत है ये तो ये मान लो कि भारतीय समाज के दो स्तंभ हैं इनके बिना हम हमारे समाज की कल्पना भी नहीं कर सकते और रामायण जो है रामायण एक आदर्श व्यवस्था का चित्रण करता है इसमें एक आदर्श परिवार कैसा होना चाहिए आदर्श संबंध कैसे होने चाहिए परिवार जनों के बीच पति पत्नी के बीच भाई भाई के बीच राजा प्रजा के बीच तो एक आदर्श आचार संहिता है रामायण एक तरह से और एक आदर्श प्रस्तुत करती है कि एक आदर्श समाज किस तरह का होना चाहिए आदर्श राज्य किस तरह का होना चाहिए हम अभी कल्पना करते कि राम राज्य में ऐसा होता था तो वास्तव में राम राज्य का जो आदर्श है राज धर्म है वो हमें प्रेरणा देता है और हिंदू समाज को प्रेरणा देता रहेगा इसके अलावा रामायण में जो मैंने कई बार मैंने अभी लॉकडाउन में रामायण पढ़ी तो मेरे को हर बारी नई चीज दिखाई देती है रामायण में उसमें जो प्रकृति चित्रण है आप देखिए कि उसमें प्रकृति चित्रण बहुत व्यापक हुआ है और राम जब जाते हैं बनों में तो साथ साथ में प्रकृति का चित्रण 
इसके अलावा रामायण में मैनेजमेंट के सूत्र जो आई आई टी एम है वो आजकल गीता रामायण महाभारत के उदाहरण देते हैं और इनको कोर्सेज में भी शामिल किया गया है तो आप देखिए रामायण में आर्किटेक्चर के पूरे सूत्र हैं कि जब वो युद्ध के लिए जाते थे तो उनके साथ पूरे इंजीनियर्स वगैरह भी चलते थे जो रास्ते को साफ करते हुए उनको बनाते हुए और किस तरह से वो जाते थे तो रामायण वेद व्यास और, और इस तरह से ही उसमें पूरा पर्यावरण और प्रकृति का चित्रण है और तो उससे हमें संकेत मिलता है पर्यावरणीय चेतना का इसी तरह महाभारत का थोड़ा जो लेटर है महाभारत में जो विवरण है जो उसमें राजनीतिक जो विचार है वो महाभारत का शांति पर्व है उसमें पूरा राज धर्म किस तरह से होना चाहिए और विदेशों के साथ कैसे नीति रखनी चाहिए कर व्यवस्था कैसी होनी चाहिए प्रजा को बहुत ज्यादा तंग नहीं करना चाहिए बहुत ज्यादा हैवी टैक्सेस नहीं लगाने चाहिए प्रजा के ऊपर तो वो सब महाभारत के अंदर तो महाभारत की जो वैल्यूज है थोड़ी लेटर पीरियड की हमें दिखाई देती है और इस तरह से दोनों महाकाव्यों से हम भारतीय समाज के जो कल्चर है पूरी कल्चर उसको हम देख सकते हैं और आप पुराण आते हैं तो पुराण ये कहा जाता है कि भाई प्राचीन भारतीयों को इतिहास की समझ नहीं थी कई विदेशी साम्राज्यवादी इतिहासकार कहते हैं कि वो तो बस ऐसे ही अध्यात्म में ही डूबे रहते थे धर्म में ही डूबे रहते थे उनको कोई इतिहास की समझ नहीं थी तो ये गलत बात है इतिहास पुराण को प्राचीन काल में पंचम वेद कहा गया और पुराण शब्द का अर्थ है प्राचीन आख्यान इसके संकलन करता महर्षि लोमर्ष अथवा उसके पुत्र उग्र श्रवा माने जाते हैं पुराणों की संख्या अठारह मानी गई है प्राचीन भारतीयों की भक्ति व आस्था इनमें प्रवाहित है इसमें मत्स्य पुराण मार्कंडे पुराण भविष्य पुराण भागवत पुराण ब्रह्मांड पुराण ब्रह्म वैवर्थ पुराण ब्रह्मा वामन बराह विष्णु वायु अग्नि नारद पदम लिंग गरुड कूर्म स्कंद पुराण आदि इनमें मत्स्य पुराण में वायु पुराण सबसे प्राचीन है अधिकांश पुराण तीसरी चौथी शताब्दी में लिखे गए हैं अब ये ज्यादातर लोगों की ये धारणा है कि पुराणों में जो विवरण है या पुराण जो है वो पुराण पुरातन पंथी है उनमें सिर्फ धर्म की ही बातें हैं लेकिन ये गलत है क्योंकि पुराणों में भी कई ऐसी ऐतिहासिक जानकारी निहित है जो हम उसमें से उनको इतिहास निर्माण में उनका यूज कर सकते हैं पुराणों में जो प्राचीन राजवंशों की पूरी वंशावलिया मिलती हैं जो प्राग ऐतिहासिक काल से लेकर के परीक्षित तक हैं और इनमें भविष्य शैली में राजाओं की पूरी वंशावलिया हैं और इसमें बौद्ध शासक और भी पुराने आंध्र शासक सात वाहनों के आंध्र के सात वाहन सबकी वंशावलियां इनमें मिलती हैं इसके अलावा वंशावलियों के अलावा पुराणों में सृष्टि कैसे हुई ये अपनी पृथ्वी कैसे बनी प्रलय हुई कैसे हुई या प्राचीन राजकुलों का पूरा विवरण पुराणों में और पुराणों में ये कहते हैं लोग कि नहीं पुराण तो सिर्फ भक्ति अंध भक्ति ही दिखाते हैं जैसे देवी पुराण या शिव पुराण के भाई वो अपने इष्ट के प्रति भक्ति है लेकिन उसके अलावा भी इसमें बहुत सारी जानकारी है और आपको आश्चर्य होगा जान करके कि विष्णु पुराण में जो कि ये भक्ति का ग्रंथ माना जाता है वैष्णव भक्ति का उसमें हमें अवतारवाद की तो धारणा मिलती ही है कि जब जब समाज में दुख या कष्ट या अन्याय बढ़ता है तो उस समय ईश्वर या नारायण किसी ना किसी रूप में अवतार लेते हैं और एक आशावादी जो भावना है अवतारवाद की वो हमें विष्णु पुराण में दिखाई देती है प्रहलाद की कहानी है पूरी इसमें और इसके अलावा विष्णु पुराण में राज धर्म का चित्रण है कि राजा को किस तरह व्यवहार करना चाहिए प्रजा के साथ या उसका प्रशासन किस तरह से होना चाहिए इसकी भी एक विस्तृत पुराणों में जानकारी है अब हम आते हैं बौद्ध साहित्य पे प्रारंभिक बौद्ध साहित्य भी हमारे पास ना केवल हिंदू ब्राह्मण साहित्य बल्कि बौद्ध साहित्य जो महात्मा बुद्ध से रिलेटेड है कई शताब्दियों तक तो बहुत हमारे पास अच्छा संग्रह है 
प्रारंभिक बौद्ध साहित्य पाली भाषा में है चूंकि हमने कहा कि चूंकि हिंदुस्तान में भाषाएं बदलती रहती हैं अलग अलग भाषाएं हैं सबके जैसे जैसे समाज में चेंजेस जाते हैं भाषा में भी चेंजेस आते रहते हैं तो प्रारंभ में संस्कृत में ग्रंथ लिखे जाते थे लेकिन जैसे जैसे चेंज आया माघदी पाली अपभ्रंश प्राकृत इन भाषाओं का प्रचलन बड़ा समाज में प्रारंभिक बौद्ध साहित्य पाली भाषा में है बाद में पाली मिश्र संस्कृत तिब्बती चीनी भाषा में भी है और बौद्ध साहित्य को त्रिपिटिक कहा गया है इन्हें प्रथम शताब्दी ईसा पूर्व का माना जाता है त्रिपिटिक इसमें त्रिपिटिक इसमें बुद्ध व बौद्ध संगों बौद्ध धर्म के सिद्धांत जातकों की कहानियां व समाज का विवरण है त्रिपिटिक के भी तीन भाग हैं सुत्य पिटक विनय पिटक अभिधम पिटक सुत्य पिटक का अर्थ है उपदेश देना इस पिटक में बौद्ध धर्म के उपदेश संग्रहित हैं कि महात्मा बुद्ध ने जहां जहां धर्म का जो प्रचार प्रचार प्रसार या जो जो उनके सिद्धांत है प्रत्युत समुत्पाद या अनात्मपाद या दुख दुख समुदाय वो सब हमें इन सुत्य पिटक में मिलते हैं सुत्य पिटक भी पांच भागों में विभाजित है दीर्घ निकाय मच्छिम निकाय संयुक्त निकाय अंगोत्तर निकाय खुदक निकाय तो इन निकायों में जो उनके आचार विचार जो बोधि सत्व या बौद्ध से संबंधित उनके रहने के नियम सारे मिलते हैं इसके अलावा अंगुत्तर निकाय ऐतिहासिक दृष्टि से बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है इसमें जो प्राचीन काल के सोलह महाजनपद थे उनकी जानकारी अंगुत्तर निकाय से मिलती है इसके बाद विनय पिटिक आता है विनय पिटिक में भिक्षु भिक्षु बौद्ध भिक्षु और भिक्षुणियों के संघ एवं दैनिक जीवन संबंधी आचार विचार नियम दो उसमें संग्रहित हैं और अभिधम पिटक में बौद्ध धर्म के दार्शनिक सिद्धांतों का वर्णन मिलता है इसके अलावा भी हम देखते हैं कि बौद्ध त्रिपिटिक साहित्य के अलावा भी हमारे पास बहुत विशाल बौद्ध बौद्ध साहित्य है और बौद्ध साहित्य में जो प्रमुख ग्रंथ है मैं खुद ही इन बहुत सभी को मैं संकलित नहीं कर पाई हूँ लेकिन जो जो कुछ कुछ मुझे मिले मैंने संकलित किए हैं जैसे जातक कथाएं जातक कथाएं बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग हैं और जातक कथाएं मतलब आपको एक सीख या सबक देती हैं और उस समय के समाज की पूरा उसका चित्रण इनमें मिलता है निदान कथा और मिलिंदपन में तो ऐतिहासिक जो यूनानी आक्रमण वगैरह जो नागसेन का वो या दार्शनिक विचार पूरे इसमें मिलते हैं दिव्या दिव्यावदान में पूरा ये अशोक दीप वंश महावंश बौद्ध धर्म से संबंधित इनमें जानकारियां मिलती हैं बुद्ध चरित सौंदरानंद सारीपुत्र प्रकरण ब्रज सूची महावस्तु अभिधम्म कोश ये सब इम्पोर्टेंट बौद्ध ग्रंथ हैं तो इनमें एक एक ग्रंथ पे भी इतिहास का विद्यार्थी यदि पीएचडी करना चाहे तो वो भी एक बहुत अच्छा एक विचार है तो ये सामने आएंगे या इनका जो महत्व तो सामने आएगा और इन बौद्ध ग्रंथों में नंदवंश अशोक चंदगुप्त मौर्य पुष्यमित्र शुंग जो ब्राह्मण वंश के थे तो वो सबकी जानकारियाँ हमें बौद्ध इनके जो लेटर ये बौद्ध ग्रंथ हैं या ये इनमें मिलती इसके बाद जैन साहित्य को ले सकते हैं हम जैन साहित्य में भगवान महावीर स्वामी की शिक्षा शिक्षाओं के अलावा मगध व मौर्य शासकों का उल्लेख चंद्रगुप्त मौर्य अशोक बिंदुसार आदि की पूरी जानकारी है इसमें दक्षिण का भी जो श्रवट वेल गोला उसका भी उल्लेख है चंद्रगुप्त मौर्य ने चूंकि जो जैन धर्म अंगीकार किया था उस सब की जानकारी हमें मिलती है और जैन धर्म के ग्रंथों को आगम या सिद्धांत कहा गया है चौदह पर्वों में संकलित हैं ये अर्ध मागदी या प्राकृत भाषा में लिखे गए हैं इनके अंतर्गत बारह अंग बारह उपांग दस प्रकीर्ण छह छेद सूत्र चार मूल सूत्र अनुयोग आते हैं और जैन ग्रंथों की जो कंटेंट है इनमें महावीर स्वामी की शिक्षाएं भिक्षुओं के आचार नियम आदि हैं और इसके अलावा भी जो जनरल ऐसे भी ग्रंथ है जिनमें जैन ग्रंथ का है 
जैसे भद्रवा चरित्र है कथा कोश है भगवती सूत्र है आवश्यक सूत्र है लोक विवाह कल्प सूत्र या परिशिष्ट पर्वन आदि हैं तो इनमें जैन इतिहास की जैन धर्म से संबंधित विकास गुजरात के इतिहास राजस्थान का इतिहास इसके बारे में भी काफी जानकारी है मिलती है और जैन साहित्य के भी पुराण थे जो प्राकृत संस्कृत अब्रंश में लिखे गए हैं जैसे पद्म पुराण हरिवंश पुराण आदि पुराण आदि और जैन जो जैनियों के जो पहले के तीर्थंकर वगैरह थे महावीर स्वामी से पहले उन सबकी भी इन ग्रंथों में डिटेल मिलती है और कुछ ग्रंथों को अब हम ऐतिहासिक या समसामयिक ग्रंथ कह के उनमें उस वाले ग्रुप में शामिल कर सकते हैं जिसमें मेनली संस्कृत टेक्स्ट है और इनमें प्राचीन भारतीय संस्कृति समाज व राज्य का चित्र है और इनमें तो पूरा कालिदास का साहित्य आता है मालवी का अग्निमित्र है कालिदास का जिसमें पुष्य मित्र शुंग राजवंश की जानकारी हमें मिलती है और पाणिनी के अष्टाध्यायी से हमें व्याकरण व गणराज्य तत्कालीन जो गणराज्य थे उनकी जानकारी मिलती है और इसके अलावा आर्य भट्टी जो गुप्तकालीन ग्रंथ है वो हमारे तकनीकी विकास को दर्शाता है प्राचीन भारतीयों के तो इसमें खगोल तकनीकी व वैज्ञानिक विकास दिखाई देता है इसके बाद कौटिल्य अर्थशास्त्र से या चाणक्य के सूत्रों से तो सभी परिचित हैं कौटिल्य अर्थशास्त्र देखने में लगता है कि ये व्यापार का शास्त्र है वाणिज्य का शास्त्र है लेकिन ये राजनीति प्राचीन राजनीति अंतर्राज्य संबंध सैन्य नीति राज्य चलाने की आचार संहिता का इसमें विवरण मिलता है और जो राज्य के लिए दुर्ग कैसे बनाने चाहिए उनके बारे में भी इसमें विवरण है इसके अलावा जो लोग काफी को ध्यान नहीं होगा कि कौटिल्य अर्थशास्त्र में जो हाथी या गाय जो होती थी अश्व जो होते थे उनके बारे में या उनका उपचार किस तरह से किया जाए वो किस तरह से रखा जाए वो भी हमें एक विस्तृत इसमें जानकारी कौटिल्य अर्थशास्त्र से मिलती है और इसमें मौर्यकालीन इतिहास क्योंकि इसका तो जो निर्माण ही आचार्य कौटिल्य ने चंद्रगुप्त मौर्य को एक तरह से मार्गदर्शक राजनीति चलाने के लिए शासन चलाने के लिए ये ग्रंथ लिखा गया था और वास्तव में ये बहुत ही व्यावहारिक ग्रंथ है और इस ये ये एक तरह से शाश्वत ग्रंथ है जो हर समय के युग की राजनीति के लिए बहुत ही एक मार्गदर्शक ग्रंथ का कार्य करता है पतंजलि कृत महाभाष्य जिसमें स्वास्थ्य योग आयुर्वेद व यूनानी आक्रमण की भी जानकारी मिलती है गार की संहिता ज्योतिष की जानकारी मिलती है और कल्याण कत राज तरंगनी है इस यह तो एक बहुत ही व्यवस्थित व ऐतिहासिक ग्रंथ है पूरे कश्मीर का जो इतिहास है सातवीं शताब्दी से लेकर बारहवीं शताब्दी तक का वो पूरा कल्याण की राजधानी में बहुत व्यवस्थित तरीके से इसने राजाओं की जो वंशावलिया राजाओं के कार्यकाल राजाओं का पूरा व्यवस्थित ब्यौरा कल्याण ने दिया है और कल्याण का तो खुद ही ये मानना था कि जो सही इतिहासकार वही है जो सत्य बात कहे और तथ्यों का सही निरूपण करके लिखे क्योंकि प्राचीन काल में होता था कि राजाओं का इतिहास उनके जो कवि होते थे या उनके जो दरबार के लेखक होते थे वो उसे व्यवस्थित करते थे लेकिन कल कल्याण ने तो ये एक तरह से इतिहास की परिभाषा दी है कि वही सच्चा कवि इतिहासकार होगा जो सही तथ्य बिना किसी पक्षपात के लिखे इसके बाद विशाख दत्त का मुद्रा राक्षस है जिसमें राजनीति संबंधी या ये मगध का जो मौर्य मगध का जो उत्थान है उसका बारे में है बागपति राज का गौड़ बहु है जय सिंह का कुमारपाल चरित है और इसके बाद हम देखते हैं बिल्लन द्वारा रचित विक्रमांक देव चरित चूंकि चालुक्यों की बात हो रही थी तो ये विक्रमान देव चरित्र में बातापी के चालुकों का पूरा विस्तृत विवरण है और इसमें प्राचीन भारतीय इतिहास लेखन किस तरह होता था या इतिहास का क्या वो था वो बहुत ही ये ऐतिहासिक ग्रंथ है ये विक्रमान देव चरित्र इसके बाद साउथ के भी बहुत सारे ग्रंथ है तमिल पुरुनानूर मणिमेखलाई हेमचंद का कुमार चरित्र जयादित्य का व्रति सूत्र शुश्रुत संहिता 
और सुश्रुत संहिता प्राचीन आयुर्वेद में शल्य चिकित्सा प्लास्टिक सर्जरी प्राचीन काल में और जो शल्य चिकित्सा करने वाले जो औजार होते थे जो टूल्स होते थे उनकी एक बहुत ही डिटेल विवरण हमें सुश्रुत संहिता में मिलता है इसके बाद चरुक चरक संहिता में आयुर्वेद का डिटेल विवरण है कि किस रोग के लिए किस तरह से क्या जड़ी बूटी कैसे उपचार किया जाए और इससे संबंधित एक तथ्य बताना चाहूंगी कि प्राचीन काल में जो गुरुकुल में विद्यार्थी रहते थे या जो पढ़ने जाते थे उनके लिए ये आवश्यक था कि वो आयुर्वेदिक जड़ी बूटियों का एक गार्डन तैयार करें या पौधों को लगाएं उनकी देखभाल करें ये उल्लेखनीय बात है जो मेरे को याद वाला किस्मति में भी मिलती है पद्म गुप्त परिमल नवसाद संचरित जयानक का पृथ्वीराज विजय जिसमें पृथ्वीराज चौहान के बारे में लिखा गया है सोमेश्वर द्वारा रचित रासमाला कीर्ति कौमदी राजशेखर का रचित कोष प्रबंध मेरु तुम द्वारा प्रबंध चिंतामणि तो ये ग्रंथ भी उल्लेखनीय है और इसके बाद विदेशी यात्रियों के विवरण आते हैं क्योंकि प्राचीन काल से ही भारत के अंदर विदेशी आए और उन्होंने अपनी निगाहों से ये भारतीय समाज को देखा और कुछ कुछ लिखा और तो जो विदेशी विदेशों से जो विवरण प्राप्त है उसमें कुछ सच्चाई है कुछ सत्य है कुछ भ्रामक है तो हम हमें इतिहास लेखन में इनका प्रयोग सावधानी से ही करना पड़ता है आँख आँख बंद करके हम इन इनको एज ए सोर्स यूज नहीं कर सकते और इनमें प्रमुख हैं जैसे हेरोडोटस का हिस्टोरिका मेगस्तनीज का इंडिका मेगस्तनीज की जो इंडिका है वो चंद्रगुप्त मौर्य की प्रशासनिक या मौर्य के प्रशासनिक व्यवस्था के बारे में संकेत देती है इसके अलावा प्लिनी नेचुरल हिस्ट्री प्लिनी का जो है प्राकृतिक इतिहास उसमें प्रथम शताब्दी के पशु कैसे थे पौधे कैसे थे खनिज पदार्थ कैसे थे वो पूरा प्लिनी की नेचुरल हिस्ट्री में एडी थ्री एंड सागर का पैरी प्लस ये ग्रंथ है जिसका लेखक का पता नहीं है किसने लिखा है ये लेकिन उस समय जो दक्षिणी जो बंदरगाह थे उनसे जो मसालों का व्यापार होता था भारतीय वाणिज्य व्यापार का उसका पूरा विवरण है इनमें टालेमी की जोग्राफी नेचुरल हिस्ट्री इसमें जोग्राफी के बारे में डायमैक्स डायोनिस एरियन आदि जो भी यूनानी आए उनका विवरण भी उल्लेखनीय है मौर्यकालीन इतिहास की जानकारी के लेकर और इसके बाद हम देखते हैं गुप्तकालीन जो फाइन आए चंद्रगुप्त द्वितीय के समय के जो उनका अच्छा व्यवस्था थी उनका जो समाज था समाज में जो प्रचलित जो परंपराएं थी जो बौद्ध धर्म का प्रचार वो किस तरह क्या था बौद्ध धर्म वो सारी फाइन के फोग्यू जी में मिलती है और चूंकि ये बौद्ध धर्म की स्टडी करने के लिए ये भारत आए थे और हेनसान की जो सी यू की है उसमें भी पूरी जो भारतीय समाज के बारे में हेनसांग ने काफ़ी लिखा है और हेनसांग ने खुद इतिहास लेखन के बारे में ये बताया है कि उस समय एक अलग अधिकारी होता था जो इतिहास को लिखता था रजिस्टर उनके मेंटेन करता था और इसके बाद इत्सिंग है जो छह सौ इक्यानवे में भारत तथा मलय द्वीप पुंज में प्रचलित बौद्ध धर्म का विवरण इनकी जो रचनाएं है इसमें बौद्ध धर्म और संस्कृत साहित्य का जो इतिहास का स्रोत है उसके बारे में लिखा है और इन्होंने हर्ष वर्धन के समय के इतिहास का वर्णन लिखा है नालंदा में विक्रमशिला विश्वविद्यालय के बारे में बहुत विस्तार से लिखा है कि ये कितने महत्वपूर्ण विद्यालय थे इनमें विश्व के सभी भागों से विद्यार्थी पढ़ने के लिए आते थे इसके अलावा तारानाथ तिब्बती लेख है कंगयूर तंगयूर अलवरूनी की तहकीक हिंद है अलवरूनी का काफी अलवरूनी का जो तहकीक हिंद है उससे हमें जो पूर्व मध्यकालीन समाज है राज्य है उसकी काफी जानकारी मिल जाती है सुलेमान का सिलसिला तुल तवारीख है और इस तरह से ये साहित्यिक स्रोत हमें काफी मददगार साबित होते हैं और अब चूंकि आते हैं प्राचीन भारतीय इतिहास के पुरातत्विक स्रोत इसको मैं बहुत ज्यादा विस्तार से 
नहीं बताऊंगी क्योंकि बरातर तो वेदियाँ एक से एक बैठे हुए हैं तो जो आर्कियोलॉजिकल सोर्स जो पेंशेंट हिस्ट्री है तो उसमें हम देखते हैं पुरातत्व तो है क्या एक तो साहित्य एक पुरातत्व तो ये है कि जो पुरानी बातें हैं पुराने स्थलों के अनुसंधान अध्ययन से संबंधित रखने की एक भौतिक क्रिया है जो जमीन के अंदर छिपी सामग्रियों को निकालती है उनके इतिहास को तर्क संगत तरीके से समझने में हमें मदद मिलती है और आर्कियोलॉजिकल जो एविडेंसेज हैं उनसे हमें साहित्य की जो घटनाएँ हैं उनको पुष्टि उनकी पुष्टि हो जाती है और इस तरह से भारतीय धर्म कला संस्कृति तकनीक प्रशासन आदि का बहुत इनसे होता है इनमें अभिलेख हैं शिला लेख हैं ताम्रपत गुहा लेख मूर्ति लेख स्मारक और मुद्राएं मिलती हैं किसी तथ्य अभिलेख क्या है किसी तथ्य पर कार्यवाही से सामने पत्थर ताम्रपत्र मोहरा दीवारों प्रतिमाओं दीपक खुदे लेख अशोक के अभिलेख राजा ज्ञाओ घोषणाओं से संबंधित हैं ब्राह्मी खरोष्टी लिपि में है और अशोक के धर्म दर्शन राजा के आदर्शों पर प्रकाश डालते हैं इन्हें भारतीय धर्म व संस्कृति का विदेशों में किस तरह से प्रचार हुआ वो हमें मिलता है <coughs> हरिशेन द्वारा रचित समुद्रगुप्त की प्रयाग प्रशस्ति से समुद्रगुप्त की जो विजयों के बारे में विवरण मिलता है और उसकी क्या नीति रहती थी कि वो वही एक बार विजिट कर करके फिर वापस आ जाता था और उनको मतलब जीते हुए प्रदेश पे कभी अधिकार नहीं करते थे उनमें अपनी थोड़ी एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव या अपनी सांस्कृतिक को विस्तार वाली भावना मिलती है मैरौली का लॉ स्तंभ जो चंद्रगुप्त द्वितीय की बालिक विजय और भी विजय उसके बारे में पूरा उस स्तंभ पे खुदा हुआ है और इसके अलावा भूमि अनुदान पत्र हैं बहुत सारे जो कि गुप्त काल से पूर्व मध्यकाल तक हमें मिलते हैं इनमें सामंतवाद की पूरी जानकारी मिलती है कि सामंतवाद का विकास कैसे हुआ गुप्त काल से और कैसे कैसे सामंतवाद के भारत में बढ़ा और जो भूमि अनुदान पत्र होते थे जिनको ब्रह्मदेव भी कहा जाता था तो उन भूमि को दिया जाता था कई मंदिरों को भी दिया जाता था प्रशासनिक अधिकारियों को भी दिया जाता था एज ए उनके इनकम सोर्स के लिए और लेकिन बाद में सामंतवाद की जो विकास हुआ जिसमें प्रजा पर अत्याचार भी होने लगे वो पूरा डिटेल हमें भूमि अनुदान पत्रों पे मिल गया स्वयं याजवला की स्मृति में ये पूरे अनुदान पत्र जो ब्रह्मदेह जो दिए जाते थे वो उनका डिटेल मिलता है और भी जो प्रमुख अभिलेख हैं प्राचीन काल के जैसे हाथी गुफा अभिलेख है इसमें खारवेल की जो उपलब्धियाँ बताई गई हैं हेरियोडोरस का बेस नगर से प्राप्त गरुड़ स्तंभ है इसमें द्वितीय शताब्दी में भागवत धर्म के विकास का उल्लेख मिलता है रुद्र रामन का जूनागढ़ अभिलेख शकों की शक्ति बताता है और उनका जो विस्तार जहाँ तक था और उनके किस तरह से उनका एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन था प्रशासनिक व्यवस्था थी वो इसमें मिलती है नासिक अभिलेख से सात वाहनों की प्रभुता का बोध होता है कि उनका किस तरह से उन, उनकी स्टेट या उनका रूल था किस तरह उनका बड़ा हुआ क्षेत्र था और मंदसौर अभिलेख से व्यापारिक श्रेणियों की जानकारी मिलती है कि जो प्राचीन काल में विभिन्न जो श्रेणियाँ होती थी उन सब की डिटेल हमें मंदसौर अभिलेख में रेशम रेशम जो सिल्क बनाने वाली वो करने वाली वो सब की जानकारी हमें मंदसौर अभिलेख से और ग्वालियर की प्रशस्ति में प्रति आशाचक भोज की उपलब्धियों का विवरण मिलता है एहौल अभिलेख है उसमें चालुक्य शासक पुलकेशन द्वितीय का अभिलेख है उसमें ये बताया गया है कि हर्ष पर भी उसने विजय प्राप्त की थी पुलकेशन द्वितीय ने उद्धु कोटा अभिलेख में संगीत के नियमों का विवरण है और और भी बहुत से अन्वेषण में उत्खन से प्राप्त उद्धु कोटा में संगीत के नियमों का उल्लेख है अन्वेषण उत्खन से प्राप्त मृदान औजार मोहरे आदि जानकारी के स्रोत है विदेशों से भी बहुत से अभिलेख मिले हैं क्योंकि उस समय भारत का जो सांस्कृतिक विस्तार बहुत ज़्यादा था एशिया माइनर बोगच को ही अभिलेख जिसमें वैदिक देवताओं मैत्र वरुण इंद्र अश्विनी कुमार आदि का उल्लेख है पारसी पोलिस तथा नक्शे रुस्तम ईरान के अभिलेख भारत व ईरान के संबंध बताते हैं अभिलेख काफी भाषा संस्कृत प्राकृत मिश्र तमिल तेलुगू कन्नड़ आदि है इसके अलावा मोहरें बहुत सारी मिली हैं अभी मोहरों पे चर्चाएं हो रही थी सिंधु घाटी की सभ्यता बसाड़ से मिट्टी की मोहरें मिली हैं श्रेणियां अपनी मोहरें खुद बनवाती थीं 
तो इन मोहरों पे भी बहुत सारी जानकारियाँ इनके जो चित्र होते थे उससे सोशल और इकोनॉमी जो है उसकी जानकारी मिलती थी स्मारक भवन स्तंभ मूर्तियाँ या किसी प्रकार का निर्माण या उसके अवशेष ये उसको व्यक्त करते हैं ये स्मारक पत्थर मिट्टी लकड़ी धातु के बने होते हैं तक्षशिला पाटलिपुत्र मोहनजो द्रोणपा नालंदा देवगढ़ मथुरा सारनाथ सांची गणेश्वर आहाड़ अभी जो इससे पूर्व वक्ता है उन्होंने पूरा जोधपुरा गणेश्वर जो बताया है अजंता एलोरा की गुफाएं एलिफेंटा भीमबेट का एलिफेंटा और कॉलवी की गुफाएं या झालावाड़ के पास हैं कोटा झालावाड़ जहाँ पे पूरे बुद्ध गुफाएं हैं जो बहुत ही इम्पोर्टेंट है बुद्धिस्ट स्टडी के लिए झांसी का देवगढ़ मंदिर नालंदा की बुद्ध का मूर्ति जावा का मोद मलाया श्याम आदि के मंदिर जावा का स्मारक बोधो बुद्धो नवी शताब्दी में महायान बौद्ध धर्म का उदाहरण है अंकोर बाट अंकोर ला भारतीय औपनिवेशिक प्रसार के उदाहरण है मुद्राएं हैं और मुद्राओं से भी बहुत सी जानकारी मिलती है कि मुद्राएं प्राचीन काल में जिनको शतमान निष्क का शापन कहा जाता है पंचमार कॉइन्स हैं ये मौर्यकालीन आग सिक्के हैं इनके लेख से इनके जो मेटीरियल सोने चांदी तांबे के बने होते थे उस समय की राजनीति व्या आर्थिक व्यवस्था किस तरह की थी इसकी जानकारी मिलती है मलाया बोर्नियो बाली आदि से उपलब्ध स्मारक हिंदू छिंदों में हिंदू संस्कृति के प्रसार का विवरण है सैंदव सभ्यता में चिन्ह हैं जो मुद्राओं का ही प्रतिरूप है सोलहवीं शताब्दी के आहत सिक्के मिले हैं यवन शासकों सात वाहनों की मुद्रा मिली है जिनसे सात वाहनों की मुद्राओं पर जल पोते जिससे समुद्री विजय का अनुमान लगता है कुषाणों की मुद्राएं उनके धर्म दर्शन की जानकारी देती हैं और हिंदी यूनानी शासकों के शिक्ष महत्वपूर्ण हैं जो उनके भारतीय समाज में उनके समाहित होने को या उसको बताते हैं और जो पांचाल माला भी होते जो सिक्के गणतंत्रों का इतिहास बताते हैं प्राचीन काल में उनकी बहुत सारी मुद्राएं मिली और समुद्र की मुद्राएँ स्वर्ण मुद्राएँ बहुत सारी मिली हैं धर्म संगीत साहित्य और उसका बोध कराती हैं और जब जैसे सिक्कों में मिलावट आने लग गई थी स्वर्ण में तो ये लगने लगा था कि वो आर्थिक दृष्टि से कमजोर हो गए राजशासन और रोमन सिक्के जो उस समय के दक्षिण भारत में जो मसालों का व्यवसाय होता था और भी बहुत सी चीज़ों के कपड़ों का मसालों का काली मिर्च लौंग और भी बहुत कुछ का तो वो सारे व्यापारिक संबंध रोमन सिक्के बहुत बहुत आयात में वो बताते हैं राजनीतिक आर्थिक व धार्मिक स्थिति पूरी पता चलती है इनसे और इस तरह से आर्थिक इतिहास लेखन में मुद्राओं का योगदान महत्वपूर्ण है धन्यवाद सर हेलो हाँ नमस्ते सर हाँ नमस्ते झा साहब हेलो हाँ कहिए कहिए हाँ मैडम कोटा की है कोटा से है वहाँ ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी में प्रोफेसर कमलेश शर्मा मैडम हाँ हेलो अभी अभी काफी अच्छा व्याख्यान हुआ सुनने को मिला हाँ, हाँ तो मैं तो इतिहास का ज्ञाता नहीं हूँ लेकिन मुझे एक बात से खुशी हुई कि याज्ञ बल के हमारे मिथिला के थे और उनका 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 जो गांव है याज्ञ बल के बन याज्ञ बल के बन अः वहां मैं गया हूँ वहाँ वो बरगद का एक दो बिघे में वो वृक्ष है उससे कई ये उसकी जो जड़ें जो होती हैं खास करके मॉडिफाइड वो स्टेम वो वो हमने जाकर वहाँ देखा है नदी के किनारे और उनका गांव भी है जगबन अपभ्रंश है जाग्यबल के बन का अपभ्रंश है जगबन और वहाँ भी उनकी प्रतिमा बनी है हाल में और उनकी दोनों पत्नियों की प्रतिमा है मैत्रेयी और कात्यायनी वो सड़क पर ही उनकी प्रतिमा बनी हुई है 
और जागबल का इतना योगदान है भारतीय ये पारिवारिक जो कानून है विधि है उसमें तो ये तो जानकारी थी मैडम ने भी इसकी काफी चर्चा की और जाग्य बल के बोलते हैं नाम थोड़ा सा संस्कृत में ऐसा है कि उच्चारण उच्चारण में दिक्कत हो जाती है जाग्य बल के जाग्य बल के सब 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 संयुक्त है वो लॉ क पूरा संयुक्त है सिर्फ उच्चारण में थोड़ी दिक्कत हो जाती है लेकिन इतना बड़ा उनका योगदान है हम लोग आज भी उसको सुनते हैं और प्रसन्नता होती है बहुत बहुत मैडम ने बहुत ही विस्तृत बहुत ही विस्तार में सारी बातों की चर्चा की बहुत दिनों के बाद ऐसा ऐसा ये सुनने को मिला बहुत ही सारगर्भित बहुत ही विस्तृत बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मैडम साहब हमारे सीनियर मित्र हैं और के प्रोफेसर मैडम मैडम सर जो विद्या डॉक्टर विद्यानाथ झा साहब जो है वो बॉक्सिंग के प्रोफेसर हैं दरभंगा से मिथिला से दरभंगा सीता जी के यहाँ से सीता जी की जो नगरी हाँ सीता जी की नगरी है जागेबल जी की भी भूमि है ये करीब यहाँ से पंद्रह किलोमीटर दरभंगा जहाँ मैं बैठा हुआ हूँ वहाँ से करीब पंद्रह किलोमीटर पर उनका गांव जगबन है आज भी देख, देखने के लिए लोग जाते हैं जाते हैं और जो कहते हैं कि रामायण का बोल कल्पित है आज आजकल तो रामायण के पूरे जो पुरातात्विक स्थल है वो सब मौजूद है हाँ 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 यहाँ सारे सारे अहिल्या स्थान अहिल्या स्थान में बहुत बड़ा मंदिर है राम चंद्र जी जहाँ आए थे और अहिल्या का उन्होंने उद्धार किया था गौतम आश्रम है ये सारी 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 जगह है यहाँ पर सारे स्थल है जी सर का भी मौका दीजिए उधर देखे हम हाँ हाँ बनाइए प्रोग्राम बनाइए हमारा क्षेत्र मैडम चित्रकूट है चित्रकूट जो चित्रकूट में लगा है और जो बाण में जो कादम्बरी लिखी है वो यहाँ लिखी है कादम्बरी जो है वो रीवा के बगल में हमारे यहाँ से तीस किलोमीटर में सोन नदी का किनारा है मेरा गांव है उसी के बगल में और वो बाणी कर्म स्थली थी बाण भट्टी थी और तुलसीदास जी का तो है ही है चित्रकूट में तो ये क्षेत्र भी साहित्य के उसमें तानसेन जो है हमारे यहाँ बांधो वर्ष गए थे रीवा के पहले यहाँ बघेल वर्ष था तो उसकी राजधानी बांधो वर्ष थी जहाँ से तानसेन जो है वो अकबर के दरबार में गए थे हाँ वो यही क्षेत्र है वो कोटा हमारे यहाँ के बच्चे खूब पढ़ने जाते हैं हमारा बालक भी गया था और यहाँ के बच्चे खूब जाते हैं कोटा शिक्षा का केंद्र है अभी तो कोटा तो शिक्षा का केंद्र है कोचिंग कोचिंग हब है कोचिंग भी है हाँ वो थोड़ा सा आज समय कुछ विलम्ब हुआ उसके लिए चाहते हैं एक्चुअली एक दो जो टेक्निकल वो है ये शेयरिंग की वजह से वो मैडम बहुत बढ़िया प्रेजेंट थी वो ढोला बीरा पर तो थोड़ा टेक्निकल दिक्कत आ रही थी जी जी बाकी उनका हमने दस बजे से कर दिया था लेकिन वो टेक्निकल उसमें दिक्कत हो रही थी इसलिए थोड़ा समय लग गया उसके लिए सुना चाहे थे मुझे तो ये लगा की मैं लास्ट स्पीकर हूँ मेरे को कोई सुनेगा या पता नहीं नहीं सुनेगा नहीं नहीं काफी काफी अच्छा काफी अच्छा हाँ हम कराते आज भी ये यदि आज नहीं होता तो हम दूसरे दिन कराते वाला तो लेक्चर तो हम उसके लिए और बल्कि हम दिन भी बढ़ाते थे क्योंकि तो हमको जो लेक्चर भेजे हम केवल एक तारीख तक रखे थे जी 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 जैसे विद्वानों को लेक्चर मिलते चले गए डेट अपने हाँ हमारा बच्चा हमारा बच्चा विदेश से आया है तो उसके रात को एक दो घंटे मिल लेते हैं उसका अभी संडे को थोड़ा जाएगा पहले इक्कीस तक था तो हमने कहा आ जाओ तीन चार दिन हम रह लेंगे लेकिन बाद में बढ़ते बढ़ते पास हो गया उसका फ्लाइट का टिकट फिक्स था तो अब वो थोड़ा जाएगा तो रात को एक दो घंटे उससे बैठ के मिल लेते हैं तो घर वाले भी खाली किए और कॉलेज वाले भी हमको सतर्कता दिए हुए हैं कि आप करवाइए चलिए मिश्रा मिश्रा जी को धन्यवाद सर उन्होंने मेरी भी नॉलेज रिफ्रेश करवा दी जो इस बारे में मैंने अपने आइडियाज को हम लोग हम लोग जो पहले बहुत पहले पढ़े थे सब चीजें वो चीजें आपने दोहरा दी और खास कर 
पीएससी के तैयारी के समय पे ये पढ़ा था सब और एक बार काफी दिन आज तीस पैंतीस साल के बाद आपने जो है पूरी की पूरी चीज जो है एक बार याद दिला दी एक जरूर रिक्वेस्ट है मैडम सर तो, मैंने क्या है ये स्मृति साहित्य पे मेरा रिसर्च वर्क है जी जी तो मेरे तो गुरु ये कहते थे कि संस्कृत सीखो तभी स्मृतियों पे रिसर्च करना तो मैं संस्कृत कह बहुत पूरे अच्छे से तो नहीं सीख पाई पर थोड़ा मैं पढ़ लेती हूँ नहीं नहीं बढ़िया है अच्छी अच्छी वो है पढ़ने से आदमी रिस्पेक्ट होता है अब जैसे मैंने कहा मैं बॉटनी का स्टूडेंट हूँ लेकिन सर हमारे यहाँ आ चुके हैं कॉन्फ्रेंस में जो हम लोग ओपन कॉन्फ्रेंस करते थे सर आ चुके हैं हमारे यहाँ आज मैं, मैं गया था रीवा गया था आ चुके हैं हमें तो अब ये कोविड के बाद जो हुआ तो मैडम शुरुआत तो हमने कॉलेज वालों ने हमसे जबरदस्ती करवाई लेकिन अब वो लोग कह रहे हैं कि आप तो इसमें हो गए अब हमने दो तो, तो सौ से ऊपर टाक हमने करवाई मैडम और पूरा नेशनल पार्क सेंचुरी नहीं वो बहुत मेहनत सर इतने लंबे इतना हाँ बहुत मेहनत का काम कर रहे हैं सर आप इतने लोगों को छोड़ना इतने बुक भी पब्लिश हो रही है तो हम ये चाहते हैं कि आप ये जो प्रेजेंट की है उसको हमारे मेल या व्हाट्सएप में आप जो है शेयर कर दीजिएगा पीपीटी हाँ पीपीटी तो ऐसे मैंने सबके मेल पे भेज दी थी मिश्रा आप शेयर कर दीजिएगा मेल कर दिए मैंने या तो मेल कर दीजिएगा या व्हाट्सएप पे भेज दीजिए हाँ, नहीं मैंने मेल कर, कर दी कि मुझे कोई प्रॉब्लम आए तो वो पीपीटी जी तो चलिए जो बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मैडम और बहुत अच्छा लगा आगे भी अभी दो तीन दिन सर आगे मौका दीजिए आप मैं तो एकेडमिक वर्क के लिए हमेशा तैयार नहीं नहीं बिल्कुल हम हमारे यहाँ जो भी होगा अभी कुछ तो अभी कॉन्फ्रेंस का दौर आएगा कुछ कॉलेज में या यूनिवर्सिटी वाले हैं तो हम आपका नाम वहाँ पे जरूर मेरा सर चालीस साल से मैं रिसर्च और इससे जुड़ी हुई हूँ टीचिंग रिसर्च कॉलेजों में वैसे भी कॉन्फ्रेंस होती है तो आने जाने की भी कोई असुविधा नहीं है वहाँ कोटा से सीधे ट्रेन जो है वो कटनी आती है और कटनी से ट्रेन भी वहाँ पहुँचा देती है कोई दिक्कत नहीं है तब ऐसे मौका लगा जरूर अपना जो युवा के जो संस्थान है या जो लोग हमसे पूछते हैं विषय पर अब तो अब तो इतिहास वाले भी पूछेंगे अभी तक बॉटनी और जुलाजी वाले पूछेंगे अब इतिहास वाले इसलिए कि लगभग पचास लाख हो गई हैं इसके पहले भी हमने विस्तार दो जो सीनियर आर्कोलॉजिस्ट हैं उनकी टॉक कराई है हमने जनवरी में और जिसको जब मौका मिलता है तो वो जरूर सुनते हैं चाहे उनके विषय का हो चाहे अन्य विषय का हो उनका पूरा समय देते हैं और सर ने भी हमको दो तीन बहुत अच्छे अच्छे रिसोर्स पर्सन का किए हैं और अभी एक और का बात आई है आपके और क्या लाजी की सर बोले इसमें जो तैयार हो जाएंगे तो हम कोशिश करते हैं या अगली सीरीज को लेंगे ठीक है मैडम ठीक है बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद 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 कार्यक्रम खत्म हो गया आज का खत्म हो गया आज का हो गया कल सर नौ पचास से है मालावार पर अच्छा अच्छा मालावार पटेंशल गार्डन जो पहले नहीं हो पाया था गार्डन है केरला का जे एन टू बी जी आर आई के बाद सेकंड नंबर आता है और बहुत अच्छा वहाँ के जो प्रिंसिपल साइंटिस्ट है बहुत अच्छे वैज्ञानिक है उधर केरला के सब लोगों ने बताया हमको तो वो बोल रहे हैं एन एस अच्छा एक रिक्वेस्ट था मिश्रा जी एक रिक्वेस्ट था असल में पांच तारीख को मेरा मुझे प्रोजाइड ओवर करना है और पांच तारीख को एक अर्जेंट एंगेजमेंट आ गया है वो मखाने पर एक वर्कशॉप है यहाँ जो नेशनल मखाना रिसर्च सेंटर है तो पूरे दिन पूरे दिन वो लोग मुझे इंगेज कर देंगे वहां पर तो यदि आप शिफ्ट कर देते मुझे अच्छा आपका सर पांच को है पांच को है तो यदि टीच प्रीपोन कर देते प्रीपोन कर देते कल या परसों हाँ वही मैं थोड़ा सा चर्चा कर लूंगा सर हाँ। तो उसमें है चार तारीख को क्योंकि तो चार तारीख का क्या है कि ज्यादातर जो टॉक है बॉटनी बेस्ड टॉक जो 
तो मैं देख लूंगा तो लिखा है अब ये विषय का भी रहता है ना जैसे हाँ ती, तीन या चार को तीन या कल या परसों मैं हूँ फ्री हाँ तो मैं चर्चा कर लूंगा क्योंकि हाँ। तो इनका है शेड्यूल है ना तो उनसे थोड़ा सा मैं एक बार पूछ लूंगा क्योंकि ये चार को और पांच को ज्यादातर वो आर्कियोलॉजी वाले ज्यादा है हाँ वो तो है वो तो है वो ज्यादा है और दो चीजें हैं मैं चर्चा कर लूंगा उनसे और रूप से मैं आपको या तो फोन में या मैं व्हाट्सएप में इन्फॉर्म कर दू हाँ तीन या चार कल या परसों इंगेज हाँ, मुझे कर लीजिए आप ठीक हाँ, ठीक है है नमस्कार एक मिनट सर मैं देख हाँ, देख लीजिए देख लीजिए देख लीजिए मेरे पास है यहाँ तो जैसे फर्स्ट में तो आर्कियोलॉजी है सेकंड में वाइल्ड लाइफ है और अगले में और यस आपका पांच को पांच को है सवेरे हाँ हाँ तो पांच को मुझे नौ बजे से ही नौ बजे से पांच सब बजे शाम तक इनकेज रहना है मखाना रिसर्च सेंटर में सी फेट लुधियाना का प्रोग्राम है मैं सर देख के बताता हूँ हाँ देख लीजिए देख इतमान से देख लगता है ज्यादा नहीं बॉटनी बेस वाले हाँ तो, 